Section 1 of The Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Rab and His Friends by Dr. John Brown. Four and thirty years ago, Bob Ainsley and I were coming up Infirmary Street from Edinburgh High School, our heads together and our arms intertwisted, as only lovers and boys know how or why. When we got to the top of the street and turned north, we spied a crowd at the Tron Church. A dog fight! shouted Bob, and was off. And so was I, both of us all but praying that it might not be over before we got up. And is not this boy nature, and human nature too? And don't we all wish a house on fire not to be out before we see it? Dogs like fighting. Old Isaac says they delight in it, and for the best of all reasons. And boys are not cruel because they like to see the fight. They see three of the great cardinal virtues of dog or man, courage, endurance and skill, in intense action. This is very different from a love of making dogs fight, and enjoying, and aggravating, and making gain by their pluck. A boy, be he ever so fond himself of fighting, if he be a good boy, hates and despises all this. But he would have run off with Bob and me fast enough. It is a natural, and not a wicked, interest that all boys and men have in witnessing intense energy in action. Does any curious and finely ignorant woman wish to know how Bob's eye at a glance announced a dog fight to his brain? He did not, he could not, see the dogs fighting. It was a flash of an inference, a rapid induction. The crowd round a couple of dogs fighting is a crowd masculine mainly, with an occasional active compassionate woman fluttering wildly round the outside and using her tongue and her hands freely upon the men as so many brutes it is a crowd annular, compact and mobile, a crowd centripetal, having its eyes and its heads all bent downwards and inwards to one common focus. Well, Bob and I are up, and find it is not over. A small thoroughbred, white bull terrier, is busy throttling a large shepherd's dog, unaccustomed to war, but not to be trifled with. They are hard at it, the scientific little fellow doing his work in great style, his pastoral enemy fighting wildly, but with the sharpest of teeth and a great courage. Science and breeding, however, soon had their own. The game chicken, as the premature Bob called him, worked his way up, took his final grip of poor Yarrow's throat, and he lay gasping and all done for. His master, a brown, handsome man, big young shepherd from Tweedsmuir, would have liked to have knocked down any man, would drink up easel or eat a crocodile, for that part, if he had a chance. It was no use kicking the little dog, that would only make him hold the closer. Many were the means, shouted out in mouthfuls, of the best possible ways of ending it. Water! But there was none near, and many cried for it, who might have got it from the well at Blackfriars' wind. Bite the tail! And a large, vague, benevolent, middle-aged man, more desirous than wise, with some struggle, got the bushy end of Yarrow's tail into his ample mouth and bit it with all his might. This was more than enough for the much-enduring, much-perspiring shepherd, who, with a gleam of joy over his broad visage, delivered a terrific facer upon our large, vague, benevolent, middle-aged friend, who went down like a shot. Still the chicken holds, death not far off. Snuff! A pinch of snuff! observed a calm, highly-dressed young buck, with an eyeglass in his eye. "'Snuff, indeed!' growled the angry crowd, affronted and glaring. "'Snuff! A pinch of snuff!' again observed the buck, but with more urgency, whereon were produced several open boxes, and from a mull which may have been at Culloden, he took a pinch, knelt down, and presented it to the nose of the chicken. The laws of physiology and of snuff take their course, the chicken sneezes, and Yarrow is free. The young pastoral giant stalks off with Yarrow in his arms, comforting him. But the bull terrier's blood is up, and his soul unsatisfied, he grips the first dog he meets, and discovering she is not a dog, in Homeric phrase, he makes a brief sort of amend and is off. 
the boys with bob and me at their head are after him down nidry street he goes bent on mischief up the cowgate like an arrow bob and i and our small men panting behind there under the single arch of the south bridge is a huge mastiff sauntering down the middle of the causeway as if with his hands in his pockets he is old grey brindled as big as a little highland bull and has the shakespearean dewlaps shaking as he goes the chicken makes straight at him and fastens on his throat to our astonishment the great creature does nothing but stand still hold himself up and roar yes roar a long serious remonstrative roar how is this bob and i are up to them he is muzzled the baileys had proclaimed a general muzzling and his master studying strength and economy mainly had encompassed his huge jaws in a home-made apparatus constructed out of the leather of some ancient breechin his mouth was open as far as it could his lips curled up in rage a sort of terrible grin his teeth gleaming ready from out the darkness the strap across his mouth tense as a bowstring his whole frame stiff with indignation and surprise his roar asking us all around did you ever see the like of this he looked a statue of anger and astonishment done in aberdeen granite we soon had a crowd the chicken held on a knife cried bob and a cobbler gave him his knife you know the kind of knife worn away obliquely to a point and always keen i put its edge to the tense leather it ran before it and then one sudden jerk of that enormous head a sort of dirty mist about his mouth no noise and the bright and fierce little fellow is dropped limp and dead a solemn pause this was more than any of us had bargained for i turned the little fellow over and saw he was quite dead the mastiff had taken him by the small of the back like a rat and broken it he looked down at his victim appeased ashamed and amazed snuffed him all over stared at him and taking a sudden thought turned round and trotted off bob took the dead dog up and said john we'll bury him after tea yes said i and was off after the mastiff he made up the cowgate at a rapid swing he had forgotten some engagement he turned up the candlemaker row and stopped at the harrow inn there was a carrier's cart ready to start and keen thin impatient black of eyes little man his hand at his grey horse's head looking about angrily for something rab ye thief said he aiming a kick at my great friend who drew a cringing up and avoiding the heavy shoe with more agility than dignity and watching his master's eye slunk dismayed under the cart his ears down and as much as he had of a tail down too what a man this must be thought i to whom my tremendous hero turns tail the carrier saw the muzzle hanging cut and useless from his neck and i eagerly told him the story which bob and i always thought and still think homer or king david or sir walter alone were worthy to rehearse the severe little man was mitigated and condescended to say rab my man poor rabbi whereupon the stump of a tail rose up the ears were cocked the eyes filled and were comforted the two friends were reconciled Hup! and a stroke of the whip was given to jess and off went the three bob and i buried the game chicken that night we had not much of a tea in the back green of his house in melville street number seventeen with considerable gravity and silence and being at the time in the iliad and like all boys trojans we called him hector of course six years have passed a long time for a boy and a dog bob ainsley is off to the wars i am a medical student and a clerk at the minto house hospital rab i saw almost every week on the wednesday and we had much pleasant intimacy i found the way to his heart by frequent scratching of his huge head and an occasional bone when i did not notice him he would plant himself straight before me and stand wagging that bud of a tail and looking up with his head a little to the one side his master i occasionally saw he used to call me maister john but was laconic as any spartan one fine october afternoon i was leaving the hospital 
when I saw the large gate open, and in walked Rab, with that great and easy saunter of his. He looked as if taking general possession of the place, like the Duke of Wellington entering a subdued city, satiated with victory and peace. After him came Jess, now white from age, with her cart, and in it a woman, carefully wrapped up, the carrier leading the horse anxiously and looking back. When he saw me, James, for his name was James Noble, made a curt and grotesque boo, and said, Maister John, this is the mistress. She's got a trouble in her breast, some kind of an income, we're thinking. By this time I saw the woman's face. She was sitting on a sack filled with straw, her husband's plaid round her, and his big coat with its large white metal buttons over her feet. I never saw a more unforgettable face, pale, serious, lonely, delicate, sweet, without being at all what we call fine. She looked sixty, and had on a much, white as snow with its black ribbon, her silvery smooth hair setting off her dark grey eyes, eyes such as one sees only twice or thrice in a lifetime, full of suffering, full also of the overcoming of it, her eyebrows black and delicate, and her mouth firm, patient, and contented, which few mouths ever are. As I have said, I never saw a more beautiful countenance, or one more subdued to settled quiet. Ailey, said James, this is Master John, the young doctor, Rab's friend, ye ken. We often speak about ye, doctor. She smiled and made a movement, but said nothing, and prepared to come down, putting her plaid aside and rising. Had Solomon, in all his glory, been handing down the Queen of Sheba at his palace gate, he could not have done it more daintily, more tenderly, more like a gentleman, than did James the Howgate carrier when he lifted down Ailey his wife. The contrast of his small, swarthy, weather-beaten, keen, worldly face to hers, pale, subdued, and beautiful, was something wonderful. Rab looked on, concerned and puzzled, but ready for anything that might turn up. Were it to strangle the nurse, the porter, or even me, Ailey and he seemed great friends. As I was saying, she's got a kind of trouble in her breast, Doctor. Will you take a look at it? We walked into the consulting room, all four. Rab, grim and comic, willing to be happy and confidential if cause should be shown, willing also to be the reverse on the same terms. Ailey sat down, undid her open gown and her lawn handkerchief round her neck, and without a word showed me her right breast. I looked at it and examined it carefully, she and James watching me, and Rab eyeing all three. What could I say? There it was, that had once been so soft, so shapely, so white, so gracious and bountiful, so full of all blessed conditions, hard as a stone, a centre of horrid pain, making that pale face, with its grey, lucid, reasonable eyes, and its sweet, resolved mouth, express the full measure of the suffering overcome. Why was that gentle, modest, sweet woman, clean and lovable, condemned by God to bear such a burden? I got her away to bed. May Rab and me bide, said James. You may, and Rab, if he will behave himself. As warrant he'll do that, doctor. And in slank the faithful beast. I wish you could have seen him. There are no such dogs now. He belonged to a lost tribe. As I have said, he was brindled and grey like rubislaw granite. His hair short, hard and close, like a lion's. His body thick-set, like a little bull. A sort of compressed Hercules of a dog. He must have been ninety pounds weight, at the least. He had a large blunt head, his muzzle black as night, his mouth blacker than any night, a tooth or two, being all he had, gleaming out of his jaws of darkness. His head was scarred with the records of old wounds, a sort of series of fields of battle all over it, one eye out, one ear cropped as close as was Archbishop Layton's father's. The remaining eye had the power of two, and above it, and in constant communication with it, was a tattered rag of an ear, which was forever unfurling itself like an old flag, and then that bud of a tail about one inch long, if it could in any sense be said to be long, being as broad as long, 
the mobility, the instantaneousness of that bud were very funny and surprising, and its expressive twinklings and winkings, the intercommunications between the eye, the ear, and it, were of the oddest and swiftest. Rab had the dignity and simplicity of great size, and having fought his way all along the road to absolute supremacy, he was as mighty in his own line as Julius Caesar or the Duke of Wellington, and had the gravity of all great fighters. You must have often observed the likeness of certain men to certain animals, and of certain dogs to men. Now I never looked at Rab without thinking of the great Baptist preacher Andrew Fuller, the same large, heavy, menacing, combative, sombre, honest countenance, the same deep, inevitable eye, the same look, as of thunder asleep, but ready, neither a dog nor a man to be trifled with. Next day, my master, the surgeon, examined Ailey. There was no doubt it must kill her, and soon. It could be removed. It might never return. It would give her speedy relief. She should have it done. She curtsied, looked at James, and said, When? Tomorrow, said the kind surgeon, a man of few words. She and James and Rab and I retired. I noticed that he and she spoke little, but seemed to anticipate everything in each other. The following day, at noon, the students came in, hurrying up the great stair. At the first landing place, on a small well-known blackboard, was a bit of paper, fastened by wafers and many remains of old wafers beside it. On the paper were the words, An operation today, J. B. Clark. Up ran the youths, eager to secure good places, in they crowded full of interest and talk. What's the case? Which side is it? Don't think them heartless. They are neither better nor worse than you or I. They get over their professional horrors and into their proper work, and in them pity as an emotion, ending in itself or at best in tears and a long-drawn breath, lessens, while pity as a motive is quickened and gains power and purpose. It is well for poor human nature that it is so. The operating theatre is crowded, much talk and fun, and all the cordiality and stir of youth. The surgeon, with his staff of assistants, is there. In comes Ailey. One look at her quiets and abates the eager students. That beautiful old woman is too much for them. They sit down and are dumb and gaze at her. These rough boys feel the power of her presence. She walks in quickly, but without haste, dressed in her mutch, her neckerchief, her white dimity short gown, her black bombazine petticoat, showing her white worsted stockings and her carpet shoes. Behind her was James with Rab. James sat down in the distance and took that huge and noble head between his knees. Rab looked perplexed and dangerous, forever cocking his ear and dropping it as fast. Ailey stepped up on a seat and laid herself on the table, as her friend the surgeon told her, arranged herself, gave a rapid look at James, shut her eyes, rested herself on me, and took my hand. The operation was at once begun. It was necessarily slow, and chloroform, one of God's best gifts to his suffering children, was then unknown. The surgeon did his work. The pale face showed its pain, but was still and silent. Rab's soul was working within him. He saw that something strange was going on, blood flowing from his mistress, and she was suffering. His ragged ear was up and importunate. He growled and gave now and then a sharp, impatient yelp. He would have liked to have done something to that man, but James had him firm and gave him a glower from time to time, and an intimation of a possible kick. All the better for James, he kept his eye and his mind off Ailey. It is over. She is dressed, steps gently and decently down from the table, looks for James, then turning to the surgeon and the students, she curtsies, and in a low, clear voice, begs their pardon if she has behaved ill. The students, all of us, wept like children. The surgeon happed her up carefully, and resting on James and me, Ailey went to her room, Rab following. 
he put her to bed. James took off his heavy shoes, crammed with tackets, heel-capped and toe-capped, and put them carefully under the table, saying, "'Master John, I'm for nane of ye strange nurse bodies for ail. I'll be a nurse, and I'll gang aboot on my stocking soles as canny as pussy. And so he did, and handy and clever and swift and tender as any woman was that horny-handed, snell, peremptory little man. Everything she got he gave her. He seldom slept, and often I saw his small, shrewd eyes out of the darkness fixed on her, as before they spoke little. Rab behaved well, never moving, showing us how meek and gentle he could be, and occasionally, in his sleep, letting us know that he was demolishing some adversary. He took a walk with me every day, generally to the candlemaker row, but he was sombre and mild, declined doing battle, though some fit cases offered, and indeed submitted to sundry indignities, and was always very ready to turn, and came faster back, and trotted up the stair with much lightness, and went straight to that door. Jess, the mare, had been sent with her weather-worn cart to Howgate, and had doubtless her own dim and placid meditations and confusions on the absence of her master and Rab, and her unnatural freedom from the road and her cart. For some days Ailey did well. The wound healed by the first intention, for, as James said, our Ailey's skin o'er clean to be ill. The students came in, quiet and anxious, and surrounded her bed. She said she liked to see their young, honest faces. The surgeon dressed her and spoke to her in his own short, kind way, pitying her through his eyes. Rab and James outside the circle, Rab being now reconciled and even cordial, and having made up his mind that, as yet nobody required worrying, but, as you may suppose, semper paratus. So far well, but four days after the operation, my patient had a sudden and long shivering, a grusin, as she called it. I saw her soon after. Her eyes were too bright, her cheek coloured. She was restless and ashamed of being so. The balance was lost. Mischief had begun. On looking at the wound, a blush of red told the secret. Her pulse was rapid, her breathing anxious and quick. She wasn't herself, as she said, and was vexed at her restlessness. We tried what we could. James did everything, was everywhere, never in the way, never out of it. Rab subsided under the table, into a dark place, and was motionless all but his eye, which followed everyone. Ailey got worse, began to wander in her mind, gently, was more demonstrative in her ways to James, rapid in her questions, and sharp at times. He was vexed, and said, She was never that way before, no, never. For a time she knew her head was wrong, and as always asking our pardon, the dear, gentle old woman, then delirium set in strong, without pause. Her brain gave way, and then came that terrible spectacle, quote, The intellectual power, through words and things, went sounding on its dim and perilous way. End quote. She sang bits of old songs and psalms, stopping suddenly, mingling the psalms of David and the diviner words of his son and Lord with homely odds and ends and scraps of ballads. Nothing more touching, or in a sense more strangely beautiful, did I ever witness. Her tremulous, rapid, affectionate, eager Scotch voice the swift, aimless, bewildered mind, the baffled utterance, the bright and perilous eye, some wild words, some household cares, something for James, the names of the dead. Rab called rapidly, and in a fret voice, he started up, surprised, and slinking off as if he were to blame somehow, or had been dreaming he heard many eager questions and beseechings, which James and I could make nothing of, and on which she seemed to set her all, and then sink back ununderstood. She was very sad, for better than many things that are not called sad. James hovered about, put out and miserable, but active and exact as ever, read to her, when there was a lull, short bits from the psalms, prose and metre, 
chanting the latter in his own rude and serious way, showing great knowledge of the fit words, bearing up like a man, and doting over her as his ain Ailey, Ailey, my woman, my ain bonny wee dirty. The end was drawing on, the golden bowl was breaking, the silver cord was being loosed, that animula blandula, vagula hospes comesque, was about to flee. The body and soul, companions for sixty years, were being sundered and taking leave. She was walking alone through the valley of that shadow into which one day we must all enter. And yet she was not alone, for we know whose rod and staff were comforting her. One night she had fallen quiet and, as we hoped, asleep. Her eyes were shut. We put down the gas and sat watching her. Suddenly she sat up in bed and, taking a bedgown which was lying on it rolled up, she held it eagerly to her breast, to the right side. We could see her eyes bright with a surprising tenderness and joy, bending over this bundle of clothes. She held it as a woman holds her sucking child, opening out her nightgown impatiently, and holding it close, and brooding over it, and murmuring foolish little words, as over one whom his mother comforteth, and who sucks and is satisfied. It was pitiful and strange to see her wasted, dying look, keen and yet vague, her immense love. Preserve me, groaned James, giving way, and then she rocked back and forward as if to make it sleep, hushing it and wasting on it her infinite fondness. Where's me, doctor? I declare she's thinking it's that bairn. What bairn? The only bairn we ever had, are we Macy, and she's in the kingdom forty years and mare. It was plainly true, the pain in the breast telling its urgent story to a bewildered, ruined brain was misread and mistaken. It suggested to her the uneasiness of a breast full of milk, and then the child, and so again once more they were together, and she had her ain wee missy in her bosom. This was the close. She sank rapidly. The delirium left her, but, as she whispered, she was clean silly. It was the lightning before the final darkness. After having for some time lain still, her eyes shut, she said, James! He came close to her, and lifting up her calm, clear, beautiful eyes, she gave him a long look, turned to me kindly but shortly, looked for Rab but could not see him, then turned to her husband again, as if she would never leave off looking, shut her eyes and composed herself. She lay for some time, breathing quick, and passed away so gently that, when we thought she was gone, James, in his old-fashioned way, held a mirror to her face. After a long pause, one small spot of dimness was breathed out, it vanished away, and never returned, leaving the blank, clear darkness of the mirror without a stain. Quote, what is our life? It is even a vapour which appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. End quote. Rab all this time had been full awake and motionless. He came forward beside us. Ailey's hand, which James had held, was hanging down. It was soaked with his tears. Rab licked it all over carefully, looked at her, and returned to his place under the table. James and I sat, I don't know how long, but for some time, saying nothing. He started up abruptly, and with some noise went to the table, and putting his right fore and middle fingers each into a shoe, pulled them out and put them on, breaking one of the leather latchets and muttering in anger, I never did the like of that before. I believe he never did, nor after either. Rab, he said roughly, and pointing with his thumb to the bottom of the bed, Rab leapt up and settled himself, his head and eye to the dead face. Meister John, you'll wait for me, said the carrier, and disappeared in the darkness, thundering downstairs in his heavy shoes. I ran to a front window. There he was, already round the house and out at the gate, fleeing like a shadow. I was afraid about him, and yet not afraid, so I sat down beside Rab, and being wearied, fell asleep. 
I awoke from a sudden noise outside. It was November, and there had been a heavy fall of snow. Rab was in statu quo. He heard the noise, too, and plainly knew it, but never moved. I looked out, and there, at the gate, in the dim morning, for the sun was not up, was Jess and the cart, a cloud of steam rising from the old mare. I did not see James. He was already at the door and came up the stairs and met me. It was less than three hours since he left, and he must have posted out, who knows how, to Howgate, full nine miles off, yoked Jess and driven her astonished into town. He had an armful of blankets and was streaming with perspiration. He nodded to me, spread out on the floor two pairs of clean old blankets, having at their corners A.G. 1794 in large letters in red worsted. These were the initials of Alison Graham, and James may have looked in at her from without, himself unseen but not unthought of, when he was wat, wat, and weary. And, after having walked many a mile over the hills, may have seen her sitting while... Ah, the life worth sleeping! And by the firelight, working her name on the blankets for her A and James bed, he motioned Rab down, and taking his wife in his arms, laid her in the blankets, and happed her carefully and firmly up, leaving the face uncovered, and then, lifting her, he nodded again sharply to me, and with a resolved but utterly miserable face, strode along the passage and downstairs, followed by Rab. I followed with a light, but he didn't need it. I went out holding stupidly the candle in my hand in the calm, frosty air. We were soon at the gate. I could have helped him, but I saw he was not to be meddled with, and he was strong and did not need it. He laid her down as tenderly, as safely, as he had lifted her out ten days before as tenderly as when he had her first in his arms when she was only A.G., sorted her, leaving that beautiful, sealed face open to the heavens, and then, taking Jess by the head, he moved away. He did not notice me, neither did Rab, who presided behind the cart. I stood till they passed through the long shadow of the college and turned up Nicholson Street. I heard the solitary cart sound through the streets, and die away, and come again, and I returned thinking of that company going up to Liberton Bray, then along Rosslyn Muir, the morning light touching the Pentlands, and making them like onlooking ghosts, and then down the hill through the Ochendini woods, past haunted Woodhousley, and as daybreak came sweeping up the bleak Lammers Muirs, and fell on his own door, the company would stop, and James would take the key, and lift Ailey up again, laying her on her own bed, and having put Jess up, would return with Rab and shut the door. James buried his wife with his neighbour's mourning, Rab inspecting the solemnity from a distance. It was snow, and that black ragged hole would look strange in the midst of the swelling spotless cushion of white. James looked after everything, then rather suddenly fell ill and took to bed, was insensible when the doctor came, and soon died. A sort of low fever was prevailing in the village, and his want of sleep, his exhaustion, and his misery made him apt to take it. The grave was not difficult to reopen. A fresh fall of snow had again made all things white and smooth. Rab once more looked on and slunk home to the stable. And what of Rab? I asked for him next week of the new carrier who got the goodwill of James's business and was now master of Jess and her cart. How's Rab? He put me off and said rather rudely, What's your business with your dog? I was not to be so put off. Where's Rab? He, getting confused and red and intermeddling with his hair, said, Deed, sir, Rab's deed. Deed? What did he die of? Weel, sir, said he, getting redder, he did not exactly dee, he was killed. I had to brain him wi' a rack pin. They were near doing with him. He lay in the trevice wi' the mere and would not come out. I tempted him with kale and meat, 
for he would take nothing and keep it me from feeding the beast, and he was a gur gurring and grup grupping me by the legs. I was leath to make a wa with the old dog. His like was nay atween this and Thornhill, but, deed, sir, I could do naething else. I believed him, fit end for Rab, quick and complete, his teeth and his friends gone. Why should he keep the peace and be civil? End of section one. Section two of the Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Hand. The Bloodhound by Barry Cornwall. Come, Herod, my hound, from the stranger's floor, old friend. We must wander this world once more. For no one now liveth to welcome us back, so come, let us speed on our fated track. What matter the region, what matter the weather, so you and I travel till death together? And in death, why, e'en there I may still be found by the side of my beautiful black bloodhound. We've traversed the desert, we've traversed the sea, and we've trod on the heights where the eagles be, seen Tartar and Arab and swart Hindu, how thou pull'st down the deer in those skies of blue. No joy did divide us, no peril could part the man from his friend of the noble heart. I his friend, for where, where shall there ever be found a friend like his resolute fond bloodhound? What Herod, old hound, dost remember the day when I routed the wolves like a stag at bay, when downward they galloped to where we stood, whilst I staggered with fear in the dark pine wood? Dost remember their howlings, their terrible speed? God, God, how I prayed for a friend in need. And he came. Ah, uh, twas then, my dear Herod, I found, that the best of all friends was my bold blood hound. Men tell us, dear friend, that the noble hound must forever be lost in the worthless ground. Yet courage, fidelity, love, they say, bear man as on wings to his skies away. Will Herod go tell them, whatever may be, I'll hope I may ever be found by thee. If in sleep, in sleep, if in skies around, mayest thou follow e'en thither, my dear bloodhound. Brian Waller Proctor Barry Cornwall. End of section two. Section three of the Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Dog of Flanders, Part 1, by Oida. Nello and Patricia were left all alone in the world. They were friends in a friendship closer than brotherhood. Nello was a little Adrinonus. Patricia was a big Fleming. They were both of the same age by length of years, yet one was still young and the other was already old. They had dwelt together almost all their days. Both were orphaned and destitute, and owed their lives to the same hand. It had been the beginning of the tie between them, the first bond of sympathy, and it had strengthened day by day, and had grown with their growth firm and indissolvable, until they loved one another very greatly. Their home was a little hut on the edge of a little village, a Flemish village, a league from Antwerp, set amidst flat breadths of pasture and cornland, with long lines of poplars and of alders bending in the breeze on the edge of the great canal which ran through it. It had about a score of houses and homesteads, with shutters of bright green or sky blue, and roofs rose red or black and white, and walls whitewashed until they shone in the sun like snow. In the centre of the village stood a windmill, placed on a little moss-grown slope. 
It was a landmark to all the level country round. It had once been painted scarlet, sails and all, but that had been in its infancy, half a century or more earlier, when it had ground wheat for the soldiers of Napoleon, and it was now a ruddy brown, tanned by wind and weather. It went queerly by fits and starts, as though rheumatic and stiff in the joints from age, but it served the whole neighbourhood, which would have thought it almost as impious to carry grain elsewhere as to attend any other religious service than the mass that was performed at the altar of the little old grey church, with its conical steeple that stood opposite to it, and whose single bell rang morning, noon and night, with that strange, subdued, hollow sadness, which every bell that hangs in the low country seems to gain as an integral part of its melody. Within sound of the little melancholy clock, almost from their birth upward they had dwelt together, Nello and Paratricia, in the little hut on the edge of the village, with the cathedral spy of Antwerp rising in the northeast, beyond the great green plain of seeding grass, and spreading corn that stretched away from them like a tideless, changeless sea. It was the hut of a very old man, of a very poor man, of old Jehan Das, who in his time had been a soldier, and who remembered the wars that had trampled the country as oxen tread down the furrows, and who had brought from his service nothing except a wound, which had made him a cripple. When old Jehan Das had reached his full eighty, his daughter had died in the Ardenus, hard by Stavelot, and had left him in legacy her two-year-old son. The old man could ill contrive to support himself, but he took up the additional burden uncomplainably, and it soon became welcome and precious to him. Little Nello, which was but a pet diminutive for Nicholas, throve with him, and the old man and the little child lived in the poor little hut contentedly. It was a very humble little mud hut indeed, but it was clean and white as a seashell, and stood in a small plot of garden ground that yielded beans and herbs and pumpkins. They were very poor, terribly poor. Many a day they had nothing at all to eat. They never by any chance had enough. To have had enough to eat would have been to have reached paradise at once. The old man was very gentle and good to the boy, and the boy was a beautiful, innocent, truthful, tender-natured creature, and they were happy on a crust and a few leaves of cabbage, and asked no more of earth or heaven, save indeed that Patricia should be always with them, since without Patricia where would they have been? Patricia was their alpha and omega, their treasury and granary, their store of gold and wand of wealth their breadwinner and minister, their only friend and comforter. Patricia dead or gone from them, they must have laid themselves down and died likewise. Patricia was body, brains, hands, head and feet to both of them. Patricia was their very life, their very soul. For Jehan Das was old and a cripple, and Nello was but a child, and Patricia was their dog a dog of Flanders, yellow of hide, large of head and limb, with wolf-like ears that stood erect, and legs bowed and feet widened in the muscular development wrought in his breed by many generations of hard surface. Patritiche came of a race which had toiled hard and cruelly from sire to son in Flanders many a century. Slaves of slaves, dogs of the people, beasts of the shafts and the harness, creatures that lived straining their sinews in the gall of the cart, and died breaking their hearts in the flints of the streets. Patricia had been born of parents who had laboured hard all their days over the sharp-set stones of the various cities, and the long, shadowless, weary roads of the two Flanders and of Brabant. He had been born to no other heritage than those of pain and of toil. He had been fed on curses and baptised with blows. Why not? It was a civilised country, and Patritiche was but a dog. Before he was fully grown, he had known the bitter gall of the cart and the collar. Before he had entered his thirteenth month, he had become the property of a hardware dealer, 
who was accustomed to wander over the land north and south, from the blue sea to the green mountains. They sold him for a small price because he was so young. This man was a drunkard and a brute. The life of Patricia was a life of hell. To deal with the tortures of hell on the animal creation is a way which too many people have of showing their belief in it. His purchaser was a sullen, ill-living, brutal, Brabontius, who heaped his cart full with pots and pans, and flagons and buckets, and other wares of crockery and brass and tin, and left Patricia to draw the load as best as he might, while he himself lounged idly by the side in fat and sluggish ease, smoking his black pipe and stopping at every wine shop or cafe on the road. Happily for Patritiche, or unhappily, he was very strong. He came of an iron race, long born and bred to such cruel travail, so that he did not die, but managed to drag on a wretched existence under the brutal burdens, the scarifying lashes, the hunger, the thirst, the blows, the curses, and the exhaustion which are the only wages with which the Flemings repay the most patient and laborious of all their four-footed victims. One day, after two years of this long and deadly agony, Patricia was going on as usual along one of the straight, dusty, unlovely roads that lead to the city of Rubens. It was full midsummer and very warm. His cart was very heavy, piled high with goods in metal and in earthenware, his owner sauntered on without noticing him otherwise than by the crack of the whip as it curled around his quivering loins. The Brabontius had paused to drink beer himself at every wayside house, but he had forbidden Paratricia to stop a moment for a draught from the canal. Going along thus in the full sun on a scorching highway, having eaten nothing for twenty-four hours, which was far worse to him, not having tasted water for nearly twelve, being blind with dust, sore with blows, and stupefied with the merciless weight which dragged upon his loins. Patricia for once staggered and foamed a little at the mouth, and fell. He fell in the middle of the white dusty road, in the full glare of the sun. He was sick unto death and motionless. His master gave him the only medicine in his pharmacy, kicks and oaths and blows of a cudgel of oak, it had been often the only food and drink, the only wage and reward ever offered to him, but Patricia was beyond the reach of any torture or of any curses. Patricia lay, dead to all appearances, down in the white powder of the summer dust. After a while, finding it useless to assail his ribs with punishment, and his ears with maledictions, the Brabontius, deeming life gone in him, or going so nearly that his carcass was for ever useless, unless, indeed, someone should strip it of the skin for gloves, cursed him fiercely in farewell, struck off the leaven burns of the harness, kicked his body heavily aside into the grass, and groaning and muttering in savage wrath, pushed the cart lazily along the road uphill, and left the dying dog there for the ants to sting and for the crows to pick. It was the last day before Camis away at Lothane, when the Barbontius was in a haste to reach the fair and get a good place for his truck of brass wares. He was in fierce wrath, because Patricia had been a strong and much enduring animal, and because he himself had now the hard task of pushing his charrette all the way to Lothane. But to stay to look after Patricia never entered his thoughts. The beast was dying and useless, and he would steal to replace him, the first large dog that he found wandering alone out of sight of its master. Patricia had cost him nothing, or next to nothing, and for two long cruel years he had made him toil ceaselessly in his service from sunrise to sunset, through summer and winter, in fair weather and foul. He had got a fair use and a good profit out of Patricia, being human, he was wise, and left the dog to draw his last breath alone in the ditch, and have his bloodshot eyes plucked out as they may be by the birds, while he himself went on his way to beg and to steal, 
to eat and to drink, and to dance and to sing in the mirth at Lovain. A dying dog, a dog of the cart, why should he waste hours over his agonies at peril of losing a handful of copper coins, at peril of a shout of laughter? Patricia lay there, flung in the grass-green ditch. It was a busy road that day, and hundreds of people on foot and on mules, in wagons or in carts, went by, tramping quickly and joylessly on to Lovain. Some saw him, most did not even look, all passed on. A dead dog, more or less. It was nothing in Brabant, it would be nothing anywhere in the world. After a time, amongst the holiday-makers, there came a little old man who was bent and lame and very feeble. He was in no guise for feasting. He was very poorly and miserably clad, and he dragged his silent way slowly through the dust amongst the pleasure-seekers. He looked at Patricia, paused, wondered, turned aside, then kneeled down in the rank grass and weeds of the ditch, and surveyed the dog with kindly eyes of pity. There was with him a little rosy, fair-haired, dark-eyed child of a few years old, who pattered in amidst the bushes, but were for him breast high, and stood gazing with a pretty seriousness upon the poor, great, quiet beast. Thus it was that these two first met, the little Nello and the big Patricia. The upshot of that day was that old Jehan Das, with much laborious effort, drew the sufferer homeward to his own little hut, which was a stone's throw off amidst the fields, and there tended him with so much care that the sickness which had been a brain seizure brought on by heat and thirst and exhaustion, with time and shade and rest, passed away, and health and strength returned, and Patricia staggered up again upon his four stout, tawny legs. Now for many weeks he had been useless, powerless, sore, near to death, but all this time he had heard no rough word, had felt no harsh touch, but only the pitying murmurs of the little child's voice and the soothing caress of the old man's hand. In his sickness they too had grown to care for him, this lonely old man and the little happy child. He had a corner of the hut with a heap of dry grass for his bed, and they had learned to listen eagerly for his breathing in the dark night, to tell them that he lived, and when he first was well enough to essay a loud, hollow, broken bay, they laughed aloud, and almost wept together for joy at such a sign of his sure restoration, and little Nello, in delighted glee, hung around his rugged neck with chains of margaretas, and kissed him with fresh and ruddy lips. So then, when Patricia arose, himself again strong, big, gaunt, powerful, his great wistful eyes had a gentle astonishment in them, that there were no curses to rouse him, and no blows to drive him, and his heart awakened to a mighty love, which never wavered once in its fidelity, whilst life abode with him. But Patricia, being a dog, was grateful, Patricia lay pondering long with grave, tender, musing brown eyes, watching the movements of his friends. Now the old soldier, Jehan Das, could do nothing for his living, but limp about a little with a small cart, with which he carried daily the milk cans of those happier neighbours who owned cattle away into the town of Antwerp. Villagers gave him the employment a little out of charity more because it suited them well to send their milk into the town by so honest a carrier, and buy it at home themselves to look after their gardens, their cows, their poultry or their little fields. But it was becoming hard work for the old man. He was eighty-three, and Antwerp was a good league off or more. Patricia watched the milk cans come and go that one day when he had got well, and was lying in the sun with a reef of margaretas round his tawny neck. The next morning, Patricia, before the old man had touched the cart, arose and walked to it, and placed himself betwixt its handles, and testified as plainly as dumb show could do his desire and his ability to work in return for the bread of charity that he had eaten. Jehan Das resisted long, 
for the old man was one of those who thought it a foul shame to bind dogs to labour, for which nature never formed them, but Patatisha would not be gainsaid. Finding they did not harness him, he tried to draw the cart onward of his teeth. At length, Shehan Das gave way, vanquished by the persistence and the gratitude of this creature whom he had succoured. He fashioned his cart so that Patatisha could run in it, and this he did every morning of his life thenceforward. When the winter came, Shehan Das thanked the blessed fortune that had brought him to the dying dog in the ditch that fair day of Lovain. For he was very old, and he grew feebler with each year, and he would ill have known how to pull his load of milk cans over the snows and through the deep ruts in the mud if it had not been for the strength and the industry of the animal he had befriended. As for Patratiche, it seemed heaven to him, after the frightful burdens that his old master had compelled him to strain under, and the call of the whip at every step, it seemed nothing to him but amusement to step out with his little light green cart, his bright brass cans, by the side of the gentle old man who always paid him with a tender caress and with a kindly word. Besides, his work was over by three or four in the day, and after that time he was free to do as he would, to stretch himself, to sleep in the sun, to wander in the fields, to romp with the young child, or to play with his fellow dog. Patricia was very happy. Fortunately for his peace, his former owner was killed in a drunken brawl at the Kermesse of Mechlin, and so sought not after him, nor disturbed him in his new and well-loved home. A few years later, old Jehan Das had always been a cripple, became so paralysed with rheumatism that it was impossible for him to go out with the cart any more. Then little Nello, being now grown to his sixth year of age, and knowing the town well from having accompanied his grandfather so many times, took his place beside the cart and sold the milk and received the coins in exchange and brought them back to their respective owners with pretty grace and seriousness which charmed all who beheld him. The little Adrenios was a beautiful child, with dark, grave, tender eyes, a lovely bloom upon his face, and fair locks that clustered to his throat, and many an artist sketched the group as it went by him. The green cart with the brass flagons of Teniers, Amiras and Van Tal, and the great tawny-coloured massive dog, his bellied harness that chimed cheerily as he went, and a small figure that ran beside him, which had little white feet in great wooden shoes, and a soft, grave, innocent, happy face, like the fair children of Rubens. Nello and Paratisha did the work so well, and so joyfully together, that Jehan Das himself, when the summer came and he was better again, had no need to stir out, but could sit in the doorway in the sun and see them go forth through the garden wicket and then doze and dream and pray a little and then awake again as the clock toiled free and watch for their return. And on their return, Paratisha would shake himself free of his harness for a bay of glee and Nello would recount with pride the doings of the day and they would go in together to their meal of rye bread and milk or soup and would see the shadows lengthen over the great plain, and see the twilight veil the fair cathedral spire, and then lie down together to sleep peaceably, while the old man said a prayer. So the days and the years went on, and the lives of Nello and Patricia were happy, innocent and healthful. In the spring and summer especially were they glad. Flanders is not a lovely land, and round the burr of Rubens it is perhaps least lovely of all. Corn and colza, pasture and plough, succeed each other on the countless plain in wearying repetition, and save by some gaunt grey tower, with its peal of pathetic bells, or some figure coming athwart the fields, made picturesque by a gleaner's bundle, a woodman's faggot, there is no change, no variety, no beauty anywhere. And he who has dwelt upon the mountains, or amid the forests, feels oppressed as by imprisonment with a tedium 
and the endlessness of that vast and dreary land. But it is green and very fertile, and it has wide horizons that have a certain charm of their own, even in their dullness and monotony. And amongst the rushes by the waterside the flowers grow, and the trees rise tall and fresh, where the barges glide with their great hulks black against the sun, and their little grain barrels and very carried flags gay against the leaves. Anyway, there is greenery and breadth of space enough to be as good a beauty to a child and a dog, and these two asked no better when their work was done than to lie buried in the lush grasses on the side of the canal and watch the cumbrous vessels drifting by and bring in the crisp salt smell of the sea amongst the blossoming scents of the country summer. True, in the winter it was harder, and they had to rise in the darkness and the bitter cold, and they had sold them as much as they could have eaten any day, and the hut was scarce better than a shed when the nights were cold, though it looked so pretty in warm weather, buried in a great kindly clambering vine that never bore fruit, indeed, but which covered it with luxuriant green tracery all through the months of blossom and harvest. In winter, the winds found many holes in the walls of the poor little hut, and the vine was black and leafless, and the bare lands looked very bleak and drear without, and sometimes within the floor was flooded and then frozen. In winter, it was hard, and the snow numbed the little white limbs of Nello, and the icicles cut the brave and tiring seat of Paratricia. But even then they were never heard to lament, either of them. The child's wooden shoes and the dog's four lengths would trot manfully together over the frozen fields to the chime of the bells and the harness. And then sometimes, in the streets of Antwerp, some housewife would bring them a bowl of soup and a handful of bread, or some kindly trader would throw some billets of fuel into the little cart as it went homeward, or some woman in their own village would bid them keep some share of the milk they carried for their own food. And then they would run over the white lands, through the early darkness, bright and happy, and burst with a shout of joy into their home. So, on the whole, it was well with them, very well. And Patricia, meeting on the highway, or in the public streets, the many dogs who toiled from daybreak into nightfall, paid only with blows and curses, and loosened from the shafts of a kick to starve and freeze as best they might. Patricia, in his heart, was very grateful to his fate, and thought it the fairest and the kindliest the world could hold, though he was often very hungry indeed when he lay down at night, though he had to work in the heats of summer noons, and the rasping chills of winter dawns, though his feet were often tender with wounds from the sharp edges of the jagged pavement, though he had to perform tasks beyond his nature and against his nature. Yet he was grateful and content. He did his duty of each day, and the eyes that he loved smiled down on him. It was sufficient for Paratisha. There was only one thing which caused Paratisha any uneasiness in his life, and it was this. Antwerp, as all the world knows, is full at every turn of old piles of stones, dark and ancient and majestic, standing in crooked courts, jammed against gateways and taverns, rising by the water's edge, with bells ringing above them in the air, and ever and again out of their arched doors a swell of music pealing. There they remain, the grand old sanctuaries of the past, shut in amidst the squalor, the hurry, the crowds, the unloveliness, and the commerce of the modern world, and all day long the clouds drift and the birds circle and the winds sigh round them and beneath the earth at their feet there sleeps Rubens. And the greatness of the mighty master still rests upon Antwerp. And wherever we turn in its narrow streets his glory lies therein, so that all mean things are thereby transfigured. And as we pace slowly through the winding ways and by the edge of the stagnant water, and through the noisome courts, and the heroic beauty of his visions is about us, and the stones that once felt his footsteps and bore his shadow 
seemed to arise and speak of him with living voices. But the city which is the tomb of Rubens still lives to us through him, and him alone. It is so quiet there by that great white sepulchre, so quiet, save only when the organ peals and the choir cries aloud the sal vagina, or the Kyrie elation. Sure, no artist ever had a greater gravestone than that pure marble sanctuary gives to him in the heart of his birthplace in the chancel of St. Jacques. Without Rubens, what were Antwerp, a dirty, dusky, bustling mart, which no man would ever care to look upon save the traders who do business on its waves? With Rubens, to the whole world of men it is a sacred name, a sacred soil, a Bethlehem where a god of art saw light, a Golgotha where the god of art lies dead. O nations, closely should you treasure your great men, for thy them alone will the future know of you. Flanders in her generations has been wise. In his life she glorified this greatest of her sons, and in his death she magnifies his name. But her wisdom is very rare. Now the trouble of Paratisha was this. Into these great sad piles of stones that reared their melancholy majesty above the crowded roofs, the child Nello would many and many a time enter and disappear through their dark arched portals, whilst Paratisha, left without upon the pavement, would wearily and vainly ponder on what could be the charm which thus allured from him his inseparable and beloved companion. Once or twice he did essay to see for himself, clattering up the steps of his milk cart behind him, but thereon he had been always sent back again summarily by a tall custodian in black clothes and silver chains of office, and fearful of bringing his little master into trouble, he desisted and remained couched patiently before the churches until such time as the boy reappeared. It was not the fact of his going into them which disturbed Paratisha. He knew that people went to church, or the village went to the small, tumble-down, grey pile opposite the red windmill. What troubled him was that little Nello always looked strangely when he came out, always very flushed or very pale. Whenever he returned home after such visitations would sit silent and dreaming, not caring to play, but gazing out of the evening skies beyond the line of the canal, very subdued and almost sad. What was it? wondered Paratisha. He thought it could not be good or natural for the little lad to be so grave. And in his dumb fashion he tried all he could to keep Nello by him in the sunny fields or in the busy marketplace. But to the churches Nello would go. Most often of all would he go to the great cathedral. And Paratisha, left without on the stones by the iron fragments of Quentin Marx's grate, would stretch himself and yawn, and sigh, and even howl now and then, all in vain, until the doors closed, and the child perforce came forth again, and winding his arms about the dog's neck, would kiss him on his broad, tawny-coloured forehead, and murmur always the same words, If I could only see them, Paratisha, if I could only see them. What were they? pondered Paratisha, looking up with large, wistful, sympathetic eyes. One day, when the custodian was out of the way and the doors left ajar, he got in for a moment after his little friend and saw they were two great covered pictures on either side of the choir. Nello was kneeling, wrapped as in an ecstasy before the altar picture of the Assumption. But when he noticed Paratisha and rose and drew the dog gently out into the air, his face was wet with tears. He looked up at the veiled places as he passed them and murmured to his companion, It is so terrible not to see them. Paratisha, just because one is poor and cannot pay. He never meant that the poor should not see them when he pointed them, I'm sure. He would have had us see them any day, every day, that I am sure. And they keep them shrouded there, shrouded in the dark, the beautiful things. And they never feel the light. No eyes look on them unless rich people come and pay. If I could only see them, I would be content to die. 
but he could not see them, and Patricia could not help him, for to gain the silver piece that the church exacts as the price for looking on the glories of the elevation of the cross, and the descent from the cross was a thing as utterly beyond the powers of either of them as it would have been to scale the heights of the cathedral spire. They had never so much as a sow to spare. If they cleared enough to get a little wood for the stove, a little broth for the pot, it was the utmost they could do. And yet the heart of the child was set in sore, an endless longing upon beholding the greatness of the two veiled Rubens. The whole soul of the little Adroninus, thrilled and stirred of an absorbing passion for art, going on his way through the old city in the early days before the sun or the people had risen, Nello, who looked only a little peasant boy with a great dog drawing milk to sell from door to door, was in a heaven of dreams whereof Rubens was the god. Nello, cold and hungry with stockingless feet in wooden shoes, and the winter winds blowing amongst his curls, lifting his poor thin garments, was in a rapture of meditation, wherein all that he saw was the beautiful fair face of the Mary the Assumption, with the waves of her golden hair lying upon her shoulders, with the light of an eternal sun shining down upon her brow. Nello, reared in poverty, and buffeted by fortune, and untaught in letters, and unheeded by men, had the compensation of the curse which is called genius. No one knew it, he as little as any. No one knew it, only indeed Paratisha, who being with him always, saw him draw with chalk upon the stones any and everything that grew or breathed, heard him on his little bed of hay murmur all manner of timid, pathetic prayers to the spirit of the great master, watched his gaze darken, and his face radiate at the evening glow of sunset, or the rosy rising of the dawn, and felt many and many a time the tears of strange, nameless pain and joy, mingled together, fall hotly from the bright young eyes upon his own wrinkled yellow forehead. I should go to my grave quite content if I fought Nello, that when thou growest a man thou couldst own this hut and this little plot of ground and labour for thyself, and be called base by thy neighbours, said the old man Shehen many an hour from his bed, for to own a bit of soil and to be called base, master, by the hamlet round, is to have achieved the highest ideal of a Flemish pleasant and the old soldier who had wandered over all the earth in his youth, had brought nothing back, deemed in his old age that to live and die on one spot in contented humility was the fairest fate he could desire for his darling. But Nello said nothing. The same leaven was working in him that in other times begat Rubens, the Jordanes and the Van Eycks, and all their wondrous tribe, in times more recent begat in the green country of the Ardennes, where the muse washes the old walls of Dijon, the great artist of the Patricolus, whose genius is too near us for us a right to measure its divinity. Nello dreamed of other things in the future than of tilling the little rood of earth, and living under the wattle roof, and being called base by neighbours a little poorer or a little less poor than himself. The cathedral spire, where it rose beyond the fields in the ruddy evening skies or in the dim grey misty mornings, said other things to him than this. These he told only to Patricia, whispering childlike his fancies in the dog's ear when they went together at their work through the fogs of the daybreak, or lay together at their rest amongst the rustling rushes by the water's side. For such dreams are not easily shaped into speech, to awake the slow sympathies of human auditors. It would only have sorely perplexed and troubled the poor old man bedridden in his corner, who for his part, whenever he had trodden the streets of Antwerp, had fought the daub of blue and red that they called a Madonna, and the walls of the wine shop where he drank his sour's worth of black beer, quite as good as any of the famous altar pieces, for which the stranger folk travelled far and wide into Flanders, in every land in which the good sun shone. End of section three. Section four of the Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit librarybox.org. Recording by R. W. Raptor. A Dog of Flanders, Part Two, by Weeder. Four. There was only one other beside Patrish to whom Nello could talk at all of his daring fantasies. This other was little Alois, who lived at the old red mill on the grassy mound, and whose father, the miller, was the best-to-do husbandman in all the village. Little Alois was only a pretty baby, with soft, round, rosy features, made lovely by those sweet, dark eyes that the Spanish rule has left in so many a Flemish face. In testimony of the elven dominion, as Spanish art has left broadstone throughout the country, majestic palaces and stately courts, gilded house fronts and sculptured lintels, histories in blazonry and poems in stone. Little Alwa was often with Nello and Patrice. They played in the fields, they ran in the snow. They gathered the daisies and bilberries. They went up to the old grey church together, and they often sat together by the broad wood fire in the mill house. Little Alwa, indeed, was the richest child in the hamlet. She had neither brother nor sister. Her blue serge dress had never a hole in it. At Kermesse she had as many gilded nuts, and Agni Day in sugar as her hands could hold. And when she went up for her first communion, her flaxen curls were covered with a cap of riches, Mechelen lace, which had been her mother's and her grandmother's before it came to her. Men spoke already, though she had but twelve years of the good wife she would be for their sons to woo and win. But she herself was a little gay, simple child, in no wise conscious of her heritage, and she loved no playfellows so well as Yehan Dar's grandson and his dog. One day her father, Baz Cogez, a good man, but somewhat stern, came on a pretty group in the long meadow behind the mill, where the aftermath had that day been cut. It was his little daughter sitting amidst the hay, with the great tawny head of Patrish on her lap, and many wreaths of poppies and blue cornflowers, round in both. On a clean, smooth slab of pine wood, the boy Nello drew their likeness with a stick of charcoal. The miller stood and looked at the portrait with tears in his eyes. It was so strangely like, and he loved his only child closely and well. Then he roughly chid the little girl for idling there whilst her mother needed her within, and sent her indoors crying and afraid. Then, turning, he snatched the wood from Nello's hand. "'Dost do much of such folly?' he asked, but there was a tremble in his voice. Nello coloured and hung his head. "'I draw everything I see,' he murmured. The miller was silent. Then he stretched his hand out with a franc in it. It is folly, as I say, an evil waste of time. Nevertheless, it is like Alwa, and will please the house mother. Take this silver bit for it, and leave it for me. The colour died out of the face of the young Adama. He lifted his head and put his hands behind his back. Keep your money, and the portrait both, Bascoques, he said simply. You have been often good to me. Then he called Patrish to him and walked away across the fields. I could have seen them with that, Frank, he murmured to Patrish, but I could not sell her picture, not even for them. Baz Cogez went into his mill house, sore troubled in his mind. That lad must not be so much with Alois, he said to his wife that night. Trouble may come of it hereafter. He is fifteen now, and she is twelve, and the boy is comely of face and form. And he is a good lad and a loyal, said the housewife, feasting her eyes on the piece of pine wood where it was throned above the chimney, with a cooked clock in oak and a calvary in wax. Yea, I do not gainsay that, said the miller, draining his pewter flagon. Then, if what you think of were ever to come to pass, said the wife hesitatingly, would it matter so much? She will have enough for both, and one cannot be better than happy. You are a woman, and therefore a fool, said the miller harshly, striking his pipe on the table. The lad is naught but a beggar, and with those painter's fancies, worse than a beggar. Have a care that they are not together in the future. 
or I will send the child to the surer keeping of the nuns of the Sacred Heart. The poor mother was terrified, and promised humbly to do his will. Not that she could bring herself altogether to separate the child from her favourite playmate. Nor did the miller even desire that extreme of cruelty to a young lad who was guilty of nothing except poverty. But there were many ways in which little Alwa was kept away from her chosen companion. And Nello, being a boy proud and quiet and sensitive, was quickly wounded, and ceased to turn his own steps and those of Patrash, as he had been used to do with every moment of leisure, to the old red mill upon the slope. What his offence was he did not know. He supposed he had in some manner angered Bas Cogues by taking the portrait of Valois in the meadow. And when the child who loved him would run to him and nestle her hand in his, he would smile at her very sadly and say with a tender concern for her before himself, Nay, nee, Valois, do not anger your father. He thinks that I make you idle, dear and he is not pleased that you should be with me. He is a good man, and loves you well. We will not anger him, Alwa. But it was with a sad heart that he said it, and the earth did not look so bright to him as it had used to when he went out at sunrise under the poplars down the straight roads with Padrash. The old red mill had been a landmark to him, and he had been used to pause by it, going and coming, for a cheery greeting with its people as her little flaxen head rose above the low mill wicket, and her little rosy hands had held out a bone or a crust to Patrash. Now the dog looked wistfully at a closed door, and the boy went on without pausing, with a pang at his heart, and the child sat within with tears dropping slowly on the knitting to which she was set on her little stool by the stove, and Baz Cogues working among his sacks and his mill gear would harden his will and say to himself, It is best so. The lad is all but a beggar, and full of idle, dreaming fooleries. Who knows what mischief might not come of it in the future? So he was wise in his generation, and would not have the door unbarred, except upon rare and formal occasions, which seemed to have neither warmth nor mirth in them to the two children, who had been accustomed so long to a daily gleeful, careless, happy interchange of greeting, speech and pastime, with no other watcher of their sports or auditor of their fancies than Patrash, sagely shaking the brazen bells of his collar and responding with all a dog's swift sympathies to their every change of mood. All this while the little panel of pine wood remained over the chimney in the mill kitchen with the cuckoo clock and the waxen calvary, and sometimes it seemed to Nello a little hard that whilst his gift was accepted, he himself should be denied. But he did not complain. It was his habit to be quiet. Old Yehian Das had said ever to him, We are poor. We must take what God sends. The ill with the good. The poor cannot choose. To which the boy had always listened in silence, being reverent of his old grandfather but nevertheless a certain vague, sweet hope, such as beguiles the children of genius, had whispered in his heart. Yet the poor do choose sometimes, choose to be great, so that men cannot say them nay. And he thought so still in his innocence, and one day, when the little Alwa, finding him by chance alone amongst the cornfields by the canal, ran to him and held him close and sobbed piteously because the morrow would be her saint's day and for the first time in all her life her parents had failed to bid him to the little supper and romp in the great barns with which her feast day was always celebrated nello had kissed her and murmured to her in firm faith it shall be different one day alwa one day that little bit of pine wood that your father has of mine shall be worth its weight in silver and he will not shut the door against me then. Only love me always, dear little Alwa, only love me always, and I will be great. And if I do not love you? the pretty child asked, pouting a little through her tears and moved by the instinctive coquetries of her sex. Nello's eyes left her face and wandered to the distance, where in the red and gold of the Flemish night the cathedral spire rose. 
there was a smile on his face so sweet and yet so sad that little alwa was awed by it i will be great still he said under his breath great still or die alwa you do not love me said the little sport child pushing him away but the boy shook his head and smiled and went on his way through the tall yellow corn seeing as in a vision some day in a fair future when he should come into that old familiar land and ask alwa of her people be not refused or denied but received in honour whilst the village folk should throng to look upon him and say in one another's ears dost see him he is a king among men for he is a great artist and the world speaks his name and yet he was only our poor little nello he was a beggar as one may say and only got his bread by the help of his dog and he thought how he would fold his grandsire in furs and purples and portray him as the old man is portrayed in the family in the chapel of saint jacques and of how he would hang the throat of patrache with a collar of gold and place him on his right hand and say to the people this was once my only friend and of how he would build himself a great white marble palace and make to himself luxurious gardens of pleasure on the slope looking outward to where the cathedral spire rose and not dwell in it himself but summon to it as to a home all men young and poor and friendless but of the will to do mighty things and of how he would say to them always if they sought to bless his name nay do not thank me thank rubens without him what should i have been and these dreams beautiful impossible innocent free of all selfishness full of heroical worship were so closely about him as he went that he was happy happy even on this sad anniversary of alwal's saint's day when he and patrish went home by themselves to the little dark hut and the meal of black bread whilst in the mill-house all the children of the village sang and laughed and ate the big round cakes of dijon and the almond gingerbread of brabant and danced in the great barn to the light of the stars and the music of flute and fiddle never mind patrish he said with his arm round the dog's neck as they both sat in the door of the hut where the sounds of mirth at the mill came down to them on the night air never mind it shall all be changed by and by he believed in the future patrash of more experience and of more philosophy thought that the loss of the mill supper in the present was ill compensated by dreams of milk and honey in some vague hereafter and Patrish growled whenever he passed by Bas Cogiers. This is Alois' name day, is it not? said the old man Das that night from the corner where he was stretched upon his bed of sacking. The boy gave a gesture of assent. He wished that the old man's memory had erred a little, instead of keeping such sure account. And why not there? his grandfather pursued. Thou hast never missed a year before, Nello. Thou art too sick to leave, murmured the lad, bending his handsome young head over the bed. Tut, tut, Mother Nallette would have come and sat with me, as she does scores of times. What is the cause, Nello? the old man persisted. Thou surely hast not had ill words with the little one. Nay, Grandfather. Never, said the boy quickly, with a hot colour in his bent face. Simply and truly, Bascoges did not have me asked this year. He has taken some whim against me. But thou hast done nothing wrong. That I know nothing. I took the portrait of Alois on a piece of pine. That is all. Ah! The old man was silent. The truth suggested itself to him with the boy's innocent answer. He was tied to a bed of dried leaves in the corner of a wattle hut, but he had not wholly forgotten what the ways of the world were like. He drew Nello's fair head fondly to his breast with a tenderer gesture. 
Thou art very poor, my child, he said with a quiver, the more in his age trembling voice. So poor, it is very hard for thee. Nay, I am rich, murmured Nello. And in his innocence he thought so, rich with the imperishable powers that are mightier than the might of kings. And he went and stood by the door of the hut in the quiet autumn night, and watched the stars troop by and the tall poplars bend and shiver in the wind. All the casements of the mill house were lighted, and every now and then the notes of the flute came to him. The tears fell down his cheeks, for he was but a child. Yet he smiled, for he said to himself, In the future! He stayed there until all was quiet, still and dark. Then he and Patrish went within, and slept together long and deeply, side by side. 5. Now he had a secret which only Patrash knew. There was a little outhouse to the hut, which no one entered but himself. A dreary place, but with abundant clear light from the north. He he had fashioned himself rudely an easel in rough lumber, and here on a great grey sea of stretched paper he had given shape to one of the innumerable fancies which possessed his brain. No one had ever taught him anything, colours he had no means to buy. He had gone without bread many a time to procure even the few rude vehicles that he had here and it was only in black or white that he could fashion the things he saw. This great figure which he had drawn here in chalk was only an old man sitting on a fallen tree. Only that. He had seen old Michael, the woodman sitting so at evening many a time. He had never had a soul to tell him of outline or perspective, of anatomy or of shadow, and yet he had given all the weary, worn-out age, all the sad, quiet patience, all the rugged, careworn pathos of his original, and given them so that the old lonely figure was a poem, sitting there, meditative and alone on the dead tree, with the darkness of the descending night behind him. It was rude, of course, in a way, and had many faults, no doubt, and yet it was real, true in nature, true in art, and very mournful, and in a manner beautiful. Patrèche had lain quiet countless hours watching its gradual creation after the labour of each day was done, and he knew that Nello had a hope, vain and wild perhaps, but strongly cherished. Of sending this great drawing to compete for a prize of two hundred francs a year, which it was announced in Antwerp would be open to every lad of talent, scholar or peasant, under eighteen, who would attempt to win it with some unaided work of chalk or pencil. Three of the foremost artists in the town of Rubens were to be the judges, and elect the victor according to his merits. All the spring and summer and autumn Nello had been at work upon this treasure, which, if triumphant, would build him his first step toward independence and the mysteries of the art which he blindly, ignorantly and yet passionately adored. He said nothing to anyone. His grandfather would not have understood, and little Alois was lost to him. Only to Patrice she told all, and he whispered, Rubens would give it to me, I think, if he knew. Patrash thought so too, for he knew that Rubens had loved dogs, for he had never painted them with such exquisite fidelity, and men who loved dogs were, as Patrash knew, always pitiful. The drawings were to go in on the first day of December, and the decision to be given on the 24th, so that he who would win might rejoice with all his people at the Christmas season. In the twilight of a bitter wintry day, and with a beating heart, now quick with hope, now faint with fear, Nello placed the great pitcher on his little green milk cart, and took it, with the help of Patrish, into the town, and there left it, as enjoined at the doors of a public building. 
Perhaps it is worth nothing at all. How can I tell? he thought, with the heart sickness of a great timidity. Now that he had left it there, it seemed to him so hazardous, so vain, so foolish, to dream that he, a little lad with bare feet who barely knew his letters, could do anything at which great painters, real artists, could ever deign to look. Yet he took heart as he went by the cathedral. The lordly form of Reuben seemed to rise from the fog and the darkness, and to loom in its magnificence before him, whilst the lips with their kindly smile seemed to him to murmur, Nay, have courage. It was not by a weak heart and by faint fears that I wrote my name for all time upon Antwerp. Nello ran home through the cold night, comforted. He had done his best. The rest must be as God willed, he thought, in that innocent, unquestioning faith which had been taught him in the little grey chapel amongst the willows and poplar trees. The winter was very sharp already. That night, after they had reached the hut, the snow fell and fell for very many days after that, so that the paths and the divisions in the fields were all obliterated, and all the smaller streams were frozen over, and the cold was intense upon the plains. Then indeed it became hard work to go round for the milk, while the world was all dark, and carry it through the darkness to the silent town. Hard work, especially for Patrish, for the passage of the years, that were only bringing Nello a stronger youth, were bringing him old age, and his joints were stiff, and his bones ached often. But he would never give up his share of the labour. Nello would fain have spared him and drawn the cart himself, but Patrish would not allow it. All he would ever permit or accept was the help of a thrust from behind to the truck as it lumbered along with the ice ruts. Petrash had lived in harness, and he was proud of it. He suffered a great deal, sometimes from frost and the terrible roads and the rheumatic pains of his limbs. But he only drew his breath hard and bent his stout neck and trod onward with steady patience. Rest thee at home, Petrash. It is time thou didst rest, and I can quite well push in the cart by myself, urged Nello many a morning. But Petrush, who understood him all right, would not have been more consented to stay at home than a veteran soldier to shirk when the charge was sounding, and every day he would rise and place himself in his shafts, and plod along over the snow through the fields that his four round feet had left their print upon so many, many years. One must never rest till one dies, thought Petrush and sometimes it seemed to him that the time of rest for him was not very far off. His sight was less clear than it had been, and it gave him pain to rise after the night's sleep, though he would never lie a moment in his straw when once the bell of the chapel tolling five let him know that the daybreak of labour had begun. My poor Patrish, we shall soon lie quiet together, you and I, said old Yahendas stretching out to stroke the head of Patrush with the old withered hand which had always shared with him its one poor crust of bread. And the hearts of the old man and the old dog ached together with one thought. When they were gone, who would care for their darling? 6. One afternoon, as they came back from Antwerp over the snow, which had become hard and smooth as marble over all the Flemish plains, they found dropped in the road a pretty little puppet, a tambourine player, all scarlet and gold, about six inches high, and unlike greater personages, when fortune lets them drop, quite unspoiled and unhurt by its fall. It was a pretty toy. Nello tried to find its owner, and failing, thought that it was just the thing to please Alois. It was quite night when he passed the mill house. He knew the little window of her room. It could be no harm, he thought, if he gave her his little piece of treasure trove. They had been playfellows so long. There was a shed with a sloping roof beneath her casement. He climbed it and tapped softly at the lattice. There was a light within. The child opened it and looked out, half frightened. Nello put the tambourine player into her hands. 
Here is a doll I found in the snow, Alwa. Take it, and God bless thee, dear. He slid down from the shed roof before she had time to thank him, and ran off through the darkness. That night there was a fire at the mill. Outbuildings and much corn were destroyed, although the mill itself and the dwelling house were unharmed. All the village was out in terror, and engines came tearing through the snow from Antwerp. The miller was insured and would lose nothing. Nevertheless, he was in furious wrath, and declared aloud that the fire was due to no accident but some foul intent. Nello, awakened from his sleep, ran to help with the rest. Baz Cogez thrust him angrily aside. "'Thou wert loitering here after dark,' he said roughly. "'I believe on my soul that thou dost know more of the fire than any one. Nello heard him in silence, stupefied, not supposing that any one could say such things except in jest, and not comprehending how any one could pass a jest at such a time. Nevertheless, the miller said the brutal thing openly to many of his neighbours in the day that followed, and though no serious charge was ever preferred against the lad, he got bruited about that Nello had been seen in the mill-yard after dark on some unspoken errand and that he bore Bascog as a grudge for forbidding his intercourse with little Alwa. And so the hamlet, which followed the sayings of its richest landover, Servily, and whose families all hoped to secure the riches of Alwa in some future times for their sons, took the hint to give grave looks and cold words to old Yehan Das grandson. No one said anything to him openly, that all the village agreed together to humour the miller's prejudice, and at the cottages and farms where Nello and Patrice called every morning for the milk for Antwerp, downcast glances and brief phrases replaced to them the broad smiles and cheerful greetings to which they had been always used. No one really credited the miller's absurd suspicions, nor the outrageous accusations born of them but the people were all very poor and very ignorant, and the one rich man of the place had pronounced against him. Nello, in his innocence and his friendlessness, had no strength to stem the popular tide. "'Thou art very cruel to the lad,' the miller's wife dared to say, weeping to her lord. "'Sure, he is an innocent lad and a faithful, and would never dream of any such wickedness, however sore his heart might be.' But Baz Cogez, being an obstinate man, having once said a thing, held to it doggedly, though in his innermost soul he knew well the injustice that he was committing. Meanwhile, Nello endured the injury done against him with a certain proud patience that disdained to complain. He only gave way a little when he was quite alone with old Patrash. Besides, he thought, if it should win, they will be sorry then, perhaps. Still, to a boy not quite sixteen, and who had dwelt in one little world all his short life, and in his childhood had been caressed and applauded on all sides, it was a hard trial to have the whole of that little world turn against him for naught, especially hard in that bleak, snow-bound, famine-stricken winter-time, when the only light and warmth there could be found abode beside the village hearths and in the kindly greetings of neighbours. In the winter time, all drew nearer to each other, all to all except to Nello and Patrice, with whom none now would have anything to do, and who were left to fare as they might with the old paralysed bedridden man in the little cabin, whose fire was often low and whose board was often without bread. For there was a buyer from Antwerp, who had taken to drive his mule in of the day for the milk of the various dairies, and there were only three or four of the people who had refused his terms of purchase and remained faithful to the little green cart, so that the burden which Patrice drew had become very light, and the centime pieces in Nello's pouch had become, alas, very small likewise. The dog would stop, as usual, at all the familiar gates which were now closed to him, and look up at them with wistful, mute appeal. And it cost the neighbours a pang to shut their doors and their hearts, and let Patrash draw his cart on again empty. Nevertheless they did it, for they desired to please Bas Cogez. 
End of section 4. Recording by R. W. Raptor. Section 5 of The Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. W. Raptor. A Dog of Flanders, Part 3, by Weeder. 7. Noel was close at hand. The weather was very wild and cold. The snow was six feet deep, and the ice was firm enough to bear oxen and men upon it everywhere. At this season the little village was always gay and cheerful. At the poorest dwelling there were posets and cakes, joking and dancing, sugared saints and gilded Jesus. The merry Flemish bells jingled everywhere on the horses. Everywhere within doors some well-filled soup pot sang and smoked over the stove, and everywhere over the snow without laughing maidens patted in bright kerchiefs and stout kirtles, going to and from the mass. Only in the little hut it was very dark and very cold. Nello and Petrush were left utterly alone. For one night in the week before the Christmas day, death entered there, and took away from life forever old Jehan Das, who had never known of life, aught save its poverty and its pains. He had long been half dead, incapable of any movement except a feeble gesture, and powerless for anything beyond a gentle word. And yet his loss fell on them both with a great horror in it. They mourned him passionately. He had passed away from them in his sleep, and when in the grey dawn they learned their bereavement, unutterable solitude and desolation seemed to close around them. He had long been only a poor, feeble, paralysed old man, who could not raise a hand in their defence, but he had loved them well. His smile had always welcomed their return. They mourned for him unceasingly, refusing to be comforted, as in the white winter day they followed the deal shell that held his body to the nameless grave by the little grey church. They were his only mourners, these two whom he had left friendless upon earth, the young boy and the old dog. "'Surely he will relent now, and let the poor lad come hither?' thought the miller's wife, glancing at her husband where he smoked by the hearth. Bas Cogues knew her thought. But he hardened his heart and would not unbar his door as the little humble funeral went by. "'The boy is a beggar,' he said to himself. "'He should not be about Alois. The woman dared not say anything aloud. But when the grave was closed and the mourners had gone, she put a wreath of immortals into Alois' hands and bade her go and lay it reverently on the dark, unmarked mound where the snow was displaced. Nello and Petrush went home with broken hearts. But even of that poor, melancholy, cheerless home, they were denied the consolation. There was a month's rent overdue for their little home. And when Nello had paid the last sad service to the dead, he had not a coin left. He went and begged grace of the owner of the hut, a cobbler who went every Sunday night to drink his pint of wine and smoke with Bas Corgues. The cobbler would grant no mercy. He was a harsh, miserly man and loved money. He claimed in default of his rent every stick and stone, every pot and pan in the hut, and bade Nello and Petrash be out of it on the morrow. Now, the cabin was lowly enough, and in some sense miserable enough, and yet their hearts clove to it with a great affection. They had been so happy there, and in the summer, with its clambering vine and its flowering beans, it was so pretty and bright in the midst of the sun-lighted fields. Their life in it had been full of labour and privation, and yet they had been so well content, so gay of heart running together to meet the old man's never-failing smile of welcome. All night long the boy and the dog sat by the fireless hearth in the darkness, drawn close together for warmth and sorrow. Their bodies were insensible to the cold, but their hearts seemed frozen in them. When the morning broke over the white, chill earth, it was the morning of Christmas Eve. 
With a shudder, Nello clasped close to him his only friend, while his tears fell hot and fast on the dog's frank forehead. Let us go, Petrash, dear, dear Petrash, he murmured. We will not wait to be kicked out. Let us go. Petrash had no will but his, and they went sadly side by side, out from the little place which was so dear to them both, in which every humble, homely thing was to them precious and beloved. Petrash dropped his head wearily as he passed by his own green cart. It was no longer his. It had to go with the rest to pay the rent, and his brass harness lay idle and glittering on the snow. The dog could have lain down beside it and died for very heart sickness as he went. But whilst the lad lived and needed him, Petrash would not yield and give way. They took the old accustomed road into Antwerp. The day had yet scarce more than dawned. Most of the shutters were still closed, but some of the villages were about. They took no notice whilst the dog and the boy passed by them. At one door, Nello paused and looked wistfully within. His grandfather had done many a kindly turn, in neighbour's service to the people who dwelt there. Would you give Petrush a crust? he said timidly. He is old, and he has had nothing since last forenoon. The woman shut the door hastily, murmuring some vague saying about wheat and rye being very dear that season. The boy and the dog went on again wearily. They asked no more. By slow and painful ways they reached Antwerp as the chimes told ten. If I had anything about me, I could sell to get him bread, thought Nello. But he had nothing except the wisp of linen and serge that covered him and his pair of wooden shoes. Petrush understood and nestled his nose into the lad's hand as though to pray him not to be disquieted for any woe or want of his. The winner of the drawing prize was to be proclaimed at noon, and to the public building where he had left his treasure Nello made his way. On the steps and in the entrance hall was a crowd of youths, some of his age, some older, all with parents or relatives or friends. His heart was sick with fear as he went amongst them, holding Petrush close to him. The great bells of the city clashed out the hour of noon with brazen clamour. The doors of the inner hall were opened. The eager panting throng rushed in. It was known that the selected picture would be raised above the rest upon a wooden dais. A mist obscured Nello's sight. His head swam. His limbs almost failed him. When his vision cleared, he saw the drawing raised on high. It was not his own. A slow, sonorous voice was proclaiming aloud that victory had been adjudged to Stephen Kesslinger, born in the burg of Antwerp, son of a wharfinger in that town. When Nello recovered his consciousness, he was lying on the stones without, and Petrush was trying with every art he knew to call him back to life. In the distance, a throng of the youths of Antwerp were shouting around their successful comrade, and escorting him with acclamations to his home upon the quay. The boy staggered to his feet and drew the dog into his embrace. "'It's all over, dear Petrush,' he murmured. "'All over!' He rallied himself as best he could, for he's weak from fasting, and retraced his steps to the village. Petrush paced by his side with his head drooping and his old limbs feeble from hunger and sorrow. Eight. The snow was falling fast. A keen hurricane blew from the north. It was bitter as death on the plains. It took them long to traverse the familiar path, and the bells were sounding four of the clock as they approached the hamlet. Suddenly Patrish paused, arrested by a scent in the snow, scratched, whined, and drew out with his teeth a small case of brown leather. He held it up to Nello in the darkness. Where they were there stood a little calvary, and a lamp burned dully under the cross. The boy mechanically turned the case to the light. On it was the name of Bas Cogues, and within it were notes for two thousand francs. 
The sight roused the lad a little from his stupor. He thrust it in his shirt and stroked Petrush and drew him onward. The dog looked up wistfully in his face. Now it made straight for the mill house and went to the house door and struck on its panels. The miller's wife opened it weeping, with little Alwa clinging close to her skirts. Is it thee, thou poor lad? she said kindly through her tears. Get thee gone, ere the bask has see thee. We are in sore trouble to-night. He is out seeking for a power of money that he has let fall riding homeward, and in this snow he never will find it. And God knows it will go nigh to ruin us. It is heaven's own judgment for the things we have done to thee. Nello put the note-case in her hand and called Petrush within the house. Petrush found the money to-night, he said quickly. Tell Baskogues so. I think he will not deny the dog shelter and food in his old age. Keep him from pursuing me, and I pray of you to be good to him. Ere either woman or dog knew what he meant. He had stooped and kissed Petrush, then closed the door hurriedly and disappeared in the gloom of the fast-falling night. The woman and the child stood speechless with joy and fear. Petrush vainly spent the fury of his anguish against the iron-bound oak of the barred house door. They did not dare unbar the door and let him forth. They tried all they could to solace him. They brought him sweet cakes and juicy meats. They tempted him with the best they had. They tried to lure him to abide by the warmth of the hearth, but it was of no avail. Petrush refused to be comforted or to stir from the barred portal. It was six o'clock when from an opposite entrance the miller at last came, jaded and broken, into his wife's presence. It is lost for ever, he said with an ashen cheek and a quiver in his stern voice. We have looked with lanterns everywhere. It is gone, the little maiden's portion and all. His wife put the money into his hand and told him how it had come to her. The strong man sank trembling into a seat and covered his face, ashamed and almost afraid. I have been cruel to the lad, he muttered at length. I deserve not to have good at his hands. Little Awal, taking courage, crept close to her father and nestled against him fair curly head. Nello may come here again, father? She whispered. He may come tomorrow, as he used to do? The miller pressed her in his arms. His hard, sunburned face was very pale and his mouth trembled. Surely, surely, he answered his child. He shall bide here on Christmas Day and any other day he will. God helping me, I will make amends to the boy. I will make amends. Little Awa kissed him in gratitude and joy, then slid from his knees and ran to where the dog kept watch by the door. And tonight I may feast Patrash, she cried in a child's thoughtless glee. Her father bent his head gravely. Ay, ay, let the dog have the best for the stern old man was moved and shaken to his heart's depths. It was Christmas Eve, and the mill-house was filled with oak logs and squares of turf, with cream and honey, with meat and bread, and the rafters were hung with wreaths of evergreen, and the calvary and the cuckoo clock looked out from a mass of holly. There were little paper lanterns too for Alwa, and toys of various fashions and sweetmeats in bright pictured papers. There were light and warmth and abundance everywhere, and the child would fain have made the dog a guest honoured and feasted. But Petrush would neither lie in the warmth nor share in the cheer. Famished he was, and very cold, but without Nello he would partake neither of comfort nor food. Against all temptation he was proof, and close against the door he leaned always, watching only for a means of escape. He wants a lad, said Bascogues. Good dog, good dog, I will go over to the lad the first thing at day dawn. For no one but Petrash knew that Nello had left the hut, and no one but Petrash divined that Nello had gone to face starvation and misery alone. The mill kitchen was very warm. Great logs crackled and flamed on the hearth. Neighbours came in for a glass of wine and a slice of the fat goose baking for supper. Alwa, gleeful and sure of her playmate back on the morrow, bounded and sang and tossed back her yellow hair. Bas Coggers, in the fullness of his heart, smiled on her through moistened eyes, 
and spoke of the way in which he would befriend her favourite companion. The house mother sat with calm, contented face at the spinning wheel. The cuckoo and the clock chirped mirthful hours. Amidst it all, Patrasche was bidden with a thousand words of welcome to tarry there a cherished guest. But neither peace nor plenty could allure him where Nello was not. When the supper smoked on the board, and the voices were loudest and gladdest, and the Christ child brought choicest gifts to Alois, Patrasche, watching always on an occasion, glided out when the door was unlatched by a careless newcomer, and as swiftly as his weak and tired limbs would bear him sped over the snow in the bitter black night, he had only one thought, to follow Nello. A human friend might have paused for the pleasant meal, the cheery warmth, the cosy slumber, but that was not the friendship of Patrasche. He remembered a bygone time when an old man and a little child had found him sick unto death in the wayside ditch. Snow had fallen freshly all the evening long. It was now nearly ten. The trail of the boy's footsteps was almost obliterated. It took Petrash long to discover any scent. When at last he found it, it was lost again quickly, and lost and recovered, and again lost and again recovered, a hundred times or more. The night was very wild. The lamps under the wayside crosses were blown out. The roads were sheets of ice. The impenetrable darkness hid every trace of habitations. There was no living thing abroad. All the cattle were housed, and in all the huts and homesteads men and women rejoiced and feasted. There was only Petrush out in the cruel cold, old and famished and full of pain but with the strength and the patience of a great love to sustain him in his search. The trail of Nello's steps, faint and obscure as it was under the new snow, went straightly along the accustomed tracks into Antwerp. It was past midnight when Petrash traced it over the boundaries of the town and into the narrow, tortuous, gloomy streets. It was all quite dark in the town, save where some light gleamed ruddily through the crevices of house shutters or some group went homeward with lanterns, chanting drinking songs. The streets were all white with ice. The high walls and roofs leaned black against them. There was scarce a sound, save the riot of the winds down the passages as they tossed the creaking signs and shook the tall lamp-irons. So many passers-by had trodden through and through the snow. So many diverse paths had crossed and recrossed each other, that the dog had a hard task to retain any hold on the track he followed. But he kept on his way. Though the cold pierced him to the bone, and the jagged ice cut his feet, and the hunger in his body gnawed like a rat's teeth, he kept on his way, a poor, gaunt, shivering thing, and by long patience traced the steps he loved into the very heart of the burg and up the steps of the great cathedral. He has gone to the things that he loved. Petrush. He could not understand, but he was full of sorrow and of pity for the art passion that to him was so incomprehensible and yet so sacred. The portals of the cathedral were unclosed after the midnight mass. Some heedlessness in the custodians, too eager to go home and feast or sleep, or too drowsy to know whether they turned the key all right, had left one of the doors unlocked. By that accident, the footfalls Petrush sought had passed through into the building, leaving the white marks of snow upon the dark stone floor. By that slender white thread, frozen as it fell, he was guided through the intense silence, through the immensity of the vaulted space, guided straight to the gates of the chancel, and stretched there upon the stones he found Nello, he crept up and touched the face of the boy. Didst thou dream that I should be faithless and forsake thee, I, a dog? said that mute caress. The lad raised himself with a low cry and clasped him close. Let us lie down and die together, he murmured. Men have no need of us, and we are all alone. In answer, Petrush crept closer yet and laid his head upon the young boy's breast. The great tears stood in his brown sad eyes. Not for himself, for himself he was happy. 
They lay close together in the piercing cold. The blasts that blew over the Flemish dikes from the northern seas were like waves of ice, which froze every living thing they touched. The interior of the immense vault of stone in which they were was even more bitterly chilled than the snow-covered plains without. Now and then a bat moved in the shadows. Now and then a gleam of light came on the ranks of carven figures. Under the rubens they lay together quite still, and soothed almost into a dreaming slumber by the numbing narcotic of the cold. Together they dreamed of the glad old days when they had chased each other through the flowering grasses of the summer meadows, or sat hidden in the tall bulrushes by the water's side, watching the boats go seaward in the sun. Suddenly through the darkness a great white radiance streamed through the vastness of the isles. The moon, that was at her height, had broken through the clouds. The snow had ceased to fall. The light reflected from the snow without was as clear as the light of dawn. It fell through the arches full upon the two pitches above, from which the boy on his entrance had flung back the veil. The elevation and the descent from the cross were for one instant visible. Nello rose to his feet and stretched his arms to them. The tears of a passionate ecstasy glistened on the paleness of his face. I have seen them at last, he cried aloud. Oh God, it is enough. His limbs failed under him, and he sank upon his knees, still gazing upward at the majesty that he adored. For a few brief moments the light illuminated the divine visions that had been denied to him so long. Light clear and sweet and strong as though it streamed from the throne of heaven. Then suddenly it had passed away. Once more a great darkness covered the face of Christ. The arms of the boy drew close again the body of the dog. We shall see his face there, he murmured. And he will not part us, I think. On the morrow, by the chancel of the cathedral, the people of Antwerp found them both. They were both dead. The cold of the night had frozen into stillness alike the young life and the old. When the Christmas morning broke and the priests came to the temple, they saw them lying thus on the stones together. Above the veils were drawn back from the great visions of Rubens, and the fresh rays of the sunrise touched the thorn-crowned head of the Christ. As the day grew on, there came an old, hard-featured man who wept as women weep. "'I was cruel to the lad,' he muttered, "'and now I would have made amends, yea, to the half of my substance. "'And he should have been to me as a son.' There came also, as the day grew apace, a painter who had fame in the world, and who was liberal of hand and of spirit. I seek one who should have had the prize yesterday, had worth one, he said to the people. A boy of rare promise and genius, an old woodcutter on a fallen tree at eventide. That was all his theme. But there was greatness for the future in it. I would fain find him and take him with me and teach him art and a little child with curling fair hair sobbing bitterly as she clung to her father's arm cried aloud oh nello come we have all ready for thee the christ child's hands are full of gifts and the old piper will play for us and the mother says thou shalt stay by the hearth and burn nuts with us all the noel week long Yes, even to the feast of the kings. And Petrush will be so happy. O oh, Nello, wake and come. But the young pale face, turned upward to the light of the great Rubens, with a smile upon its mouth, answered them all. It is too late. For the sweet sonorous bells went ringing through the frost, and the sunlight shone upon the plains of snow, and the populace trooped gay and glad through the streets, but Nello and Petrush no more asked charity at their hands. All they needed now Antwerp gave unbidden. Death had been more pitiful to them than longer life would have been. It had taken the one in the loyalty of love, and the other in the innocence of faith, 
from a world which for love has no recompense and for faith no fulfilment. All their lives they had been together, and in their deaths they were not divided, for when they were found the arms of the boy were folded too closely around the dog to be severed without violence, and the people of their little village, contrite and ashamed, implored a special grace for them, and, making them one grave, lay them to rest there side by side, forever. End of section 5 Read by R. W. Raptor Section number 6 of The Good Dog Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katharina Glovala Chance by Henry Herbert Nips Sixty miles from a homestead, straight as the crow can fly, we camped in the deadwood foothills. Mineral? Yes. And gold. Three of us in the outfit, the burrow, and Chance, and I. Chance wasn't more than a pup then, going on two-year-old. Already he knew the music that a desert rattler makes, when glimmering under a yucca, he'd seen him coil to spring. But he didn't need no teaching to keep him away from snakes. You should see his tail go under when he heard a rattler sing. Town folks called him the killer, and I reckon that they was right. Deep in the chest, wolf-muscled, and quicker than fire in tow. But one of the kind that never went out of his way to fight though he'd tackle a coral of wild cats if I gave him the word to go. There was more to him than his fightin'. He was wise. It was right good fun to see him using his headpiece when the sun was a frying eggs, trailin' along with the outfit and cheatin' the desert sun by keepin' into the shadow right close to my burrow's legs. I knew that some day I'd lose him, for the desert she don't wait long. Hosses and dogs and humans... None of them get too old. Gold? Looks good in a story and sounds right good in a song, but the men that go out and get it, they know what they pay for gold. If I struck a ledge that showed me a million, the whole thing mine, I'd turn it over tomorrow and never so much as glance at the papers the law sharks frame up and hand you a pen to sign for a look at my old side partner, the killer that I called Chance. Why? Well, my eyes one morning was blinking to shake a dream, and Chance was sleeping beside me, breathing it long and deep, when I saw an awful something and I felt I was like to scream. There was a big brown rattler coiled in my arm, asleep. Move, and I knew he'd get me. Waiting, I held my breath feeling the sun get warmer, wondering what to do, trying to keep my eyes off that shining and sudden death, when chance he lifted his head up and slow come the rattlers too. Take him! I tried to whisper. Maybe I did. I know chance's neck was a bristle and his eyes on the coiled up snake. Its head was a moving gentle, like weeds when the south wind blows, when chance jumped in, the killer. Do that for a partner's sake? I'd like to think that I'd do it. Up there in the far-off blue, old master, he sets a judge in such things. Can you tell me why? Knowing what he had coming, he went at it fighting true, tore that snake into ribbons, then crawled to the brush to die? Never come near me after. Knew that he'd got his call. How come I went and shot him? God, I can see his eyes. See where those pointed shadows run down that canyon wall? That there's his tombstone, stranger. Bigger than money buys. End of section 6 Recording by Katarina Glovala Section 7 of The Good Dog Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Mr. Keen, part one by John Muir. In the summer of 1880, I sent out from Fort Wrangell in a canoe to continue the exploration of the icy region of southeastern Alaska, begun in the fall of 1879. After the necessary provisions, blankets, etc., had been collected and stowed away, and my Indian crew were in their places ready to start while a crowd of their relatives and friends on the wharf were bidding them goodbye and good luck, my companion, the Reverend S. H. Young, for whom we were waiting, at last came aboard, followed by a little black dog that immediately made himself at home by curling up in a hollow among the baggage. I like dogs, but this one seemed so small and worthless that I objected to him going, and asked the missionary why he was taking him. Such a little helpless creature will only be in the way, I said. You had better pass him up to the Indian boys on the wharf to be taken home to play with the children. This trip is not likely to be good for toy dogs. The poor silly thing will be in the rain and snow for weeks and months, and will require care like a baby. But his master assured me that he would be no trouble at all, that he was a perfect wonder of a dog, could endure cold and hunger like a bear, swim like a seal, and was wondrous, wise, and cunning, etc., making out a list of virtues to show he might be the most interesting member of the party. Nobody could hope to unravel the lines of his ancestry in all the wonderfully mixed and varied dog tribe. I never saw any creature very much like him, though in some of his sly, soft, gliding motions and gestures, he brought the fox to mind. He was short-legged and bunchy-bodied, and his hair, though smooth, was long and silky, and slightly waved, so that when the wind was at his back, it ruffled, making him look shaggy. At first sight, his only noticeable feature was his fine tail, which was about as airy and shady as a squirrel's, and was carried curling forward almost to his nose. On closer inspection, you might notice his thin, sensitive ears and sharp eyes with cunning tan spots above them. Mr. Young told me that when the little fellow was a pup, about the size of a wood rat, he was presented to his wife by an Irish prospector at Sitka, and that on his arrival at Fort Wrangell, he was adopted with enthusiasm by the Stickeen Indians as a sort of new good luck totem, was named Stickeen for the tribe, and became a universal favorite, petted, protected, and admired wherever he went and regarded as a mysterious fountain of wisdom. On our trip, he soon proved himself a queer character, odd, concealed, independent, keeping invincibly quiet, and doing many little puzzling things that piqued my curiosity. As we sailed week after week through the long, intricate channels and inlets among the innumerable islands and mountains of the coast, he spent most of the dull days in sluggish ease, motionless, and apparently as unobserving as if in a deep sleep. But I discovered that somehow he always knew what was going on. When the Indians were about to shoot their ducks or seals, or when anything along the shore was exciting our attention, he would rest his chin on the edge of the canoe and calmly look out like a dreamy-eyed tourist. And when he heard us talking about making a landing, he immediately roused himself to see what sort of a place we were coming to, and made ready to jump overboard and swim ashore as soon as the canoe neared the beach. Then, with a vigorous shake to get rid of the brine in his hair, he ran into the woods to hunt small game. But though always the first out of the canoe, he was always the last to get in it. When we were ready to start, he could never be found. We soon found out, however, that though we could not see him at such times, he saw us, and from the corner of the briars and huckleberry bushes in the fringe of the woods was watching the canoe with wary eye. For as soon as we were fairly off, he came trotting down the beach, plunged into the surf, and swam after us, knowing well that we would cease rowing to take him in. When the contrary little vagabond came alongside, he was lifted by the neck, held at arm's length a moment to drip, and dropped aboard. We tried to cure him of this trick by compelling him to swim a long way, as if we had a mind to abandon him, but this did no good. The longer the swim, the better he seemed to like it. 
Though capable of great idleness, he never failed to be ready for all sorts of adventures and excursions. One pitch dark rainy night, we landed about 10 o'clock at the mouth of the salmon stream when the water was phosphorescent. The salmon were running and the myriad fins of the onrushing multitude were churning all the stream into a silvery glow, wonderfully beautiful and impressive in the ebon darkness. To get a good view of the show, I set out with one of the Indians and sailed up through the midst of it to the foot of a rapid about half a mile from camp, where the swift current dashing over the rocks made the luminous glow most glorious. Happening to look back down the stream while the Indian was catching a few of the struggling fish, I saw a long spreading fan of light like the tail of a comet, which we thought must be made by some big strange animal that was pursuing us. On it came with its magnificent train until we imagined we could see the monster's head and eyes, but it was only Stikeen who, finding I had left the camp, came swimming after me to see what was up. When we camped early, the best hunter of the crew usually went to the woods for a deer, and Stikeen was sure to be at his heels, provided I had not gone out. For, strange I say, though I never carried a gun, he always followed me, forsaking the hunter and even his master to share my wanderings. The days that were too stormy for sailing I spent in the woods or the adjacent mountains. Wherever my studies called me, and Stikine always insisted on going with me, however wild the weather, gliding like a fox through the dripping huckleberry bushes and thorny tangles of panax and rubus, scarce stirring their rain-laden leaves, wading and wallowing through the snow, swimming icy streams, skipping over logs and rocks and the crevices of glaciers with the patience and endurance of a determined mountaineer, never tiring or getting discouraged. Once he followed me over a glacier, the surface of which was so crusty and rough that it cut his feet until every step was marked with blood, but he trotted on with Indian fortitude until I noticed his red track and, taking pity on him, made him a set of moccasins out of a handkerchief. However great his troubles, he never asked for help or made any complaint, as if like a philosopher he had learned that without hard work and suffering there could be no pleasure worth having. Yet none of us was able to make out what Stikeen was really good for. He seemed to meet danger and hardships without anything like reason, insisted on having his own way, never obeyed an order, and the hunter could never set him on anything or make him fetch the birds he shot. His equanimity was so steady, it seemed due to want of feeling. Ordinary storms were pleasures to him, and as for mere rain, he flourished in it like a vegetable. No matter what advances you might make, scarce a glance or a tail wag would you get for your pains. But though he was apparently as cold as a glacier, and about as impervious to fun, I tried hard to make his acquaintance, guessing there must be something worth while hidden beneath so much courage, endurance, and love of wild, weathery adventure. No superannuated mastiff or bulldog grown old in office surpassed this fluffy midget in stoic dignity. He sometimes reminded me of a small, squat, unshakable desert cactus, for he never displayed a single trace of the merry, tricksy, elfish self of the terriers and collies that we all know, nor of their touching affection and devotion. Like children, most small dogs beg to be loved and allowed to love, but Stikine seemed a very Diognese, asking only to be let alone, a true child of the wilderness, holding the even tenor of his hidden life with the silence and serenity of nature. His strength of character lay in his eyes. They looked as old as the hills and as young and as wild. I never tired of looking into them. It was like looking into a landscape, but they were small and rather deep set and had no explaining lines around them to give out particulars. I was accustomed to look into the faces of plants and animals, and I watched the little sphinx more and more keenly as an interesting study. But there is no estimating the wit and wisdom concealed and latent in our lower fellow mortals until made manifest by profound experiences. For it is through suffering that dogs as well as saints are developed and made perfect. 
After exploring the Sumdum and Taku Fjords and their glaciers, we sailed through Stevens Passage into Lynn Canal and thence through Icy Strait into Cross Sound, searching for unexplored inlets leading toward the great fountain ice fields of the Fairweather Range. Here, while the tide was in our favor, we were accompanied by a fleet of icebergs drifting out to the ocean from Glacier Bay. Slowly, we paddled around Vancouver's Point, Wimbledon, our frail canoe tossed like a feather on the massive heaving swells coming in past Cape Spencer. For miles, the sound is bounded by precipitous mural cliffs, which lashed with wave spray and their heads hidden in the clouds, looked terribly threatening and stern. Had our canoe been crushed or upset, we could have made no landing here, for the cliffs as high as those of Yosemite might sink sheer into deep water. Eagerly, we scanned the wall on the north side for the first sign of an opening fjord or harbor, all of us anxious, except Stikine, who dozed in peace or gazed dreamily at the tremendous precipices when he heard us talking about them. At length, we made the joyful discovery of the mouth of the inlet now called Taylor Bay, and about five o'clock reached the head of it and encamped in a spruce grove near the front of a large glacier. While camp was being made, Joe the hunter climbed the mountain wall on the east side of the fjord in pursuit of wild goats, while Mr. Young and I went to the glacier. We found that it is separated from the waters of the inlet by a tide-washed moraine and extends an abrupt barrier all the way across from wall to wall of the inlet, a distance of about three miles. But our most interesting discovery was that it had recently advanced, though again slightly receding. A portion of the terminal moraine had been plowed up and shoved forward, uprooting and overwhelming the woods on the east side. Many of the trees were down and buried, or nearly so. Others were leaning away from the ice cliffs, ready to fall, and some stood erect, with the bottom of the ice plow still beneath their roots, and its lofty crystal spires towering high above their tops. The spectacle presented by these century-old trees, standing close beside a spiry wall of ice, with their branches almost touching it, was most novel and striking. And while I climbed around the front and a little way up the west side of the glacier, I found that it had swelled and increased in height and width in accordance with its advance and carried away the outer ranks of trees on its bank. On our way back from the camp after these first observations, I planned a far and wide excursion for the morrow. I awoke early, called not only by the glacier, which had been on my mind all night, but by a grand flood storm, the wind was blowing a gale from the north, and the rain was flying with the clouds in a wide, passionate, horizontal flood, as if it were all passing over the country instead of falling on it. The main perennial streams were blooming high above their banks, and hundreds of new ones roaring like the sea almost covered the lofty gray walls of the inlet with white cascades and falls. I had intended making a cup of coffee and getting something like a breakfast before starting, but when I heard the storm and looked out, I made haste to join it, for many of nature's finest lessons are to be found in her storms, and if careful to keep in the right relations with them, we may go safely abroad with them, rejoicing in the grandeur and beauty of their works and ways, and chanting with the old Norsemen. The blast of the tempest aids our oars, the hurricane is our servant, and drives us whither we wish to go. So omitting breakfast, I put a piece of bread in my pocket and hurried away. Mr. Young and the Indians were asleep, and so I hoped was Stikine, but I had not gone a dozen rods before he left his bed in the tent and came boring through the blast after me. That a man should welcome storms for their exhilarating music and motion and go forth to see God making landscapes is reasonable enough, but what fascination could there be in such tremendous weather for a dog? Surely nothing akin to human enthusiasm for scenery or geology. Anyhow, on he came, breakfastless, through the choking blast. I stopped and did my best to turn him back. Now don't, I said, shouting to make myself heard in the storm. 
Now don't, Stickeen. What has gotten into your queer noddle now? You must be daft. This wild day has nothing for you. There is no game abroad, nothing but weather. Go back to camp and keep warm. Get a good breakfast with your master and be sensible for once. I can't carry you all day or feed you, and this storm will kill you. But nature, it seems, was at the bottom of the affair, and she gains her ends with dogs as well as with men, making us do as she likes shoving and pulling us along her ways however rough all but killing us at times and getting her lessons driven hard home after i had stopped again and again shouting good warning advice i saw that he was not to be shaken off as well might the earth try to shake off the moon i had once led his master into trouble when he fell on one of the topmost jags of a mountain and dislocated his arm now the turn of his humble companion was coming. The pitiful little wanderer just stood there in the wild, drenched and blinking, saying doggedly, Where thou goest, I will go. So at last I told him to come on if he must, and gave him a piece of the bread I had in my pocket. Then we struggled on together, and thus began the most memorable of all my wild days. The level flood, driving hard in our faces, thrashed and washed us wildly until we got into the shelter of a grove on the east side of the glacier, near the front, where we stopped a while for breath and to listen and look out. The exploration of the glacier was my main object, but the wind was too high to allow excursions over its open surface where one might be dangerously shoved while balancing for a jump on the brink of a crevice. In the meantime, the storm was a fine study. Here, the end of the glacier, descending an abrupt swell of resisting rock about 500 feet high, leans forward and falls in ice cascades. And as the storm came down the glacier from the north, Stikine and I were beneath the main current of the blast, while favorably located to see and hear it. What a psalm the storm was singing, and how fresh the smell of the washed earth and leaves, and how sweet the still small voices of the storm. Detached wafts and swirls were coming through the woods with music from the leaves and branches and furrowed boles, and even from the splintered rocks and ice crags overhead, many of the tones soft and low and flute-like, as if each leaf and tree crag and spire were a tuned reed. A broad torrent draining the side of the glacier, now swollen by scores and new streams from mountains, were rolling boulders along its rocky channel with thudding, bumping, muffled sounds, rushing toward the bay with tremendous energy, as if in haste to get out of the mountainside, the waters above and beneath calling to each other and all to the ocean, their home. Looking southward from our shelter, we had this great torrent and the forested mountain wall above it on our left, the spiry ice crags on our right, and smooth gray gloom ahead. I tried to draw the marvelous scene in my notebook, but the rain blurred the page in spite of all my pains to shelter it, and the sketch was almost worthless. When the wind began to abate, I tried the east side of the glacier. All the trees standing on the edge of the woods were barked and bruised, showing high ice mark in a very telling way, while tens of thousands of those that had stood for centuries on the bank of the glacier further out lay crushed and being crushed. In many places I could see down fifty feet or so beneath the margin of the glacier mill, where trunks from one or two feet in diameter were being ground to pulp against outstanding rock ribs and bosses of the bank. About three miles above the front of the glacier, I climbed to the surface of it by means of axe steps made easy for Stikine. As far as the eye could reach, the level or nearly level glacier stretched away indefinitely beneath the gray sky, a seemingly boundless prairie of ice. The rain continued and grew colder, which I did not mind, but a dim snowy look in the drooping clouds made me hesitate about venturing far from land. No trace of the west shore was visible, and in case the clouds should settle and give snow, or the wind again become violent, I feared getting caught in a tangle of crevices. 
Snow crystals, the flowers of the mountain clouds, are frail, beautiful things, but terrible when flying on storm winds in darkening, benumbing swarms, or when welded together into glaciers full of deadly crevices. Watching the weather, I sauntered about on the crystal sea. For a mile or two out, I found the ice remarkably safe. The marginal crevices were mostly narrow, while the few wider ones were easily avoided by passing around them, and the clouds began to open here and there. Thus encouraged, I at last pushed out for the other side, for nature can make us do anything she likes. At first we made rapid progress, and the sky was not very threatening. While I took bearings occasionally with the pocket compass to enable me to find my way back more surely in case the storm should become blinding, but the structure lines of the glacier were my main guide. Toward the west side, we came to a closely creviced section in which we had to make long, narrow tacks and doublings, tracing the edges of the tremendous traverse and longitudinal crevices, many of which were from 20 to 30 feet wide and perhaps a thousand feet deep. Beautiful and awful. In working a way through them, I was severely cautious, but Stikeen came on as unhesitating as the flying clouds. The widest crevice that I could jump, he would leap without so much as a halting to take a look at it. The weather was now making quit changes, scattering bits of dazzling brightness through the wintry gloom. At rare intervals, when the sun broke forth wholly free, the glacier was seen from shore to shore with a bright array of encompassing mountains, partly revealed, wearing the clouds as garments, while the prairie bloomed and sparkled with a rised light from myriads of washed crystals. Then, suddenly, all the glorious show would be darkened and blotted out. Stikine seemed to care for none of these things, bright or dark, nor for the crevices, wells, molens, or swift, flashing streams into which he might fall. The little adventurer was only about two years old, yet nothing seemed novel to him, nothing daunted him. He showed neither caution nor curiosity, wonder nor fear, but bravely trotted on as if glaciers were playgrounds. His stout muffled body seemed all one skipping muscle, and it was truly wonderful to see how swiftly and to all appearance heedlessly he flashed across nerve-trying chasms six or eight feet wide. His courage was so unwavering that it seemed to be due to dullness of perception, as if he were only blindly bold, and I kept warning him to be careful. For we had been close to companions on so many wilderness trips that I had formed the habit of talking to him as if he were a boy and understood every word. End of section 7. Recording by Mirabelle. Section 8 of the Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stikine Part 2 by John Moore. We gained the west shore in about three hours, the width of the glacier here being about seven miles. Then I pushed northward in order to see as far back as possible into the fountains of the Fairweather Mountains in case the clouds should rise. The walking was easy along the margin of the forest, which, of course, like that on the other side, had been invaded and crushed by the swollen, overflowing glacier. In an hour or so, after passing a massive headland, we came suddenly on a branch of the glacier, which, in the form of a magnificent ice cascade two miles wide, was pouring over the rim of the main basin in a westerly direction. Its surface, broken into wave-shaped blades and shattered blocks, suggesting the wildest updashing, heaving, plunging motion of a great river cataract. Tracing it down three or four miles, I found that it discharged into a lake, filling it with icebergs. I would gladly have followed the lake outlet to the tidewater, but the day was already far spent, and the threatening sky called for haste on the return trip to get off the ice before dark. I decided, therefore, to go no farther, and after taking a general view of the wonderful region, turned back, hoping to see it again under more favorable auspices. 
We made good speed up the canyon of the great ice torrent and out on the main glacier until we had left the west shore about two miles behind us. Here we got into a difficult network of crevices. The gathering clouds began to drop misty fringes, and soon the dreaded snow came flying thick and fast. I now began to feel anxious about finding a way in the blurring storm. Stikeen showed no trace of fear. He was still the same silent, able little hero. I noticed, however, that after the storm darkness came on, he came close up behind me. The snow urged us to make still greater haste, but at the same time hit our way. I pushed on as best I could, jumping innumerable crevices, and for every hundred rods or so of direct advance traveling a mile in doubling up and down in the turmoil of chasms and dislocated ice blocks. After an hour or two of this work, we came to a series of longitudinal crevices of appalling width and almost straight and regular in trend like immense furrows. These I traced with firm nerve, excited and strengthened by the danger, making wide jumps, poising cautiously on their dizzy edges, after cutting hollows for my feet before making the spring to avoid possible slipping or any uncertainty on the farther sides, where only one trial is granted. Exercise at once frightful and inspiring, sticking and followed seemingly without effort. Many a mile we thus traveled, mostly up and down, making but little real headway in crossing, running instead of walking most of the time, as the danger of being compelled to spend the night on the glacier became threatening. Sakin seemed able for anything. Doubtless, we could have weathered the storm for one night, dancing on the flat spot to keep from freezing, and I faced the threat without feeling anything like despair. But we were hungry and wet, and the wind from the mountains was still thick with snow and bitterly cold, so of course that night would have seemed a very long one. I could not see far enough through the blurring snow to judge in which general direction the least dangerous route lay, while the few dim, momentary glimpses I caught of mountains through rifts in the flying clouds were far from encouraging either as weather signs or as guides. I had simply to grope my way from crevice to crevice, holding a general direction by the ice structure, which was not to be seen everywhere and partly by the wind. Again and again I was put to my mettle, but Stikine followed easily, his nerve apparently growing more unflinching as the danger increased. So it always is with mountaineers when we hard beset. Running hard and jumping, holding every minute of the remaining daylight, poor as it was, Precious, we doggedly preserved and tried to hope that every difficult crevice we overcame would prove to be the last of its kind, but on the contrary, as we advanced, they became more deadly trying. At length, our way was barred by a very wide and straight crevice, which I traced rapidly northward a mile or so without finding a crossing or hope of one, then down the glacier, about as far to where it united with another uncrossable crevice. In all the distance of perhaps two miles, there was only one place where I could possibly jump it, but the width of this jump was the utmost I dared attempt, while the danger of slipping on the farther side was so great that I was loath to try it. Furthermore, the side I was on was about a foot higher than the other, and even with this advantage, the crevice seemed dangerously wide. One is liable to underestimate the width of crevices where the magnitudes in general are great. I therefore stared at this one mighty keenly estimating its width and the shape of the edge on the farther side until I thought that I could jump it if necessary, but that in case I should be compelled to jump back from the lower side, I might fail. Now, a cautious mountaineer seldom takes a step on unknown ground, which seems at all dangerous that he cannot retrace in case he should be stopped by unseen obstacles ahead. This is the rule of mountaineers who live long, and though in haste, I compelled myself to sit down and calmly deliberate before I broke it. Retracing my devious path in imagination as if it were drawn on a chart, I saw that I was recrossing the glacier a mile or two farther upstream than the course pursued in the morning, and that I was now entangled in a section I had not before seen. 
Should I risk this dangerous jump or try to regain the woods on the west shore, make a fire and have only hunger to endure while waiting for a new day? I had already crossed so broad a stretch of dangerous ice that I saw it would be difficult to get back to the woods through the storm before dark and the attempt would most likely result in a dismal night dance on the glacier while just beyond the present barrier the surface seemed more promising and the east shore was now perhaps about as near as the west. I was therefore eager to go on but this wide jump was a dreadful obstacle. At length, it became the dangers already behind me. I determined to venture against those that might be ahead, jumped, and landed well, but with so little spare that I more than ever dreaded being compelled to take that jump back from the lower side. Stickeen followed, making nothing of it, and we ran eagerly forward, hoping we were leaving all our troubles behind, but within the distance of a few hundred yards, we were stopped by the widest crevice yet encountered. Of course, I made haste to explore it, hoping all might yet be remediated by finding a bridge or a way around the other end. About three-fourths of a mile upstream, I found that it united with the one we had just crossed as I feared it would. Then, tracing it down, I found it joined the same crevice at the lower end also, maintaining throughout its whole course a width of 40 to 50 feet. Thus, my dismay, I discovered that we were on a narrow island about two miles long with two barely possible ways of escape, one back by the way we came, the other ahead by an almost inaccessible silver bridge that crossed the great crevice from near the middle of it. After this nerve-trying discovery, I ran back to the silver bridge and cautiously examined it. Crevices caused by strains from variations in the rate and motion of different parts of the glacier and convexities in the channel are mere cracks when they first open, so narrow as hardly to admit the blade of a pocket knife and gradually widen according to the extent of the strain and the depth of the glacier. Now some of those cracks are interrupted, like the cracks in wood, and in opening, the strip of ice between overlapping ends is dragged out and may maintain a continuous connection between the sides, just as the two sides of silvered crack in the wood that is being split are connected. Some crevices remain open for months or years, and by the melting of their sides continue to increase in width long after the opening strain has ceased. While the silver bridges, level on top at first and perfectly safe, are at length melted to thin vertical knife-edged blades, an upper portion being most exposed to the weather. And since the exposure is greatest in the middle, they at length curve downward like cables of suspension bridges. This one was evidently very old, for it had been weathered and wasted until it was the most dangerous and inaccessible that ever lay in my way. The width of the crevice was here about 50 feet, and the silver crossing diagonally was about 7 feet long. Its thin knife edge near the middle was depressed 25 or 30 feet below the level of the glacier, and the upcurving ends were attached to the sides 8 or 10 feet below the brink. Getting down the nearly vertical wall to the end of the silver and up the other side were the main difficulties, and they seemed all but insurmountable. Of the many perils encountered in my years of wandering on mountains and glaciers, none seemed so plain and stern and merciless as this. And it was presented when we were wet to the skin and hungry, the sky dark with quick driving snow and the night near, that we were forced to face it. It was a tremendous necessity. Beginning not immediately above the sunken edge of the bridge, but a little to one side, I cut a deep hollow on the break for my knees to rest in. Then, leaning over with my short-handled axe, I cut a step 16 or 18 inches below, which on account of the sheerness of the wall was necessarily shallow. That step, however, was well made. Its floor sloped slightly inward and formed a good hold for my heels. Then, slipping cautiously upon it, and crouching as low as possible with my left side toward the wall, I steadied myself against the wind with my left hand in a slight notch, while with the right I cut other similar steps and notches in succession, guarding against losing balance by glinting of the axe, 
or by wind gusts, for life and death were in every stroke and in the niceness of finish of every foothold. After the end of the bridge was reached, I chipped it down until I had made a level platform six or eight inches wide, and it was a trying thing to poise on this little slippery platform while bending over to get safely astride of the silver. Crossing was then comparatively easy by chipping off the sharp edge with short, careful strokes and hitching forward an inch or two at a time, keeping my balance with my knees pressed against the sides. The tremendous abyss on either hand I studiously ignored. To me, the edge of that blue silver was then all the world, but the most trying part of the adventure after working my way across inch by inch and chipping another small platform was to rise from the safe portion astride and to cut a stepladder in the nearly vertical face of the wall, chipping, climbing, holding on with feet and fingers in mere notches. At such times, one's whole body is I, and common skill and fortitude are replaced by power beyond our call or knowledge. Never before had I been so long under deadly strain. How I got up that cliff, I could never tell. The thing seemed to have been done by somebody else. I have never held death in contempt, though in the course of my explorations, I have oftentimes felt that to meet one's fate on a noble mountain or in the heart of a glacier would be blessed as compared with death from disease or from shabby lowland accident. But the best death, quick and crystal pure, set so glaringly open before us, is hard enough to face, even though we feel gratefully sure that we have already had happiness enough for a dozen lives. But poor Stikeen, the wee, hairy, sleekit, beastie thing of him, when I had decided to dare the bridge, and while I was on my knees chipping the hollow on the rounded brow above it, he came behind me, pushed his head past my shoulder, looked down and across, scanned the silver and its approaches with his mysterious eyes, then looked at me in the face with a startled air of surprise and concern, and began to mutter and whine, saying as plainly as if speaking with words, "'Surely you are not going into that awful place.'" This was the first time I had seen him gaze deliberately into the crevice or into my face with an eager speaking troubled look. That he should have recognized and appreciated the danger at the first glance showered wonderful sagacity. Never before had the daring midget seemed to know that the ice was slippery or that there was any such thing as danger anywhere. His looks and tones of voice when he began to complain and speak his fears were so human that I unconsciously talked to him in sympathy as I would to a frightened boy, and in trying to calm his fears, perhaps in some measure, moderated my own. Hush your fears, my boy, I said. We will get across safe, though it is not going to be easy. No right way is easy in the rough world. We must risk our lives to save them. At worst, we can only slip, and then how grand a grave we will have and by and by our nice bones will do good in the terminal moraine. But my sermon was far from reassuring to him. He began to cry, and after taking another piercing look at the tremendous gulf, ran away in desperate excitement, seeking some other crossing. By the time he got back, baffled, of course, I had made a step or two. I dared not look back, but he made himself heard, and when he saw that I was certainly bent on crossing, he cried aloud in despair. The danger was enough to daunt anybody, but it seems wonderful that he should have been able to weigh and appreciate it so justly. No mountaineer could have seen it more quickly or judged it more wisely, discriminating between real and apparent peril. When I gained the other side, he screamed louder than ever, and after running back and forth in vain search for a way of escape, he would return to the brink of the crevice above the bridge, moaning and wailing as if in the bitterness of death. Could this be the silent, philosophic Stikine? I shouted encouragement, telling him the bridge was not so bad as it looked, that I had left it flat and safe for his feet, and he could walk it easily, but he was afraid to try. Strange so small an animal should be capable of such big, wise fears. I called again and again in reassuring tone to come on and fear nothing, that he could come if he would only try. He would hush for a moment, look down again at the bridge, and shout his unshakable conviction that he could never, never come that way, 
then lie back in despair as if howling. Oh, what a place! No, I could never go down there! His natural composure and courage had vanished utterly in a tumultuous storm of fear. Had the danger been less, his distress would have seemed ridiculous, but in this dismal, merciless abyss lay the shadow of death, and his heart-trending cries might well have called heaven to his help. Perhaps they did. So hidden before, he was now transparent, and no one could see the workings of his heart and mind like the movements of a clock out of its case. His voice and gestures, hopes and fears, were so perfectly human that none could mistake them, while he seemed to understand every word of mine. I was troubled at the thought of having to leave him out all night and of the danger of not finding him in the morning. It seemed impossible to get him to venture— to compel him to try through fear of being abandoned, I started off as if leaving him to his fate and disappeared back of the hammock. But this did no good. He only lay down and moaned in utter hopeless misery. So after hiding a few minutes, I went back to the brink of the crevice and in a severe tone of voice shouted across to him that now I must certainly leave him. I would wait no longer and that if he would not come, all I could promise was that I would return to seek him the next day. I warned him that if he went back to the woods, the wolves would kill him, and finished by urging him once more by words and gestures to come on, come on. He knew very well what I meant, and at last, with the courage of despair, hushed and breathless, as he crouched down on the brink in the hollow I had made for my knees, pressed his body against the ice as if trying to get the advantage of the friction of every hair, gazed into the first step, put his little feet together and slid them slowly, slowly over the edge and down into it, bunching all four in it and almost standing on his head. Then, without lifting his feet as well as I could see through the snow, he slowly worked them over the edge of the step and down into the next and the next in succession in the same way and gained the end of the bridge. Then, lifting his feet with the regularity and slowness of the vibrations of a second's pendulum, as if counting and measuring the one, two, three, holding himself steady against the gusty wind and giving separate attention to each little step, he gained the foot of the cliff while I was on my knees, leaning over to give him a lift, should he succeed in getting within reach of my arm. Here he halted in dead silence, and it was here I feared he might fail, for dogs are poor climbers. I had no cord. If I had had one, I would have dropped a noose over his neck and hauled him up. But while I was thinking whether an available cord might be made out of clothing, he was looking keenly into the series of notched steps and finger holds I had made as if counting them and fixing the position of each one of them in his mind. Then suddenly up he came in a springy rush, hooking his paws into the steps and notches so quickly that I could not see how it was done and whizzed past my head safe at last. And now came a scene. Well done, well done, little boy, brave boy, I cried, trying to catch and caress him, but he would not be caught. Never before or since have I seen anything like so passionate a revulsion from the depths of despair to exultant, triumphant, uncontrollable joy. He flashed and darted hither and thither, as if fairly demented, screaming and shouting, swirling round and round in giddy loops and circles, like a leaf in the whirlwind, lying down and rolling over and over, sidewise and heels overhead, and pouring forth a tumultuous flood of hysterical cries and sobs and gasping mutterings. When I ran up to him to shake him, fearing he might die of joy, he flashed off two or three hundred yards, his feet in a mist of motion, then turning suddenly came back in a wild rush and launched himself at my face, almost knocking me down all the time screeching and screaming and shouting as if saying, saved, saved, saved. Then away again, dropping suddenly at times with his feet in the air, trembling and fairly sobbing. Such passionate emotion was enough to kill him. Moses' stately song of triumph after escaping the Egyptians and the Red Sea was nothing to it. Who could have guessed the capacity of the dull, endearing little fellow for all the most stirs, of this mortal frame. 
Nobody could have helped crying with him. But there was nothing like work for toning down excessive fear or joy. So I ran ahead, calling him in a gruff of voice, as I could command him to come on and stop his nonsense, for we had far to go and it would soon be dark. Neither of us feared another trial like this. Heaven would surely count one enough for a lifetime. The ice ahead was gashed by thousands of crevices, but there were common ones. The joy of deliverance burned in us like fire, and we ran without fatigue, every muscle with immense rebound, glorying in its strength. Stikine flew across everything in his way, and not till dark did he settle into his normal fox-like trot. At last, the cloudy mountains came into sight, and we soon felt the solid rock beneath our feet and were safe. Then came weakness. Danger had vanished, and so had our strength. We trotted down the lateral moraine in the dark, over boulders and tree trunks, through the bushes and devil club thickets of the grove where we had sheltered ourselves in the morning, and across the level mud slope of the terminal moraine. We reached camp about 10 o'clock and found a big fire and a big supper. A party of Huna Indians had visited Mr. Young, bringing a gift of porpoise meat and wild strawberries, and Hunter Joe had brought in it a wild goat. But we lay down, too tired to eat much, and soon fell into a troubled sleep. The man who said, the harder the toil, the sweeter the rest, never was profoundly tired. Dakeen kept springing up and muttering in his sleep, no doubt dreaming that he was still on the brink of the crevice, and so did I, that night and many others long afterward, when I was overtired. Thereafter, Stikine was a changed dog. During the rest of the trip, instead of holding aloof, he always lay by my side and would hardly accept a morsel of food, however tempting, from any hand but mine. At night, when all was quiet about the campfire, he would come up to me and rest his head on my knee with a look of devotion as if I were his God. And often, as he caught my eye, he seemed to be trying to say, wasn't that an awful time we had together on the glacier? Nothing in after years had dimmed that Alaska storm day. As I write, it all comes rushing and roaring to mind, as if I were again in the heart of it. Again, I see the gray flying clouds with the rain floods and snow, the ice cliffs towering above the shrinking forest, the majestic ice cascade, the vast glacier outspread before its white mountain fountains, and in the heart of the tremendous crevice, emblem of the valley of the shadow of death, low clouds trailing over it, the snow falling into it, and on its brink I see little Stikine, and I hear his cries for help and his shouts of joy. I have known many dogs and many a story I could tell of their wisdom and devotion, but to none do I owe so much as to Stikine. At first, the least promising and least known of my dog friends, he suddenly became the best known of them all. Our storm battle for life brought him to light, and through him, as through a window, I have ever seen Ben looking with deeper sympathy into all my fellow mortals. None of Stikine's friends knows what finally became of him. After my work for the season, I was done. I departed for California, and I never saw the dear little fellow again. In reply to anxious inquiries, his master wrote me that in the summer of 1883, he was stolen by a tourist at Fort Wrangell and taken away on a steamer. His fate is wrapped in mystery. Doubtless he has left this world, crossed the last crevice, and gone to another. But he will not be forgotten. To me, Stikine is immortal. End of section 8. Recording by Mirabelle. Section 9 of The Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Roxanne Hugenberger on the Aran Islands. Bet Gellert, or The Grave of the Greyhound, by Robert Spencer. The spearmen heard the bugle sound, and cheerily smiled the morn, and many a branch and many a hound obeyed Llewellyn's horn. And still he blew a louder blast, and gave a lustier cheer, 
Come, Gellert, come, wert never last, Llewellyn's horn to hear. Oh, where does faithful Gellert roam, the flower of all his race? So true, so brave, a lamb at home, a lion in the chase. T'was only at Llewellyn's board the faithful Gellert fed. He watched, he served, he cheered his lord, and sentineled his bed. In sooth he was a peerless hound, the gift of royal John. But now no Gellert could be found, and all the chase rode on. And now, as o'er the rocks and dells, the gallant chidings rise, all Snowdon's craggy chaos yells, the many mingled cries. That day Llewellyn's little loved, the chase of heart and hair, and scant and small the booty proved, for Gellert was not there. Unpleased Llewellyn's homeward hide, when near the portal seat, his truant Gellert he espied, bounding his lord to greet. But when he gained his castle door, aghast the chieftain stood. The hound all o'er was smeared with gore, his lips, his fangs ran blood. Llewellyn's gaze with fierce surprise, unused such looks to meet. His favourite checked his joyful guise, and crouched and licked his feet. Onward in haste Llewellyn passed, and on went Gellert too, and still where'er his eyes he cast, fresh blood guts shocked his view. O'erturned his infant's bed he found, with blood-stained covered rent, and all around the walls and ground, with recent blood besprent. He called his child, no voice replied, he searched with terror wild, blood, blood he found on every side, but nowhere found his child. Hellhound, my child's by thee devoured, the frantic father cried, and to the hilt his vengeful sword he plunged in Gellert's side. His suppliant looks, as prone he fell, no pity could impart, but still his Gellert's dying yell passed heavy o'er his heart. Aroused by Gellert's dying yell, some slumberer wakened nigh. What words the parent's joy could tell to hear his infant's cry? Concealed beneath a tumbled heap, his hurried search had missed. All glowing from his rosy sleep, the cherub boy he kissed. Nor scathe he, nor harm, nor dread, but the same couch beneath lay a gaunt wolf, all torn and dead, tremendous still in death. Ah, what was then Llewellyn's pain, for now the truth was clear, his gallant hound, the wolf had slain, to save Llewellyn's heir. Vain, vain was all Llewellyn's woe, best of thy kind adieu, the frantic blow which laid thee low, his heart shall ever rue. And now a gallant tomb they raise, with costly sculpture decked, and marbles storied with his praise, poor Gellert's bones protect. There never could the spearman passed, or forester unmoved. There oft the tear besprinkled grass, Llewellyn's sorrow proved. And there he hung his horn and spear, and there as evening fell, in fancy's ear he oft would hear poor Gellert's dying yell. And till great Snowdon's rocks grow old, and cease the storm to brave, the consecrated spot shall hold the name of Gellert's grave. End of section 9section 10 of the good dog book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by amb sweet 13 scally the story of a perfect gentleman part 1 by ian hay division 1 better see trim right miss my wife, who has been married long enough to feel deeply gratified at being mistaken for a maiden lady, smiled seraphically at the conductor, and allowed herself to be hoisted up the steps of the majestic vehicle provided by a paternal county council to convey passengers, at a loss to the ratepayers, I understand, from the embankment to Battersea. Presently, 
we ground our way round a curve and begin to cross westminster bridge the conductor whose innate cockney bonhomie his high official position had failed to eradicate presented himself before us and collected our fares what part of better sea did you require sir he asked of me i coughed and answered evasively ah <coughs> uh, about the middle we haven't been there before added my wife quite gratuitously the conductor smiled indulgently and punched our tickets i'll tell you when to get down he said and left us for some months we had been considering the question of buying a dog and a good deal of our spare time or perhaps i should say of my spare time for a woman's time is naturally all her own had been pleasantly occupied in discussing the matter having at length committed ourselves to the purchase of the animal we proceeded to consider such details as breed sex and age my wife vacillated between a bloodhound because bloodhounds are so aristocratic in appearance and a pekingese because they are dernier cri we like to be dernier cri even in much more ham her younger sister aline who spends a good deal of time with us having no parents of her own suggested an old english sheepdog explaining that it would be company for my wife when i was away from home i coldly recommended a mastiff our son john aged three on being consulted expressed a preference for twelve tigers in a box and was not again invited to participate in the debate finally we decided on an alberdeen terrier of an age and sex to be settled by circumstances and i was instructed to communicate with a gentleman in the north who advertised in our morning paper that aberdeen terriers were his specialty in due course we received a reply the advertiser recommended two animals namely celtic chief aged four months and scotia's pride aged one year pedigrees were enclosed each about as complicated as the family tree of the house of hasburg and the favour of an early reply was requested as both dogs were being hotly bid for by an anonymous client in constantinople the price of celtic chief was twenty guineas that of scotia's pride for reasons heavily underlined in the pedigree was twenty-seven the advertiser who resided in aberdeen added that these prices did not cover cost of carriage we decided not to stand in the way of the gentleman in constantinople and having sent back the pedigree by return of post resumed the debate finally stella my wife said we don't really want a dog with a pedigree we only want something that will bark at beggars and be gentle with baby why not go to the home for lost dogs at battersea i believe you can get any dog you like there for five shillings we will run up to town next wednesday and see about it and i might get some clothes as well hence our presence on the tram presently the conductor who had kindly pointed out to us such objects of local interest as the river thames and the houses of parliament stopped the tram in a crowded thoroughfare and announced that we were in battersea a light here he announced facetiously for home for lost dogs guiltily realizing that there is many a true word spoken in jest we obeyed him and the tram went rocking and whizzing out of sight we had eschewed a cab when you are only going to pay five shillings for a dog my wife had pointed out with convincing logic it is silly to go and pay perhaps another five shillings for our cab it doubles the price of the dog at once if we had been buying an expensive dog we might have taken a cab but not for a five shilling one now i inquired briskly how are we going to find this place haven't you any idea where it is no i have a sort of vague notion that it is on an island in the middle of the river called the isle of dogs or barking reach or something like that however i have no doubt hadn't we better ask someone suggested stella i demurred if there is one thing i dislike i said it is accosting total strangers and badgering them for information they don't possess not that that will prevent them from giving it if we start asking the way we shall find ourselves in putney or woolwich in no time yes dear said stella soothingly now i suggest 
My hand went to my pocket. No, darling, interposed my wife hastily. Not a map, please. It is a curious psychological fact that women have a constitutional aversion to maps and railroad timetables. They would rather consult a half-witted errand boy or a deaf railroad porter. Do not let us make a spectacle of ourselves in the public streets again. I have not yet forgotten the day when you tried to find the Crystal Palace. Besides, it will only blow away. Ask that dear little boy there. He is looking at us so wistfully. Yes, I admit it was criminal folly. A man who asks a London street boy to be so kind as to direct him to a home for lost dogs has only himself to thank for the consequence. The wistful little boy smiled up at us. He had a pinched face and large eyes. Lost dogs, home, sir? He said courteously. It's a good long way. Do you want to get there quick? Yes. Then if I were to you, sir, replied the infant, edging to the mouth of an alleyway, I should bite a policeman. And with an ear-splitting yell, he vanished. Ah! We walked on, hot-faced. Little wretch, said Stella. We simply asked for it, I rejoined. What are we going to do next? My question was answered in a most incredible fashion, for at this moment a man emerged from a shop on our right and set off down the street before us. He wore a species of uniform, and emblazoned on the front of his hat was the information that he was an official of the Battersea Home for Lost and Starving Dogs. Wait a minute, and I will ask him, I said, starting forward. But my wife would not hear of it. Certainly not, she replied. If we ask him, he will simply offer to show us the way. Then we will have to talk to him. About hydrophobia and lethal chambers and distemper. And it may be for miles. I simply couldn't bear it. We shall have to tip him, too. Let us follow him quietly. To those who have never attempted to track a fellow creature surreptitiously through the streets of London on a hot day, the feat may appear simple. It is in reality a most exhausting dilatory and humiliating exercise our difficulty lay not so much in keeping our friend in sight as in avoiding frequent and unexpected collisions with him the general idea as they say on field days was to keep about twenty yards behind him but under certain circumstances distance has an uncanny habit of annihilating itself the man himself was no hustler once or twice he stopped to light his pipe or converse with a friend during these interludes, Stella and I loafed guiltily on the pavement, pointing out to one another objects of local interest, with the fascist officiousness of people in the foreground of hotel advertisements. Occasionally, he paused to contemplate the contents of a shop window. We gazed industriously into the window next door. Our first window, I recollect, was an undertaker's, with ready printed expressions of grief for sale on white porcelain discs. We had time to read them all. The next was a butcher's. Here we stayed perforce, so long that the proprietor, who was of the tribe that disposes of its wares almost entirely by personal canvas, came out into the street and endeavored to sell us a bullock's heart. Our quarry's next proceeding was to dive into a public house. We turned and surveyed one another. What are we to do now? inquired my wife. Go inside, too. I replied with more enthusiasm than I had hitherto displayed. At least I think I ought to. You can please yourself. I will not be left in the street, said Stella firmly. We must just wait here together until he comes out. There may be another exit, I objected. We had better go in. I shall take something, just to keep up appearances. And you must sit down in the ladies' bar, or the snug, or whatever they call it. Certainly not, said Stella. We had arrived at this impasse when the man suddenly reappeared, wiping his mouth. Instantly and silently we fell in behind him. For the first time the man appeared to notice our presence. He regarded us curiously, with a faint gleam of recognition in his eyes, and then set off down the street at a good pace. We followed, panting. Once or twice he looked back over his shoulder, a little apprehensively, I thought, but we ploughed on. We ought to get there soon at this pace. I gasped. Hello? He's gone again. 
he turned down to the right said stella excitedly the lust of the chase was fairly on us now we swung eagerly round the corner into a quiet by-street our man was nowhere to be seen and the street was almost empty come on said stella he may have turned in somewhere we hurried down the street suddenly warned by a newly awakened and primitive instinct i looked back we had overrun our quarry he had just emerged from some hiding place and was heading back toward the main street looking fearfully over his shoulder once more we were in full cry for the next five minutes we practically ran all three of us the man was obviously frightened out of his wits and kept making frenzied and spasmodic spurts from which we surmised that he was getting to the end of his powers of endurance if only we could overtake him i said hauling my exhausted spouse along by the arm we could explain that he's gone again exclaimed stella she was right the man had turned another corner we followed him round hutfoot and found ourselves in a prim little cul-de-sac with villas on each side across the end of the street ran a high wall obviously screening a railroad track we've got him i exclaimed i felt as maltka must have felt when he closed the circle at sedan but where is the dog's home dear inquired stella the question was never answered for at this moment the man ran up the steps of the fourth villa on the left and slipped a latch-key into the lock the door closed behind him with a venomous snap and we were left alone in the street guideless and dogless a minute later the man appeared at the ground-floor window accompanied by a female of commanding appearance he pointed us out to her behind them we could dimly descry a white tablecloth a tea cosy and covered dishes the commanding female after a prolonged and withering glare plucked a hairpin from her head and ostentatiously proceeded to skewer together the starchy white curtains that framed the window privacy secured and the sanctity of the english home thus pointedly vindicated she and her husband disappeared into the murky background where they doubtless sat down to an excellent high tea exhausted and discomfited we drifted away i am going home said stella in a hollow voice and i think she added bitterly that it might have occurred to you to suggest that the creature might possibly be going from the dog's home and not to it i apologized it is the simplest plan really division two it was almost dark when the train arrived at our little country station we set out to walk home by the short cut across the golf course anyhow we have saved five shillings remarked stella we paid half a crown for that taxi which took us back to victoria station i reminded her do not argue tonight, darling responded my wife i simply cannot endure anything more plainly she was a little unstrung very considerately i selected another topic i think our best plan i said cheerfully would be to advertise for a dog i never wish to see a dog again replied stella i surveyed her with some concern and said gently i'm afraid you are tired dear no i'm not a little shaken perhaps nothing of that kind joe what is that stella's fingers bit deep into my biceps muscle causing me considerable pain we were passing a small sheet of water which guards the thirteenth green on the golf course it is a stagnant and unclean pool but we make rather a fuss of it we call it the pond and if you play a ball into it you send a blasphemous caddy in after it and count one stroke a young moon was struggling up over the trees dismally illuminating the scene on the slimy shores of the pond we beheld a small moving object a yard behind it was another object a little smaller moving at exactly the same pace one of the objects was emitting sounds of distress abandoning my quaking consort i advanced to the edge of the pond and leaned down to investigate the mystery the leading object proved to be a small wet shivering whimpering puppy the satellite was a brick the two were connected by a string the puppy had just emerged from the depths of the pond towing the brick behind it what is it dear repeated stella fearfully your dog i replied and cut the string division three we spent three days deciding on a name for him stella suggested tiny on account of his size i pointed out that time might stellify this selection of a title i don't think so said aline supporting her sister that kind of dog does not grow very big what kind of dog is he i inquired swiftly aline said no more 
There are problems that even girls of twenty cannot solve. A warm bath had revealed to us the fact that the puppy was of a dingy yellow hue. I suggested that we call him Mustard. Our son John, on being consulted, against my advice, by his mother, addressed the animal as Pussy. Stella continued to favor Tiny. Finally, Aline, who was at the romantic age, produced a copy of Tennyson and suggested Escalabar, alleging in support of her preposterous proposition that it rose from out the bottom of the lake. The darling rose from out the bottom of the lake, too, just like the sword, Escalabar, she said, so I think it would make a lovely name for him. The little brute wadded out of a muddy pond towing a brick, I replied. I see no parallel. He was not the product of the pond. Someone must have thrown him in, and he came out. That is just what someone must have done with the sword, retorted Aline. So we'll call you Escalabar, won't we, darling little Scally? She embraced the puppy warmly, and the unsuspecting animal replied by frantically licking her face. However, the name stuck, with variations. When the puppy was big enough, he was presented with a collar, engraved with the name Escalabar, together with my name and address. Among ourselves, we usually addressed him as Scally. The children in the village called him the Scallywag. His time during his first year in our household was fully occupied in growing up. Stella declared that if one could have persuaded him to stand still for five minutes, it would have been actually possible to see him grow. He grew at the rate of about an inch a week for the best part of a year. When he had finished, he looked like nothing on earth. At one time, we cherished a brief but illusionary hope that he was going to turn into some sort of an imitation of a St. Bernard, but the symptoms rapidly passed off, and his final and permanent aspect was that of a rather badly stuffed lion. Like most overgrown creatures, he was top-heavy and lethargic and very humble-minded. Still, there was a kind of respectful pertinacity about him. It requires some strength of character, for instance, to wade along the bottom of a pond to dry land, accompanied by a brick as big as yourself. It was quite impossible, too, short of locking him up, to prevent him from accompanying us when we took our walks abroad, if he had made up his mind to do so. The first time this happened... I was going to shoot with my neighbors, the Hoods. It was only a mile to the first covert, and I set off after breakfast to walk. I was hardly out on the road when a scalaver was beside me, ambling uncertainly on his weedy legs and smiling up into my face with an air of imbecile affection. You have many qualities, old friend, I said, but I don't think you are a sporting dog. Go home. A scalaver sat down on the road with a dejected air. Then, having given me fifty yards start, he rose and crawled sheepishly after me. I stopped, called him up, pointed him with some difficulty in the required direction, gave him a resounding spank, and bade him be gone. He responded by collapsing like a camp bedstead, and I left him. Two minutes later, I looked round. A scalaver was ten yards behind me, propelling himself along on his stomach. This time, I thrashed him severely. After he began to howl, I let him go, and he lumbered away homeward, the picture of misery. In due course, I reached the crossroads, where I had arranged to meet the rest of the party. They had not arrived, but a scalaber had. He had made a detour and headed me off. Not certain which route I would take after reaching the crossroads, he was sitting very sensibly under the signpost awaiting my arrival. On seeing me, he immediately came forward, wagging his tail and placed himself at my feet in the position most convenient to me for inflicting chastisement. I wonder how many of our human friends would be willing to pay such a price for the pleasure of our company. As time went on, Escalibur filled out into one of the most terrifying spectacles I have ever beheld. In one respect, though, he lived up to his knightly name. His manners were of the most courtly description, and he had an affectionate greeting for all, beggars included. He was particularly fond of children. If he saw children in the distance, he would canter up and offer to play with them. If the children had not met him before, they would run, shrieking to their nurses. If they had, they would fall on Escalibur in a body and roll him over and pull him about. On wet afternoons in the nursery, my own family used to play a dentist with him, assigning to Escalibur the role of patient. Gas was administered with a bicycle pump and a shoehorn and button hook were employed in place of the ordinary instruments of torture, but Escalibur did not mind. He lay on his back on the hearth rug, 
with the principal dentist sitting astride his ribs as happy as a king he was particularly attracted by babies and being able by reason of his stature to look right down into perambulators he was accustomed whenever he met one of those vehicles to amble alongside and peer inquiringly into the face of its occupant most of the babies in the district got to know him in time but until they did we had a good deal of correspondence to attend on the subject escalabar's intellect may have been lofty but his memory was treacherous our household will never forget the day on which he was given the shoulder of mutton one morning after breakfast aline accompanied by escalabar intercepted the kitchen-maid hastening in the direction of the potting shed carrying the joint in question at arm's length the damsel explained that its premature maturity was due to the recent warm weather and that she was even now in search of the gardener's boy who would be commissioned to perform the duties of sexton it seems a waste miss observed the kitchen-maid but cook says it can't be ate no how now loud but respectable snuffings from escalabar moved a direct negative to the statement aline and the kitchen-maid who were both criminally weak when escalabar was concerned saw a way to gratify their economical instincts and their natural affection simultaneously the next moment escalabar was searching contentedly down the gravel path with a presentation shoulder of mutton in his mouth then joy day began escalabar took his prize into the middle of the tennis lawn it was a very large shoulder of mutton but escalabar finished it in ten minutes after that descended to his utmost limits he went to sleep in the sun with the bone between his paws occasionally he woke up and raising his head stared solemnly into space in the attitude of a trafalgar square lion the bone now lay white and gleaming on the grass beside him then he fell asleep again about four o'clock he roused himself and began to look for a suitable place of interment for the bone by four thirty the deed was done and he went to sleep once more at five he woke up and pandemonium began he could not remember where he had buried the bone he started systematically with the rose beds but met with no success after that he tried two or three shrubberies without avail and then embarked on a frantic but thorough excavation of the tennis lawn we were taking tea on the lawn at the time and our attention was first drawn to escalabar's bereavement by a temporary but unshakable conviction on his part that the bone was buried immediately underneath the tea-table as the tennis lawn was fast beginning to resemble a golf course we locked escalabar up in the wash-house where his hyena-like howls rent the air for the rest of the evening penetrating even to the dining-room this was particularly unfortunate because we were having a dinner party in honor of a neighbor who had recently come to the district no less a personage in fact than the new lord lieutenant of the county and his lady stella was naturally anxious that there should be no embarrassments on such an occasion and it distressed her to think that these people should imagine that we kept a private torture chamber on the premises however dinner passed off quite successfully and we adjourned to the drawing-room it was a chilly september evening and lady wickham was accommodated with a seat by the fire in a large armchair with a cushion at her back when the gentleman came in aline sang to us fortunately the drawing-room is out of range of the wash-house during aline's first song i sat by lady wickham her expression was one of patrician calm and well-bred repose but it seemed to me she was not looking quite comfortable i was not feeling quite comfortable myself the atmosphere seemed a trifle oppressive perhaps we had done wrong in having a fire after all lady wickham appeared to notice it too she sat very upright fanning herself mechanically and seemed disinclined to lean back in her chair after the song was finished i said i am afraid you are not comfortable lady wickham let me get you a larger cushion thank you said lady wickham the cushion i have is delightfully comfortable but i think there is something hard behind it apologetically i plucked away the cushion lady wickham was right there was something behind it it was a scalabar's bone end of section ten section eleven of the good dog book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Anne b sweet thirteen scally the story of a perfect gentleman part two by ian hay division four 
a walk along the village street was always a great event for escalabar still it must have contained many humiliating moments for one of his sensitive disposition for he was always pathetically anxious to make friends with other dogs but was rarely successful little dogs merely bit his legs and big dogs cut him dead i think this was why he usually commenced his morning round by calling on a rabbit the rabbit lived in a hutch in a yard at the end of a passage between two cottages the first turning on the right after you entered the village and escalibur always dived down this at the earliest opportunity it was no use for aline who usually took him out on these occasions to endeavour to hold him back either escalibur called on the rabbit by himself or aline went with him there was no other alternative arrived at the hutch escalibur wagged his tail and contemplated the rabbit with his usual air of vacuous benevolence the rabbit made not the faintest response but continued to munch green feed twitching its nose in a superior manner finally when it could endure escalibur's admiring inspection and hard breathing no longer it turned its back and retired into its bedroom escalibur's next call was usually at the butcher's shop where he was presented with a specially selected and quite unsaluable fragment of meat he then crossed the road to the baker's where he purchased a halfpenny bun for which his escort was expected to pay after that he walked from shop to shop wherever he was taken with great docility and enjoyment for he was a gregarious animal and had a friend behind or underneath almost every counter in the village men women babies kittens even ducks they were all one to him at one time aline had endeavoured to teach him a few simple accomplishments such as begging for food dying for his country and carrying parcels she was unsuccessful in all three instances escalibur on his hind legs stood about five feet six and when he fell from that eminence as he invariably did when he tried to beg he usually broke something he was hampered too by inability to distinguish one order from another more than once he narrowly escaped with his life through mistaking an urgent appeal to come to heel out of the way of an approaching automobile for a command to die for his country in the middle of the road as for educating him to carry parcels a single attempt was sufficient the parcel in question contained a miscellaneous assortment of articles from the grocers including lard soap and safety matches it was securely tied up and the grocer kindly attached it by a short length of string to a wooden clothespin in order to make it easier for escalibar to carry they set off home escalibar was most apologetic about it afterward besides being extremely unwell but he had no idea he explained to aline that anything put into his mouth was not meant to be eaten he then tendered the clothespin and some mangled brown paper with an air of profound abasement after that no further attempts at compulsory education were undertaken it was his daily walk with aline however which introduced the scalibur to life life in its broadest and most romantic sense as i was not privileged to be present at the opening incident of this episode or at most of its subsequent developments the direct conduct of this narrative here passes out of my hands one sunny morning in july a young man in clerical attire sat breakfasting in his rooms at mrs tice's mrs tice's establishment was situated on the village street and mrs tice was in the habit of letting her ground floor to lodgers of impeccable respectability it was half past eleven which is a late hour for the clergy to breakfast but this young man appeared to be suffering from no qualms of conscience on the subject he was making an excellent breakfast and reading the henley results with a mixture of rapture and longing he had just removed the sportsman from the convenient buttress of the teapot and substituted punch when he became aware that day had turned to night looking up he perceived that his open window which was rather small and of the casement variety was completely blocked by a huge shapeless and opaque mass next moment the mass revolved itself into an animal of enormous size and surprising appearance which fell heavily into the room and like a stream that spreading from a cliff fails in mid-air but gathering at the base remakes itself rose to its feet and advancing to the table 
laid a heavy head on the white cloth and lovingly passed its tongue which resembled that of a great ant-eater round a cold chicken conveniently adjacent five minutes later the window framed another picture this time a girl of twenty white clad and wearing a powder blue felt hat caught up on one side by a silver buckle which twinkled in the hot morning sun the curate started to his feet a scalaver who was now laying on the hearth rug dismembering the chicken thumped his tail guiltily on the floor but made no attempt to rise i am very sorry said aline but i am afraid my dog is trespassing may i call him out certainly said the curate but he racked his brains to devise some means of delaying the departure of this radiant fragrant vision he is not the least in the way i am very glad of his company it was most neighborly of him to call after all i suppose he is one of my parishioners and and he blushed i hope you are too aline gave him her most entrancing smile and from that hour the curate ceased to be his own master i suppose you are mr gilmore said aline yes i have been here only three weeks and i have not met everyone yet i have been away for two months aline mentioned i thought you must have been said the curate rather subtly for him i think my brother-in-law called on you a few days ago continued aline on whom the curate's last remark had been made a most favorable impression she mentioned my name i was going to return the call this very afternoon said the curate and he firmly believed that he was speaking the truth won't you come in we have an excellent chaperone indicating a scalabar i will come and open the door well he certainly won't come out unless i come and fetch him admitted aline thoughtfully a moment later the curate was at the front door and led his visitor across the little hall into the sitting-room he had not been absent more than thirty seconds but during that time a plateful of sausages had mysteriously disappeared and as they entered escalabar was apologetically settling down on the hearth-rug with a cottage loaf between his paws aline uttered cries of dismay and apology but the curate would have none of them my fault entirely he insisted i have no right to be breakfasting at this hour but this is my day off you see i take early service every morning at seven but on wednesdays we cut it out omit it and have full matins at ten so i get up at half past nine take service at ten and come back to my rooms at eleven and have breakfast it is my weekly treat you deserve it said aline feelingly her religious exercises were limited to going to church on sunday morning and coming out if possible after the litany and how do you like much more ham i did not like it at all when i came said the curate but recently i have begun to enjoy myself immensely he did not say how recently were you in london before yes in the east end it was pretty hard work but a useful experience i feel rather lost here during my spare time i get so little exercise in london i used to slip away for an occasional outing in a leander scratch eight and that kept me fit i am inclined he added ruefully to put on flesh leander are you a blue the curate nodded you know about rowing i see he said appreciatively the worst of rowing he continued is that it takes up so much of a man's time that he has no opportunity of practicing anything else cricket for instance all curates ought to be able to play cricket i do my best but there isn't a single boy in the sunday school who can't bowl me it's humiliating do you play tennis at all asked aline yes in a way i am sure my sister will be pleased if you come and have a game with us some afternoon the enraptured curate had already opened his mouth to accept this demure invitation when a scalabar rising from the hearth-rug stretched himself luxuriously and wagged his tail thereby removing three pipes an inkstand a tobacco jar and a half-completed sermon from the writing-table division five escalibur was heavily overworked in his new role of chaperone during the next three or four weeks and any dog less ready to oblige than himself might have felt a little aggrieved at the treatment to which he was subjected there was the case of the tennis lawn for instance he had always regarded this as his own particular sanctuary dedicated to reflection and repose but now the net was stretched across it 
and Aline and the curate performed antics all over the court, with rackets and small white balls, which, though they did not hurt Escalibur, kept him awake. It did not occur to him to convey himself elsewhere, for his mind moved slowly, and the united blandishments of the players failed to bring the desirability of such a course home to him. He continued to lie in his favorite spot on the sunny side of the court, looking injured but forgiving or slumbering perseveringly amid the storm that raged round him. It was quite impossible to move Escalibur once he had decided to remain where he was, so Aline and the curate agreed to regard him as a sort of artificial excrescence, like the buttress in a fives court. If the ball hit him, as it frequently did, the player waiting for it was at liberty to either play it or claim a let. This arrangement added a piquant and pleasing variety to what is too often, especially when indulged in by mediocre players, a very dull game. Worse was to follow, however. One day, Aline and the curate conducted Escalibar to a neighboring mountain range, at least so it appeared to Escalibar, and played another ball game. This time they employed long sticks with iron heads, and two balls, which, though they were much smaller than tennis balls, were incredibly hard and painful. Escalibur, though willing to help and anxious to please, could not supervise both the balls at once. As sure as he ran to retrieve one, the other came after him and took him unfairly in the rear. Escalibur was the gentlest of creatures, but the most perfect gentleman had his dignity to consider. After being struck for the third time by one of these balls, he whipped around, picked it up in his mouth, and gave it a tiny pinch, just as a warning. At least he thought it was a tiny pinch. The ball retaliated with unexpected ferocity. It twisted and turned. It emitted long, snaky spirals of some elastic substance, which clogged his teeth and tickled his throat and wound themselves round his tongue and nearly choked him. Panic-stricken, he ran to his mistress who, with weeping and with laughter, removed the writhing horror from his jaws and comforted him with fair words. After that, Escalibur realized that it is wiser to walk behind golfers than in front of them. It was a boring business, though, and very exhausting, for he loathed exercise of every kind, and his only periods of repose were the occasions on which the expedition came to a halt on certain small, flat lawns each of which contained a hole with a flag in it. Here, Escalibar would lie down, with the contented sigh of a tired child, and go to sleep. As he almost invariably lay down between the hole and the ball, the players agreed to regard him as a bunker. Aline putted round him, but the curate, who had little regard for the humbler works of creation, Escalibar thought, used to take his mashie and attempt a lofting shot, an enterprise in which he almost invariably failed to Escalibar's great inconvenience. Country walks were more tolerable for Aline's supervision of his movements, which was usually marked by an officious severity, was sensibly relaxed on these days, and Escalibar found himself at liberty to range abroad, amid the heath and through the copiuses, engaged in a pastime that he imagined was hunting. One hot afternoon, wandering into a clearing, he encountered a hare. The hare, which was suffering from extreme panic, owing to a terrifying noise behind it, the blast of the newest and most vulgar motor horn, to be precise, was bolting right across the clearing. After the manner of hares where objects directly in front of them are concerned, the fugitive entirely failed to perceive Escalibar, and indeed ran right underneath him on its way to cover. Escalibar was so unstrung by this adventure that he ran back to where he had left Aline and the curate. They were sitting side by side on the grass, and the curate was holding Aline's hand. Escalibar advanced on them thankfully, and indicated by an ingratiating smile that a friendly remark or other recognition of his presence would be gratefully received, but neither took the slightest notice of him. They continued to gaze straight before them in a mournful and abstracted fashion. They looked not so much at Escalibar as through him. First the hare, then Aline and the curate, Escalibur began to fear that he had become invisible, or at least transparent. Greatly agitated, he drifted away into a neighboring plantation full of young pheasants. Here he encountered a keeper, 
who was able to dissipate his gloomy suspicions for him without any difficulty whatsoever. But Aline and the curate sat on. A hundred pounds a year, repeated the curate. A past degree and no influence? I can't preach and I have no money of my own. Dearest, I ought never to have told you. Told me what? inquired Aline softly. She knew quite well, but she was a woman, and woman can never leave well enough alone. The curate, turning to Aline, delivered himself of a statement of three words. Aline's reply was a softly whispered, To quoi? It had to happen, dear, she added cheerfully, for she did not share the curate's burden of responsibility in the matter. If you had not told me, we should have been miserable separately. Now that you have told me, we can be miserable together. And when two people who, who, she hesitated. The curate supplied the relative sentence. Aline nodded her head in acknowledgment. Yes, who are, like you and me, miserable together. They are happy, see? I see, said the curate gravely. Yes, you were right there. But we can't go on living on a diet of joint misery. We shall have to face the future. What are we going to do about it? Then Aline spoke up boldly for the first time. Gerald, she said, we shall simply have to manage on a hundred a year. But the curate shook his head. Dearest, I should be an utter cad if I allowed you to do such a thing, he said. A hundred a year is less than two pounds a week. A lot of people live on less than two pounds a week, Aline pointed out longingly. Yes, I know. If we could rent a three-shilling cottage, and I could go about with a spotted handkerchief round my neck, and you could scrub the doorsteps, Coram Popolo, we might be very comfortable. But the clergy belong to the black-coated class, and people in the lower ranks of the black-coated class are the poorest people in the whole wide world. They have to spend money on luxuries, collars and charwomen, and so on, which a working man can spend entirely on necessities. It wouldn't merely mean no pretty dresses and a lot of hard work for you, Aline. It would mean starvation. Believe me, I know. Some of my friends have tried it, and I know. What happened to them? asked Aline fearfully. They all had to come down in the end, some soon, some late, but all in time, to taking parish relief. Parish relief? Yes, not official regulation, rate-aided charity, but the infinitely more humiliating charity of their well-to-do neighbors. Quiet checks, second-hand dresses, and things like that. No, little girl, you and I are too proud, too proud of the cloth for that. We will never give a handle to the people who are always waiting to have a fling at the improvident clergy. Not if it breaks our hearts, we won't. You are quite right, dear, said Aline quietly. We must wait. Then the curate said the most difficult thing he had said yet. I shall have to go away from here. Aline's hand turned cold in his. Why? she whispered, but she knew. Because if we wait here, we shall wait forever. The last curate and much more ham. What happened to him? He died. Yes, at fifty-five. And he had been here for thirty years. Preferment does not come in sleepy villages. I must go back to London. The East End? East or South or North? It doesn't signify. Anywhere but West. In the East and South and North, there is always work to be done hard work, and if a parson has no money and no brains and no influence and can only work, run clothing clubs and soup kitchens and reclaim drunkards, London is the place for him. So off I go to London, my beloved, to lay the foundations of paradise for you and me, for you and me. There was a long silence. Then the pair rose to their feet and smiled on each other extremely cheerfully, because each suspected the other brightly of low spirits. Shall we tell people? asked the curate. Aline thought and shook her head. No, she said, nice or not, it will make a splendid secret. Just between us two, eh? said the curate, kindling at the thought. Just between us two, agreed Aline, and the curate kissed her very solemnly. A secret is a comfortable thing to lovers, especially when they are young and about to be lonely. At this moment, a leonine head, supported on a lumbering and ill-balanced body, was thrust in between them. It was a scalabar, taking sanctuary with the church from the vengeance of the law. We might tell Scally, I think, said Aline. Rather, 
assented the curate. He introduced us. So Aline communicated the great news to Escalabar. You do approve, dear, don't you? she said. Escalabar, instinctively realizing that this was an occasion where liberties might be taken, stood up on his hind legs and placed his forepaws on his mistress's shoulders. The curate supported them both. And you will use your influence to get us a living wage from somewhere, won't you, old man? asked the curate. Escalabar tried to lick both their faces at once and succeeded. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by AMB Suite 13. Scally, The Story of a Perfect Gentleman, Part 3, by Ian Hay. Division 6. So the curate went away but not to London. He was sent instead to a great manufacturing town in the north, where the work was equally hard, and where Anglican and Roman and Salvationist fought grimly side by side against the powers of drink and disease and crime. During these days, which ultimately rolled into years, the curate lost his boyish freshness and his unfortunate tendency to put on flesh. He grew thin and lathy, and though his smile was as ready and as majestic as ever, he seldom laughed. He never failed, however, to write a cheerful letter to Aline every Monday morning. He was getting a hundred and twenty pounds a year now, so his chances of becoming a millionaire had increased by twenty per cent. Meantime, his two confederates, Escalabar and Aline, continued to reside at much more ham. Aline was still the recognized beauty of the district, but she spread her net less promiscuously than of yore. Girlfriend she always had in plenty, but it was noticed that she avoided intimacy with all eligible males of over twenty and under forty-five years of age. No one knew the reason for this, except Escalabar. Aline used to read Gerald's letters aloud to him every Tuesday morning. Sometimes the letter contained a friendly message to Escalabar himself. In acknowledgment of this courtesy, Escalabar always sent his love to the curate. Aline wrote every Friday, and he and Aline walked together, rain or shine, on Friday afternoon to post the letter in the next village. Much more Ham's post office was too small to remain oblivious to such a regular correspondence. The curate was seen no more in his old parish. Railroad journeys are costly things, and curate's holidays rare. Besides, he had no overt excuse for coming. And so life went on for five years. The curate and Aline may have met during that period, for Aline sometimes went away visiting. As Escalabar was not privileged to accompany her on these occasions, he had no means of checking her movements. But the chances are that she never saw the curate, or I think she would have told Escalabar about it. We simply have to tell someone. Then, quite suddenly, came a tremendous change in Escalabar's life. Aline's brother-in-law, he was Escalabar's master no longer. For Escalabar had been transferred to Aline by deed of gift, at her own request, on her first birthday after the curate's departure, fell ill. There was an operation and a crisis, and a deal of unhappiness and much more ham. Then came convalescence, followed by directions for a sea voyage of six months. It was arranged that the house should be shut up and the children sent to their grandmother at Bath. That settles everything and everybody, said the gaunt man on the sofa, except you, Aline. What about you? What about Scally? inquired Aline. Her brother-in-law apologetically admitted that he had forgotten Scally. Not quite myself at present, he mentioned in extenuation. I'm going to Aunt Phoebe, announced Aline. You are never going to introduce Scally into Aunt Phoebe's establishment, 
cried Aline's sister. No, said Aline, I am not. She rubbed Escalibur's matted head affectionately. But I have arranged for the dear man's future. He is going to visit friends in the north. Aren't you, darling? Escalibur, to whom this arrangement had been privately communicated some days before, wagged his tail and endeavored to look as intelligent and knowing as possible. He was not going to put his beloved mistress to shame by admitting to her relatives that he had not the faintest idea what she was talking about. However, he was soon to understand. The next day, Aline took him up to London by train. This in itself was a tremendous adventure, though alarming at first. He traveled in the guard's van, it having been found quite impossible to get him into an ordinary compartment, or rather to get anyone else into the compartment after he lay down on the floor. So he traveled with the guard, chained to the vacuum brake, and shared that kindly official's dinner. When they reached the terminus, there was much bustle and confusion. The door of the van was thrown open, and porters dragged out the luggage, and submitted samples thereof to overheated passengers, who invariably failed to recognize their own property and claim someone else's. Finally, when the luggage was all cleared out, the guard took off his scalabar's chain and facetiously invited him to alight for London town. A scalabar, lumbering delicately across the ribbed floor of the van, arrived at the open doorway. Outside on the platform, he espied Aline. Beside her stood a tall figure in black. With one tremendous roar of rapturous recognition, Escalibur leaped straight out of the van and launched himself fairly and squarely at the curate's chest. Luckily, the curate saw him coming. He knows you all right, said Aline with satisfaction. He appears too replied the curate afraid i don't dance the tango scally old man but thanks for the invitation all the same escalibur spent the rest of the day in london where it must be admitted he caused a genuine sensation no mean feat in such a blasé place in bond street the traffic had to be held up both ways by benevolent policemen because escalibur feeling pleasantly tired lay down to rest when evening came, they all dined together in a cheap little restaurant in Soho, and were very gay, with the gaiety of people who were whistling to keep their courage up. After dinner, Aline said goodbye, first to Escalabar, and then to the curate. She was much more demonstrative toward the former than toward the latter, which is the way of woman. Then the curate put Aline into a taxi, and— Having, with the aid of the commissionaire, extracted a scalabar from underneath, he had gone there under some confused impression that it was the guard's van again, said goodbye for the last time, and Aline, smiling bravely, was whirled away out of sight. As the taxi turned a distant corner and disappeared from view, it suddenly occurred to a scalabar that he had been left behind. Accordingly, he set off in pursuit. The curate finally ran him to earth in Buckingham Palace Road, which is a long chase from Soho, where he was sitting on the pavement, to the grave inconvenience of the inhabitants of Plimico, and refusing to be comforted. It took his new master the better part of an hour to get him to Uston Road, where it was discovered they had missed the night mail to the north. Accordingly, they walked to a rival station and took another train. In all this, Escalabar was the instrument of destiny, as you shall hear. Division 7 The coroner's jury was inclined at the time to blame the single men, but the Board of Trade inquiry established the fact that the accident was due to the engine driver's neglect to keep a proper lookout. However, as the driver was dead and his firemen with him, the law very leniently took no further action in the matter. About three o'clock in the morning, as the train was crossing a bleak Yorkshire moor seven miles from Tetley Junction, 
the curate suddenly left the seat on which he lay stretched dreaming of aline and flew across the compartment on to the recumbent form of a stout commercial traveller then he rebounded to the floor and woke up unhurt tis an accident lad gasped the commercial traveller as he got his wind so it seems said the curate hold tight she's rockin the commercial traveller who was mechanically groping under the seat for his boots commercial travellers always remove their boots in third-class railroad compartments when on night journeys followed the curate's advice and braced himself with his feet against the opposite seat for the coming belurvisment after the first shock the train had gathered way again the light engine into which it had charged had been thrown clear off the track but only for a moment suddenly the reeling engine of the express left the rails and staggered drunkenly along the ballast a moment later it turned over taking the guard's van and the first four coaches with it and the whole train came to a standstill it was a corridor train and unfortunately for gerald gilmore and the commercial traveller their coach fell over corridor side downward there was no door on the other side of the compartment only three windows crossed by a stout brass bar the windows had suddenly become skylights they fought their way out at last once he got the window open the curate experienced little difficulty in getting through but the commercial traveller was corpulent and tenacious of his boots which he held persistently in one hand while gerald tugged at the other still he was hauled up at last and the two slid down with the perpendicular roof of the coach to the permanent way that's done anyway panted the drummer and sitting down he began to put on his boots there's plenty more to do said the curate grimly pulling off his coat the front of the train is on fire come he turned and ran Almost at his first step, he cannoned into a heavy body in rapid motion. It was a scalabar. That you, old friend? observed the curate. I was on my way to see about you. Now that you are out, you may as well come and bear a hand. The pair sprinted along the line toward the blazing coaches. It was dawn, grey, weeping, and cheerless, on Teetley Moor another engine had come up from behind to take what was left of the train back to the junction seven coaches including the lordly sleeping saloon stood intact for with the engine and tender lay where they had fallen a mass of charred wood and twisted metal a motor car belonging to a doctor stood in the roadway a hundred yards off and its owner with a brother of the craft who had been a passenger on the train was attending to the injured there were fourteen of these altogether mostly suffering from burns these were made as comfortable as possible in sleeping berths their owners had vacated take your seats please said the surviving guard in a subdued voice he spoke at the direction of a big man in a heavy overcoat who appeared to have taken charge of the salvage operations. The passengers clambered up into the train. Only one hesitated. He was a long, lean young man, black from head to foot with suit and oil. His left arm was badly burned, and seeing a doctor disengaged at last, he came forward to have it dressed. The big man in the heavy overcoat approached him my name is caversham he said i happen to be a director of the company if you will give me your name and address i will see to it that your services tonight are suitably recognized the way you got those two children out of the first coach was splendid if i may be allowed to say so we did not even know they were there the young man's teeth suddenly flashed out into a white smile against the blackness of his face neither did i sir he said let me introduce you to the responsible party he whistled out of the gray dawn loomed an eerie monster badly singed 
wagging its tail. Scally, old man, said the curate, this gentleman wants to present you with an illuminated address. Thank him prettily. Then to the doctor, I'm ever so much obliged to you. It's quite comfortable now. He began stiffly to pull on his coat and waistcoat. Lord Caversham, lending a hand, noted the waistcoat and said quickly, Will you travel in my compartment? I should like to have a word with you if I may. I think I had better go and have a look at those poor folks in the sleeper first, replied the curate. They may require my services professionally. At the junction, then, perhaps, suggested Lord Caversham. At the junction, however, the curate found a special waiting to proceed north by a loop line, and being in no mind to receive compliments or waste his substance on a hotel, he departed forthwith, taking his charred confederate, Escalibar, with him. Division 8 Fortune, once she takes a fancy to you, is not readily shaken off. However, as most successful men are always trying to forget, a fortnight later, Lord Caversham, leaving his hotel in a great northern town, encountered an acquaintance he had no difficulty whatever in recognizing. It was a scalbar, jammed fast between two stationary tram cars. He had not yet shaken down to town life, submitting to a painful but effective process of extraction at the hands of a posse of policemen and tram conductors shrilly directed by a small but commending girl of the lodging-house drudge variety when this enterprise had been brought to a successful conclusion and the congested traffic moved on by the overheated policeman lord caversham crossed the street and tapped the damsel on the shoulder can you kindly inform me where the owner of that dog may be found he inquired politely yes Seventy-one Pilgrim Street, but he won't sell him. Should I be likely to find him at home if I called now? Yes, been in bed since the accident. Got a nasty arm. Perhaps you would not mind accompanying me back to Pilgrim Street in my car? After that, Mary Ellen's mind became an incoherent blur. A stately limousine glided up. Mary Ellen was handed in by a footman and a scalabar was stuffed in after her in installments. The grand gentleman entered by the opposite door and sat down beside her, but Mary Ellen was much too dazed to converse with him. The arrival of the equipage in Pilgrim Street was the greatest moment of Mary Ellen's life. Meantime, upstairs in the first floor front, the curate, lying in his uncomfortable flock bed, was saying, if you really mean it sir i do mean it if those two children had been burned to death unnoticed i should never have forgiven myself and the public would never have forgiven the company well sir since you say that you well you could do me a service could you possibly use your influence to get me a billet i'm not asking for an incumbency any old curacy will do a billet i could marry on he flushed scarlet. I, we have been waiting a long time now. There was a long silence, and the curate wondered whether he had been too mercenary in his request. Then Lord Caversham asked, What are you getting at present? A hundred and twenty a year? This was about two-thirds of the salary Lord Caversham paid his chauffeur. He asked another question in his curious, abrupt, staccato manner. How much do you want? We could make both ends meet on two hundred, but another fifty would enable me to make her a lot more comfortable, said the curate wistfully. The great man surveyed him silently, wondering, too, if the curate had known. Presently, he asked, Afraid of hard work? No work is hard to a man with a wife and a house of his own, replied the curate, with simple fervor. Lord Caversham smiled grimly. He had more homes of his own than he could conveniently live in, and he had been married three times. But even he found work hard now and then. I wonder, he said. Well, good afternoon. 
I should like to be introduced to your fiancé some day. Division 9 A tramp opened the rectory gate and shambled up the neat gravel walk toward the house. Taking a shortcut through the shrubbery, he emerged suddenly on a little lawn. On the lawn, a lady was sitting in a basket chair beside a perambulator, the occupant of which was slumbering peacefully. A small but intensely capable nursemaid, prone on the grass in a curvinular attitude, was acting as tunnel to a young gentleman of three who was impersonating a locomotive. The tramp approached the group and asked huskily for alms. He was a burly and unpleasant specimen of his class, a class all too numerous on the outskirts of the great industrial palace of Smeltingborough. The lady in the basket chair looked up. The rector is out, she said. If you go into the town, you will find him at the church hall, and he will investigate your case. Oh, the rector is out, is he? repeated the tramp, in tones of distinct satisfaction. Yes, said Aline. The tramp advanced another pace. Give us half a crown, he said. I haven't had a bite of food since yesterday, lady, nor a drink neither, he added humorously. Please go away said the lady. You know where to find the rector. The tramp smiled unpleasantly, but made no attempt to move. You refuse to go away? the lady said. I'll go for half a crown, replied the tramp, with the gracious air of one anxious to oblige a lady. Watch baby for a moment, Mary Ellen, said Aline. She rose and disappeared into the house, followed by the gratified smile of the tramp. He was a reasonable man, and knew that ladies did not wear pockets. Dirty weather, he remarked affably. Mary Ellen, keeping one hand on the shoulder of Master Gerald Carisham Gilmore, and the other on the edge of the baby's permulator, merely chuckled sardonically. The next moment there were footsteps round the corner of the house, and Aline reappeared. She was clinging with both hands to the collar of an enormous dog. Its tongue lolled from its great jaws. Its tail waved menacingly from side to side. Its great limbs were bent as though for a spring. Its eyes were half closed as though to focus the exact distance. Run, called Aline to the tramp. I can't hold him in much longer. This was true enough except that when Aline said in, she meant up. But the tramp did not linger to discuss grammar. There was a scurry of feet, the gate banged, and he was gone. With a sigh of relief, Aline let go of Escalibur's collar. Escalibur promptly collapsed on the grass and went to sleep again. End of section 12「Section 13 of The Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Vagabonds by John Townsend Trowbridge We are two travellers, Roger and I. Roger's my dog. Come here, you scamp. Jump for the gentleman. Mind your eye. Over the table, look out for that lamp. The rogue is growing a little old. Five years we've tramped through wind and weather, and slept outdoors when nights were cold, and ate and drank and starved together. We've learned what comfort is, I tell you. A bed on the floor, a bit of rosin, a fire to thaw our thumbs, poor fella. The poor he holds up there has been frozen. Plenty of catgut for my fiddle. This outdoor business is bad for strings. Then a few nice buckwheat hot from the griddle, and Roger and I set up for kings. No, thank ye, sir, I never drink. Roger and I are extremely moral. Aren't we, Roger? See him wink. Well, something hot then. We won't quarrel. He's thirsty too. See him nod his head. What a pity, sir, that dogs can't talk. He understands every word that's said. And he knows a good milk from a water and chalk. 
the truth is sir now i reflect i've been so sadly given to grog i wonder i've not lost the respect it is to you sir even of my dog but he sticks by through thick and thin and this old coat with its empty pockets and rags that smell of tobacco and gin he'll follow while he has eyes in his sockets there isn't another creature living would do it and prove through every disaster so fond so faithful and so forgiving to such a miserable thankless master now sir see him wag his tail and grin by george it makes my old eyes water that is there's something in this gin that chokes a fellow but no matter we'll have some music if you're willing and roger here what a plague of coffees sir shall march a little start you villain pause up eyes front salute your officer about face attention take your rifle some dogs have arms you see now hold your cap while the gentlemen give a trifle to aid a poor old patriot soldier march halt oh, now show how the rebel shakes when he stands up to hear his sentence now tell us how many drams it takes to honour a jolly new acquaintance five yelps that's five he's mighty knowing the night's before us fill the glasses quick sir i'm ill my brain is going some brandy thank you there it passes another glass and strong to deaden this pain then roger and i will start i wonder has he such a lumpish leaden aching thing in place of a heart he is sad sometimes and would weep if he could no doubt remembering things that were a virtuous kennel with plenty of food and himself a sober respectable cur i'm better now that glass was warming you rascal limber your lazy feet we must be fiddling and performing for supper and bed or starve in the street not a very gay life to lead you think but soon we shall go where the lodgings are free and the sleepers need neither bills nor drink the sooner the better for roger and me end of section thirteen recording by alan mapstone in oxford england section fourteen of the good dog book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bree Byaki. Adrift on an Ice Pan by Wilfred Thomason Grenville. Part 1. It was Easter Sunday at St. Anthony in the year 1908, but with us in northern Newfoundland still winter everything was covered with snow and ice. I was walking back after morning service when a boy came running over from the hospital with the news that a large team of dogs had come from sixty miles to the southward to get a doctor on a very urgent case. It was that of a young man on whom we had operated about a fortnight before for an acute bone disease in the thigh. The people had allowed the wound to close, the poisoned matter had accumulated, and we thought we should have to remove the leg. There was obviously, therefore, no time to be lost. So having packed up the necessary instruments, dressings, and drugs, and having fitted out the dog sleigh with my best dogs, I started at once, the messengers following me with their team. My team was an especially good one. On many a long journey, they had stood by me and pulled me out of difficulties by their sagacity and endurance. To a lover of his dogs, as every Christian man must be, each one had become almost as precious as a child to its mother. They were beautiful beasts. Bryn, the cleverest leader on the coast. Doc, a large, gentle beast, the backbone of the team for power. Spy, a wiry, powerful black and white dog. Moody, a lop-eared black and tan in his third season, a plotter that never looked behind him. Watch, the youngster of the team long-legged and speedy, with great liquid eyes and a Gordon setter coat. Sue, a large, dark Eskimo, the image of a great black wolf, with her sharp-pointed and perpendicular ears, for she harked back to her wild ancestry. Jerry, a large rowan-colored slut, 
the quickest of all my dogs on her feet, and so affectionate that her overtures of joy had often sent me sprawling on my back. Jack, a jet-black, gentle-natured dog, more like a retriever, that always ran next the sledge and never looked back, but everlastingly pulled straight ahead, running always with his nose to the ground. It was late in April, when there is always the risk of getting wet through the ice, so that I was carefully prepared with spare outfit, which included a change of garments, snowshoes, rifle, compass, axe, and oilskin overclothes. The messengers were anxious that their team should travel back with mine, for they were slow at best and needed a lead. My dogs, however, being a powerful team, could not be held back, and though I managed to wait twice for their sleigh, I had reached a village about twenty miles on the journey before nightfall, and had fed the dogs, and was gathering a few people for prayer when they caught me up. During the night, the wind shifted to the northeast, which brought in fog and rain, softened the snow, and made traveling very bad besides heaving a heavy sea into the bay. Our drive next morning would be somewhat over forty miles, the first ten miles on an arm of the sea, on saltwater ice. In order not to be separated too long from my friends, I sent them ahead two hours before me, appointing a rendezvous in a log tilt that we have built in the woods as a halfway house. There is no one living on all that long coastline and to provide against accidents, which have happened more than once, we built this hut in which to keep dry clothing, food, and drugs. The first rain of the year was falling when I started, and I was obliged to keep on what we call the bal heaters, or ice barricades, much farther up the bay than I had expected. The sea of the night before had smashed the ponderous covering of ice right to the land wash. There were great gaping chasms between the enormous blocks, which we call pans, and half a mile out it was all clear water. An island three miles out had preserved a bridge of ice, however, and by crossing a few cracks I managed to reach it. From the island it was four miles across to a rocky promontory, a course that would be several miles shorter than going round the shore. Here, as far as the eye could reach, the ice seemed good, though it was very rough. Obviously, it had been smashed up by the sea and then packed in again by the strong wind from the northeast, and I thought it had frozen together solid. All went well till I was about a quarter of a mile from the landing point. Then the wind suddenly fell, and I noticed that I was traveling over loose sish, which was like porridge and probably many feet deep. By stabbing down, I could drive my whip handle through the thin coating of young ice that was floating on it. The sish ice consists of the tiny fragments where the large pans have been pounding together on the heaving sea, like the stones of Freya's grinding mill. So quickly did the wind now come off shore, and so quickly did the packed slob, relieved of the wind pressure, run abroad, that already I could not see one pan larger than ten feet square. Moreover, the ice was loosening so rapidly that I saw that retreat was absolutely impossible neither was there any way to get off the little pan I was surveying from. There was not a moment to lose. I tore off my oilskins, threw myself on my hands and knees by the side of the comatic to give a larger base to hold, and shouted to my team to go ahead for the shore. Before we had gone twenty yards, the dogs got frightened, hesitated for a moment, and the comatic instantly sank into the slob. It was necessary then for the dogs to pull much harder so that they now began to sink in also. Earlier in the season, the father of the very boy I was going to operate on had been drowned in this same way, his dogs tangling their traces around him in the slob. This flashed into my mind, and I managed to loosen my sheath knife, scramble forward, find the traces in the water, and cut them, holding on to the leader's trace wound round my wrist. Being in the water, I could see no piece of ice that would bear anything up, but there was, as it happened, a piece of snow frozen together like a large snowball, about twenty-five yards away, near where my leading dog, Bryn, was wallowing in the slob. Upon this he very shortly climbed, his long trace of ten fathoms almost reaching there before he went into the water. This dog has weird black markings on his face, giving him the appearance of wearing a perpetual grin. After climbing out on the snow, as if it were the most natural position in the world, he deliberately shook the ice and water from his long coat, 
and then turned round to look for me. As he sat perched up there out of the water, he seemed to be grinning with satisfaction. The other dogs were hopelessly bogged. Indeed, we were like flies in treacle. Gradually, I hauled myself along the line that was still tied to my wrist, till without any warning the dog turned around and slipped out of his harness, and then once more turned his grinning face to where I was struggling. It was impossible to make any progress through the sish ice by swimming, so I lay there and thought all would soon be over, only wondering if anyone would ever know what happened. There was no particular horror attached to it, and, in fact, I began to feel drowsy, as if I could easily go to sleep, when suddenly I saw the trace of another big dog that had himself gone through before he reached the pan, and, though he was close to it, was quite unable to force his way out. Along this I hauled myself, using him as a bow anchor, but much bothered by other dogs as I passed them, one of which got on my shoulder, pushing me farther down into the ice. There was only a yard or so more when I had passed my living anchor, and soon I lay with my dogs around me on the little piece of slob ice. I had to help them onto it, working them through the lane that I had made. The piece of ice we were on was so small it was obvious we must soon all be drowned if we remain upon it as it drifted seaward into more open water. If we were to save our lives, no time was to be lost. When I stood up, I could see about twenty yards away a larger pan floating amidst the sish, like a great flat raft, and if we could get onto it, we should postpone, at least for a time, the death that had already seemed almost inevitable. It was impossible to reach it without a lifeline, as I had already learned to my cost, and the next problem was how to get one there. Marvelous to relate, when I had first fallen through after I had cut the dogs adrift without any hope left of saving myself, I had not let my knife sink, but had fastened it by two half-hitches to the back of one of the dogs. To my great joy, there it was still, and shortly I was at work cutting all the sealskin traces still hanging from the dogs' harnesses and splicing them together into one long line. These I divided and fastened to the backs of my two leaders, tying the near ends around my two wrists. I then pointed out to Bryn the pan I wanted to reach, and tried my best to make them go ahead, giving them the full length of my line from two coils. My long sealskin moccasins, reaching to my thigh, were full of ice and water. These I took off and tied separately on the dog's backs. My coat, hat, gloves, and overalls I had already lost. At first, nothing would induce the dogs to move, and though I threw them off the pan two or three times, they struggled back upon it, which perhaps was only natural, because as soon as they fell through, they could see nowhere else to make for. To me, however, this seemed to spell the end. Fortunately, I had with me a small black spaniel, almost a featherweight, with large furry paws, called Jack, who acts as my mascot, and incidentally, as my retriever. This at once flashed into my mind, and I felt I still had one more chance for life. So I spoke to him and showed him the direction, and then threw a piece of ice toward the desired goal. Without a moment's hesitation, he made a dash for it, and, to my great joy, got there safely, the tough scale of sea ice carrying his weight bravely. At once I shouted to him to lie down, and this, too, he immediately did, looking like a little black fuzzball on the white setting. My leaders could now see him seated there on the new piece of flow, and when once more I threw them off, they understood what I wanted and fought their way to where they saw the spaniel, carrying with them the line that gave me the one chance for my life. The other dogs followed them, and after painful struggling, all got out again except one. Taking all the run that I could get on my little pan, I made a dive, slithering with the impetus along the surface until once more I sank through. After a long fight, however, I was able to haul myself by the long traces on to this new pan, having taken care beforehand to tie the harness to which I was holding under the dog's bellies so that they could not slip them off. But alas, the pan I was now on was not large enough to bear us and was already beginning to sink, so this process had to be repeated immediately. 
I now realized that, though we had been working toward the shore, we had been losing ground all the time, for the offshore wind had already driven us a hundred yards farther out, but the widening gap kept full of the pounded ice through which no man could possibly go. I had decided I would rather stake my chances on a long swim even than perish by inches on the flow, as there was no likelihood whatever of being seen and rescued. But keenly though I watched, not a streak even of clear water appeared, the interminable sish rising from below and filling every gap as it appeared. We were now resting on a piece of ice about ten by twelve feet, which, as I found when I came to examine it, was not ice at all, but simply snow-covered slob frozen into a mass, and I feared it would very soon break up in the general turmoil of the heavy sea which was increasing as the ice drove offshore before the wind. At first we drifted in the direction of a rocky point on which a heavy surf was breaking. Here I thought once again to swim ashore. But suddenly we struck a rock. A large piece broke off the already small pan, and what was left swung round in the backwash and started right out to sea. There was nothing for it now but to hope for a rescue. Alas! there was little possibility of being seen. As I have already mentioned, no one lives around this big bay. My only hope was that the other Comatic, knowing I was alone and had failed to keep my tryst, would perhaps come back to look for me. This, however, as it proved, they did not do. The westerly wind was rising all the time, our coldest wind at this time of the year, coming as it does over the gulf ice. It was tantalizing as I stood with next to nothing on, the wind going through me and every stitch soaked in ice water, to see my well-stocked comatic some fifty yards away. It was still above water, with food, hot tea in the thermos bottle, dry clothing, matches, wood, and everything on it for making a fire to attract attention. It is easy to see a dark object on the ice in the daytime, for the gorgeous whiteness shows off the least thing. But the tops of the bushes and large pieces of kelp have often deceived those looking out. Moreover, with our memory, no man has been thus adrift on the bay ice. The chances were about one in a thousand that I should be seen at all, and if I were seen, I should probably be mistaken for some piece of refuse. To keep from freezing, I cut off my long moccasins down to the feet, strung out some line, split the legs, and made a kind of jacket which protected my back from the wind down as far as the waist. I have this jacket still, and my friends assure me it would make a good Sunday garment. I had not drifted more than half a mile before I saw my poor Comatic disappear through the ice, which was every minute loosening up into the small pans that it consisted of, and it seemed like a friend gone, and one more tie with home and safety lost. To the northward, about a mile distant, lay the mainland along which I had passed so merrily in the morning, only, it seemed, a few moments before. By midday I had passed the island to which I had crossed on the ice bridge. I could see that the bridge was gone now. If I could reach the island, I should only be marooned and destined to die of starvation. But there was little chance of that, for I was rapidly driving into the ever-widening bay. It was scarcely safe to move on my small ice raft for fear of breaking it, yet I saw I must have the skins of some of my dogs, of which I had eight on the pan, if I was to live the night out. There was now some three to five miles between me and the north side of the bay, there immense pans of arctic ice surging to and fro on the heavy ground seas were thundering into the cliffs like medieval battering rams. It was evident that, even if seen, I could hope for no help from that quarter before the night. No boat could live through the surf. Unwinding the sealskin traces from my waist, round which I had wound them to keep the dogs from eating them, I made a slipknot, passed it over the first dog's head, tied it around my foot close to his neck, threw him on his back, and stabbed him in the heart. Poor beast. I loved him like a friend. A beautiful dog but we could not all hope to live. In fact, I had no hope any of us would at that time, but it seemed better to die fighting. In spite of my care, the struggling dog bit me rather badly in the leg. 
I suppose my numb hands prevented my holding his throat as I could ordinarily do. Moreover, I must hold the knife in the wound to the end, as blood on the fur would freeze solid and make the skin useless. In this way, I sacrificed two more large dogs, receiving only one more bite, though I fully expected that the pan I was on would break up in the struggle. The other dogs, who were licking their coats and trying to get dry, apparently took no notice of the fate of their comrades, but I was very careful to prevent the dying dogs crying out, for the noise of fighting would probably have been followed by the rest attacking the down dog, and that was too close to me to be pleasant. A short shrift seemed to me better than a long one, and I envied the dead dogs whose troubles were over so quickly. Indeed, I came to balance in my mind whether, if once I passed into the open sea, it would not be better by far to use my faithful knife on myself than to die by inches. There seemed no hardship in the thought. I seemed fully to sympathize with the Japanese view of Harikiri. Working, however, saved me from philosophizing. By the time I had skinned these dogs, and with my knife and some of the harness had strung the skins together, I was ten miles on my way and it was getting dark. Away to the northward, I could see a single light in the little village where I had slept the night before, where I had received the kindly hospitality of the simple fishermen in whose comfortable homes I have spent many a night. I could not help but to think of them sitting down to tea with no idea that there was anyone watching them, for I had told them not to expect me back for three days. Meanwhile, I had frayed out a small piece of rope into oakum and mixed it with fat from the intestines of my dogs. Alas, my matchbox, which was always chained to me, had leaked, and my matches were in pulp. Had I been able to make a light, it would have looked so unearthly out there on the sea that I felt sure they would see me. But that chance was now cut off. However, I kept the matches, hoping that I might dry them if I lived through the night. While working at the dogs, about every five minutes I would stand up and wave my hands toward the land. I had no flag, and I could not spare my shirt, for, wet as it was, it was better than nothing in that freezing wind, and, anyhow, it was already nearly dark. Unfortunately, the coves in among the cliffs are so placed that only for a very narrow space can the people in any house see the sea. Indeed, most of them cannot see it at all so that I could not in the least expect anyone to see me, even supposing it had been daylight. Not daring to take any snow from the surface of my pan to break the wind with, I piled up the carcasses of my dogs. With my skin rug, I could now sit down without getting soaked. During these hours, I had continually taken off my clothes, wrung them out, swung them one by one in the wind, and put on first one and then the other inside hoping that what heat there was in my body would thus serve to dry them. In this, I had been fairly successful. My feet gave me the most trouble, for they immediately got wet again because my thin moccasins were easily soaked through on the snow. I suddenly thought of the way in which laps who tend our reindeer manage for dry socks. They carry grass with them, which they ravel up and pad into their shoes. Into this they put their feet, and then pack the rest with more grass tying up the top with a binder. The ropes of the harness for our dogs are carefully sewed all over with two layers of flannel in order to make them soft against the dog's sides. So, as soon as I could sit down, I started with my trusty knife to rip up the flannel. Though my fingers were more or less frozen, I was also able to ravel out the rope, put it into my shoes, and use my wet socks inside my knickerbockers, where, though damp, they served to break the wind. Then, Tying the narrow strips of flannel together, I bound up the top of the moccasins, lap fashion, and carried the bandage on up over my knee, making a ragged, though most excellent, bootay. As to the garments I wore, I had opened recently a box of football clothes I had not seen for twenty years. I had found my old Oxford University football running shorts and a pair of Richmond football club red, yellow, and black stockings, exactly as I wore them twenty years ago. These, with a flannel shirt and a sweater vest, were now all I had left. Coat, hat, gloves, oilskins. Everything else were gone. And I stood there in that odd costume, exactly as I stood twenty years ago on a football field, reminding me of the little girl of a friend, who, when told she was dying, asked to be dressed in her Sunday frock to go to heaven in. 
my costume, being very light, dried all the quicker until afternoon. Then nothing would dry anymore, everything freezing stiff. It had been an ideal costume to struggle through the slob ice. I really believe the conventional garments missionaries are supposed to affect would have been fatal. End of section 14. Recording by Bree Bayaki. Section 15 of The Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bree Bayaki. Adrift on an Ice Pan by Wilfred Thomason Grenville. Part 2. My occupation, till what seemed like midnight, was unraveling rope, and with this I padded out my knickers aside, and my shirt as well, though it was a clumsy job for I could not see what I was doing. Now, getting my largest dog, Doc, as big as a wolf and weighing ninety-two pounds, I made him lie down, so that I could cuddle around him. I then wrapped the three skins around me, arranging them so that I could lie on one edge while the other came just over my shoulders and head. My own breath collecting inside the newly flayed skin must have had a soporific effect, for I was soon fast asleep. One hand I had kept warm against the curled-up dog, but the other, being gloveless, had frozen, and suddenly I woke, shivering enough, I thought, to break my fragile pan. What I took at first to be the sun was just rising, but I soon found out it was the moon, and then I knew it was about half-past twelve. The dog was having an excellent time. He hadn't been cuddled so warm all winter, and he resented my moving with low growls till he found it wasn't another dog. The wind was steadily driving me now toward the open sea, and I could expect, short of a miracle, nothing but death out there. Somehow, one scarcely felt justified in praying for a miracle. But we have learned down here to pray for the things we want, and, anyhow, just at that moment, the miracle occurred. The wind fell off suddenly and came with a light air from the southward, and then dropped stark calm. The ice was now all abroad, which I was sorry for, for there was a big safe pan not twenty yards away from me. If I could have got on that, I might have killed my other dogs when the time came, and with their coats I could hope to hold out for two or three days more and with the food and drink their bodies would offer me, need not at least die of hunger or thirst. To tell the truth, they were so big and strong I was half afraid to tackle them with only a sheath knife on my small and unstable raft. But it was now freezing hard. I knew the calm water between us would form into cakes, and I had to recognize that the chance of getting near enough to escape onto it was gone. If, on the other hand, the whole bay froze again, I had yet another possible chance. For my pan would hold together longer and I should be opposite another village, called Goose Cove, at daylight, and might possibly be seen from there. I knew that the Comatics there would be staring at daybreak over the hills for a parade of orangemen about twenty miles away. Possibly, therefore, I might be seen as they climbed the hills. So I lay down and went to sleep again. It seems impossible to say how long one sleeps but I woke with a sudden thought in my mind that must have been a flag, but again I had no pole and no flag. However, I set to work in the dark to disarticulate the legs of my dead dogs, which were now frozen stiff, and which were all that offered a chance of carrying anything like a distress signal. Cold as it was, I determined to sacrifice my shirt for that purpose, with the first streak of daylight. It took a long time in the dark to get the legs off, and when I had patiently marled them together with old harness ropes and the remains of the skin traces, it was the heaviest and crookedest flagpole it has ever been my lot to see. I had had no food from six o'clock the morning before, when I had eaten porridge and bread and butter. I had, however, a rubber band which I had been wearing, instead of one of my garters, and I chewed on that for twenty-four hours. It saved me from thirst and hunger, oddly enough. It was not possible to get a drink from my pan, for it was far too salty. But anyhow, that thought did not distress me much, for as from time to time I heard the cracking and grinding of the newly formed slob, it seemed that my devoted boat must inevitably soon go to pieces. At last the sun rose, 
and the time came for the sacrifice of my shirt. So I stripped, and, much to my surprise, found it not half so cold as I had anticipated. I now reformed my dogskins with the raw side out, so that they made a kind of coat quite rivaling Joseph's. But with the rising of the sun, the frost came out of the joints of my dog's legs, and the friction caused by waving it made my flagpole almost tie itself in knots. Still, I could raise it three or four feet above my head, which was very important. Now, however, I found that instead of being as far out to sea as I had reckoned, I had drifted back in a northwesterly direction and was off some cliffs known as Ireland Head. Near these, there was a little village looking seaward, whence I should certainly have been seen. But, as I had myself earlier in the winter been nightbound at this place, I had learnt that there was not a single soul living there at all this winter. The people had all, as usual, migrated to the winter houses up the bay, where they get together for schooling and social purposes. I soon found it was impossible to keep waving so heavy a flag all the time, and yet I dared not sit down, for that might be the exact moment someone would be in the position to see me from the hills. The only thing in my mind was how long I could stand up and how long go on waving that pole at the cliffs. Once or twice, I thought I saw men against their snowy faces, which, I judged, were about five and a half miles from me, but they were only trees. Once, also, I thought I saw a boat approaching. A glittering object kept appearing and disappearing on the water, but it was only a small piece of ice sparkling in the sun as it rose on the surface. I think that the rocking of my cradle up and down on the waves had helped me to sleep for I felt as well as ever I did in my life, and with the hope of a long sunny day, I felt sure I was good to last another twenty-four hours, if my boat would hold out and not rot under the sun's rays. Each time I sat down to rest, my big dog, Doc, came and kissed my face and then walked to the edge of the ice pan, returning again to where I was huddled up, as if to say, Why don't you come along? Surely it is time to start. The other dogs were also now moving about very restlessly, occasionally trying to satisfy their hunger by gnawing at the dead bodies of their brothers. I determined at midday to kill a big Eskimo dog and drink his blood. As I had read only a few days before in the farthest north of Dr. Nansen's doing, that is, if I survived the battle with him, I could not help feeling, even then, my ludicrous position, and I thought, if ever I got ashore again, I should have to laugh at myself, standing hour after hour waving my shirt at those lofty cliffs, which seemed to assume a kind of sardonic grin, so that I could almost imagine they were laughing at me. At times I could not help of thinking of the good breakfast that my colleagues were enjoying at the back of those same cliffs, and of the snug fire and the comfortable room which we call our study. I can honestly say that from first to last, not a single sensation of fear entered my mind even when I was struggling in the slob ice. Somehow, it did not seem unnatural. I had been through the ice half a dozen times before. For the most part, I felt very sleepy, and the idea was then very strong in my mind that I should soon reach the solution of the mysteries that I had been preaching about for so many years. Only the previous night, Easter Sunday, at prayers in the cottage, we had been discussing the fact that the soul was entirely separate from the body, that Christ's idea of the body as the temple in which the soul dwells is so amply borne out by modern science. We had talked of thoughts from that admirable book, Brain and Personality, by Dr. Thompson of New York, and also of the same subject in the light of a recent operation performed at the Johns Hopkins Hospital by Dr. Harvey Cushing. The doctor had removed from a man's brain two large cystic tumors, without giving the man an anesthetic, and the patient had kept up a running conversation with him, all the while the doctor's fingers were working in his brain. It had seemed such a striking proof that ourselves and our bodies are two absolutely different things. Our eternal life has always been with me a matter of faith. It seems to me one of those problems that must always be a mystery to knowledge, but my own faith in this matter had been so untroubled it seemed now almost natural to be leaving through this portal of death from an ice pan. In many ways, 
Also, I could see how a death of this kind might be of value to the particular work that I am engaging in. Except for my friends, I had nothing I could think of to regret whatever. Certainly, I should like to have told them the story, but then one does not carry folios of paper in running shorts, which have no pockets, and all my writing gear had gone by the board with the comatic. I could still see a testimonial to myself some distance away in my khaki overalls, which I had left on another pan in the struggle of the night before. They seemed a kind of company, and would possibly be picked up and suggest the true story. Running through my head all the time, quite unbidden, were the words of the old hymn. My God, my Father, while I stray far from home on life's dark way, oh, teach me from my heart to say, Thy will be done. It is a hymn we hardly sing out here, and it was an unconscious memory of my boyhood days. It was a perfect morning, a cobalt sky, an ultramarine sea, a golden sun, an almost wasteful extravagance of crimson over hills of purest snow, which caught a reflected glow from rock and crag. Between me and the hills lay miles of rough ice and long veins of thin black slob that had formed during the night. For the foreground, there was my poor, gruesome pan, bobbing up and down on the edge of the open sea, stained with blood and littered with carcasses and debris. It was smaller than last night, and I noticed also that the new ice from the water melted under the dogs' bodies had been formed at the expense of its thickness. Five dogs, myself in colored football costume and a bloody dogskin cloak, with a gay flannel shirt on a pole of frozen dog's legs, completed the picture. The sun was almost hot by now, and I was conscious of a surplus of heat in my skin coat. I began to look longingly at one of my remaining dogs, for an appetite will rise even on an ice pan, and that made me think of fire. So once again, I inspected my matches. Alas, the heads were in paste. All but three or four blue-top wax ones. These I now laid out to dry, while I searched about on my snowpan to see if I could get a piece of transparent ice to make a burning glass, for I was pretty sure that with all the unraveling tow I had stuffed into my leggings, and with the fat of my dogs, I could make smoke enough to be seen, if only I could get a light. I had found a piece of which I thought would do, and had gone back to wave my flag, which I did every two minutes, when I suddenly thought I saw again the glitter of an oar. It did not seem possible, however, for it must be remembered it was not water which lay between me and the land, but slob ice, which a mile or two inside me was very heavy. Even if people had seen me, I did not think they could get through, though I knew that the whole shore would then be trying. Moreover, there was no smoke rising on the land to give me hope that I had been seen. There had been no gun flashes in the night, and I felt sure that, had anyone seen me, there would have been a bonfire on every hill to encourage me to keep going. So I gave it up and went on with my work. But the next time I went back to my flag, the glitter seemed very distinct, and though it kept disappearing as it rose and fell on the surface, I kept my eyes strained upon it, for my dark spectacles had been lost, and I was partly snowblind. I waved my flag as high as I could raise it, broadside on. At last, Beside the glint of white ore, I made out the black streak of the hull. I knew that, if the pan held on for another hour, I should be all right. With that strange perversity of the human intellect, the first thing I thought of was what trophies I could carry with my luggage from the pan, and I pictured the dog-bone flagstaff adorning my study. The dogs actually ate it afterwards. I thought of preserving my ragged putes with our collection of curiosities. I lost no time now at the burning glass. My whole mind was devoted to making sure I should be seen, and I moved about as much as I dared on the raft, waving my sorry token aloft. At last there could be no doubt about it. The boat was getting nearer and nearer. I could see that my rescuers were frantically waving, and when they came within shouting distance, I heard someone cry out, Don't get excited! Keep on the pan where you are! They were infinitely more excited than I. Already to me, it seemed just as natural now to be saved as half an hour before it had seemed inevitable I should be lost, 
and had my rescuers only know, as I did, the sensation of a bath in that ice, when you could not dry yourself afterwards. They need not have expected me to follow the example of the Apostle Peter and throw myself into the water. As the man in the bow leaped from the boat onto my ice raft and grasped both my hands in his, not a word was uttered. I could see in his face the strong emotions he was trying hard to force back, though in spite of himself tears trickled down his cheeks. It was the same with each of the others of my rescuers, nor was there any reason to be ashamed of them. These were not the emblems of weak sentimentality, but the evidences of the realization of the deepest and noblest emotion of which the human heart is capable, the vision that God has use for us, his creatures, the sense of that supreme joy of the Christ, the joy of unselfish service. After the handshake and swallowing a cup of warm tea that had been thoughtfully packed in a bottle, we hoisted in my remaining dogs and started for home. To drive the boat home, there were not only five Newfoundland fishermen at the oars, but five men with Newfoundland muscles in their backs, and five as brave hearts as ever beat in the bodies of human beings. So, slowly but steadily, we forged through to the shore, now jumping out onto larger pans and forcing them apart with the oars, now hauling the boat out and dragging her over when the jam of ice packed tightly in by the rising wind was impossible to get through otherwise. My first question, when at last we found our tongues, was, however did you happen to be out in the boat in this ice? To my astonishment, they told me that the previous night, four men had been away on a long headland, cutting out some dead harp seals that they had killed in the fall and left to freeze up in a rough wooden store they had built there, and that as they were leaving for home, my pan of ice had drifted out clear of Hare Island, and one of them, with his keen fisherman's eyes, had seen something unusual. They at once returned to their village, saying there was something alive drifting out to sea on the flow ice. But their report had been discredited, for the people thought that it could only be the top of some tree. All the time I had been driving along, I knew there was one man on that coast who had a good spyglass. He tells me he instantly got up in the midst of his supper on hearing the news and hurried over the cliffs to the lookout carrying his trusty spyglass with him. Immediately, dark as it was, he saw that without any doubt there was a man out on the ice. Indeed, he saw me wave my hands every now and again toward the shore. By a very easy process of reasoning, on so uninhabited a shore, he at once knew who it was, though some of the men argued that it must be someone else. Little had I thought, as night was closing in, that away on that snowy hilltop lay a man with a telescope, patiently searching those miles of ice for me. Hastily they rushed back to the village, and at once went down to try to launch a boat, but that proved to be impossible. Miles of ice lay between them and me. The heavy sea was hurling great blocks on the land wash, and night was already falling, the wind blowing hard on the shore. The whole village was aroused, and messengers were dispatched at once along the coast and lookouts told off to all the favorable points, so that while I considered myself a laughingstock, bowing with my flag to those unresponsive cliffs, there were really many eyes watching me. One man told me that with his glass, he distinctly saw me waving the shirt flag. There was little slumber that night in the villages, and even the men told me there were few dry eyes as they thought of the impossibility of saving me from perishing. We are not given to weeping over much on this shore but there are tears that do a man honor. Before daybreak, this fine volunteer crew had been got together. The boat, with such a force behind it of willpower, would, I believe, have gone through anything. And after seeing the heavy breakers through which we were guided, loaded with their heavy ice-battering rams, when at last we ran through the harbor mouth with the boat on our return, I knew well what wives and children had been thinking of when they saw their loved ones put out. Only two years ago, I remember a fisherman's wife watching her husband and three sons take out a boat to bring in a stranger that was showing flags for a pilot, but the boat and its occupants have not come back. Every soul in the village was on the beach as we neared the shore. Every soul was waiting to shake hands when I landed. Even with the grip that one after another gave me, some no longer trying to keep back the tears, I did not find out my hands were frostburnt. 
a fact I have not been slow to appreciate since, however. I must have been a weird sight as I stepped ashore, tied up in rags, stuffed out with oakum, wrapped in the bloody skins of dogs, with no hat, coat, or gloves besides, and only a pair of short knickers. It must have seemed to some as if it were the old man of the sea coming ashore. But no time was wasted before a pot of tea was exactly where I wanted it to be, and some hot stew was locating itself where I had intended an hour before the blood of one of my remaining dogs should have gone. Rigged out in the warm garments the fishermen wear, I started with a large team as hard as I could race for the hospital, for I had learnt that the news had gone over that I was lost. It was soon painfully impressed upon me that I could not much enjoy the ride, for I had to be hauled like a log up the hills, my feet being frostburnt so that I could not walk. Had I guessed this before going into the house, I might have avoided much trouble. It is time to bring this egotistic narrative to an end. Jack lies curled up by my feet while I write this short account. Bryn is once again leading and lording it over his fellows. Doc and the other survivors are not forgotten. Now that we have again returned to the less romantic episodes of a mission hospital life, there stands in our hallway a bronze tablet to the memory of three noble dogs, Moody, Watch, and Spy, whose lives were given for mine on the ice. In my home in England, my brother has placed a duplicate tablet and has added these words, Not one of them is forgotten before your father, which is in heaven. And this I most fully believe to be true. The boy whose life I was intent on saving was brought to the hospital a day or two later in a boat, the ice having cleared off the coast not to return for that season. He was operated on successfully and is even now on the high road to recovery. We all love life. I was glad to be back once more, with possibly a new lease of it before me. I had learned on the pan many things, but chiefly that the one cause for regret when we look back on a life which we think is closed forever, will be the fact that we have wasted its opportunities. As I went to sleep that first night, there still rang in my ears the same verse of the old hymn which had been my companion on the ice. Thy will, not mine, O Lord. End of section 15. Recording by Bree Bayaki. Section 16 of the Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Just Our Dog by Anonymous. He was just a dog, mister, that's all, and all us boys called him Bub. He was curly and not very tall, and he hadn't a tail, just a stub. His tail froze one cold night, you see. We just pulled the rest of him through. No, he didn't have much pedigree. Perhaps that was frozen off, too. He always seemed quite well behaved, and he never had many bad fights. In summer, he used to be shaved, and he slept in the woodshed o' nights. Sometimes he would wake up too soon and cry if his tail got a chill. Some nights he would bark at the moon, but some nights he would sleep very still. He knew how to play hide-and-seek, and he always would come when you'd call. He would play dead, roll over and speak, and learned it in no time at all. Sometimes he would growl just in play, but he never would bite, and his worst was to bark at the postman one day, but the postman, he barked at him first. He used to chase cats up a tree, but that was just only in fun and the cat was as safe as could be unless it should start out to run. Sometimes he'd chase children and throw them down just while running along and then lick their faces to show he didn't mean anything wrong. He was chasing an automobile when the wheel hit him right in the side, so he just gave a queer little squeal and curled up and stretched out and died. His tail, it was not very long. He was curly and not very tall, but he never did anything wrong. He was just our dog, mister. That's all. End of section 16. Recording by Mirabelle.
Section 17 of The Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Hand. Barry, the Dog Hero of the St. Bernard Pass by Ava March Tappan. Rather more than a hundred years ago, there lived in Switzerland, just at the edge of the city of Bern, the most lovable little St. Bernard puppy that was ever seen. His name was Barry. He had a big round head, a plump and somewhat unmanageable body that was always getting into his way, and paws so large that when he tried to walk, he stumbled over them and sprawled on the floor. He had beautiful great brown eyes and the most appealing little whimper that ever persuaded a dog's friends to give him whatever he wanted. Barry and his mother slept in a corner of the wide piazza, right under Carl's window. He did not discover Carl at once, however, for there were so many interesting things on the piazza. There were piles of wood, bundles of straw, plows and rakes and harrows and baskets, even wagons. There was always room on the piazza, and so everything was put there that could not be crowded into the barns or sheds. Barry had to examine every one of these articles, staring at them with solemn little wrinkles between his eyes and sniffing at them with his pudgy little nose. After a while, he began to notice queer sounds that came from within the house. There might be something there to play with, he thought, and one day, when the door was left open, he pushed in his inquisitive little nose and then his whole wriggling, inquisitive little body. The floor was very clean. Indeed, it was so well scrubbed that his clumsy paws slid out from under him in four different directions, and at last he sat down squarely in the middle of the room and looked around. Scarlet geraniums were growing in pots on the window sills, but they did not look good to eat or play with. There were straight-backed chairs and a table, but what they were for, Barry had not the least idea. One thing, however, did interest him so much that he wobbled over to it with his uncertain little paws to find out what it was. This was the big white porcelain stove. The fire was in a sort of furnace in the hall, but enough heat was brought into the big white stove so that Barry thought it was the most comfortable thing he had ever known, except, of course, his mother's furry breast, and he snuggled up to it cozily, all ready to take a nap. A voice said, Hello, Barry. He turned to see where it came from, which means that he toppled over in a little heap. When he picked himself up, that is, when he balanced himself on his four paws instead of on his back, the first thing he saw was a small, slender hand stretched down from somewhere. Barry gazed at it. Of course he had seen people before, and the people had hands, but the people were big, and the hands were big and different from this one. He drew back at first, then went nearer. There was something about it that he liked, and he began to lick it. And when the hand patted the cover of the low couch, and a boy's voice said, Come up, Barry, he did his very best to obey, and stretched up on his unsteady little legs until he could rest his paws on the edge of the couch and look about. You see, Barry, said Carl, I'm all alone just now, and I need a little dog exactly like you to take care of me. I'm sick, but I'm going to be well pretty soon, and then we'll do things, won't we, though? Barry waved his tail. What a splendid boy that is, he thought. He's as good as a puppy. I like him. I want to get up there beside him. He did his very best to stretch himself up. The thin white hand gave what help it could, and in a minute or two, the little dog was snuggling up to his new friend, quite tired out with his efforts. As the boy grew stronger, they played all sorts of games together. They ran races, they played fetch and carry, they scampered up the driveway that led from the ground to the top floor of the barn. They went to the little lake, and much to his surprise, Barry found out that he could swim much better than Carl. Best of all, they learned each other's language. When the puppy set out to chase a small kitten and Carl said, No, Barry, he understood that this was one of the things forbidden. If Carl said, Find my ball and we will have a play, Barry knew that a good time was coming and set off in high glee to find the ball. Carl understood the puppy just as well. If Barry laid his great paw on the boy's knee and turned his head to look out of the window, Carl knew this meant, Do please come out with me. If Barry gave a short, quick bark, it meant, I'm in a hurry. If it was a long, deep one, it meant, There is something wrong. Barry made one peculiar sound, neither bark nor whine. It began almost like a little lonesome sob, but it ended in a cry of joy. 
This was his greeting to Carl if the two had been separated for a while. The school children had a song called The Baron's Welcome, and they called this cry Barry's Welcome. Barry was a happy dog, but after a while the day came when Carl and an armful of books went away from the house early in the morning, and he was forbidden to follow. He sat down on the piazza in amazement. What could it mean? It must be a mistake, for of course he had a right to go wherever Carl went, and pretty soon he jumped up and ran after him, as fast as ever he could. He was only a puppy, however, and very soon he lost the scent and wandered about, a little, forlorn, bewildered dog, roaming along through the streets of Bern. He had never been there before. When he and Carl went out together, they went through the bright, sunny fields, but the streets of the city were quite different. In most of them, the second story of the buildings extended to the very edge of the sidewalk, and rested upon heavy square pillars. This made the walls dark and gloomy, and the poor little puppy began to feel afraid. Just then he came into an open square, and he heard what seemed somewhat like a cock crowing far up above his head. He did not note that this was only the famous clock of Bern, and when in a moment more it began to strike, the little lost dog was frightened almost out of his wits. He ran for his life, paying no attention to where he was going, and soon he was more alarmed than ever, for right before him were some pits or sunken yards where bears were kept. Some of them were walking about, others sitting down and catching in their forepaws the pieces of gingerbread that people were tossing to them. Poor little Barry. He was a plucky little dog, but he was only a puppy. He had wandered forlornly through strange, gloomy streets. He had heard terrible noises coming down from the skies, and now he had come upon these awful monsters, twenty times as big as he, who might fly right up over the rails just as the bird did and devour him. There is nothing else in the world so lonely as a lost dog. Is it any wonder that he threw back his head and howled and howled? I want my mother. I want Carl. This was what he said, but no one understood. A lady patted him and tried to comfort him, but this was not what he wanted. He wanted to go home. At last a tall policeman came and took hold of his collar. He turned it around so he could see the lettering. Then he reverently made the sign of the cross and said to the lady, This dog belongs to the good fathers far up on the St. Bernard Pass. Does anyone know who has the dogs this year? He asked a group of children. Carl's father has some of them, they replied. May we take him back? Barry had found that he was being cared for, and he had lain down flat on the pavement, stretched out to his full length, utterly tired out. No, said the policeman, a pup gets tired as soon as a baby. He is too used up to walk. Pretty soon I will take him home in the police wagon. So it was that Barry came home. A very happy boy threw his arms around the dog's neck, and as for Barry, he snuggled himself under Carl's jacket, nestling closer and closer, drawing in his breath like a sob, and then making little plaintive sounds of pleasure. The next morning, when Carl was ready for school, Barry sat on the piazza and looked up into his face pleadingly. No, Barry, said Carl, dogs aren't allowed to come to school and he went off, trying hard to forget the mournful little figure on the piazza. Half an hour later, a delighted boy ran up the steps of his home. Mother, mother, he cried. The teacher says that if Barry will be very good, he may come every day and lie in the hall till it is time to come home. He says that on the pass of St. Bernard, a dog like this one saved the life of his own brother, and that some day when Barry is grown up, he may rescue some one of us from the cold and storm. Come, Barry. And they ran off happily together. Barry grew rapidly into a dog of medium size, square-built and compact. His coat was white and tan, his hair short, but close to his skin it was so thick as to be almost like felt. His ears drooped and his eyes were dark and deep-set. His whole bearing was gentle and affectionate, even playful, but yet with a certain quiet dignity as if he was waiting for something of importance to happen. When the winter snows began to fall, Barry plunged joyfully into the drifts, sniffing and scratching and pawing as if he was in search of something. The children made little caverns in the snow and hid in them so that he would come and dig them out. They put bits of their bread and cheese down deep in the drifts and covered them up, but Barry never failed to find them. The schoolmaster stood at the window watching their play. It's in the blood, he said to himself. That dog would never be happy away from the highlands. It's the call of his work that he is feeling, and he has a call to save lives, just as the pastor has to save souls. With the coming of spring, Barry grew restless. He smelled the air uneasily. His great brown eyes began to have a troubled and anxious look, like one weighed down with the thought of work not done, and the fear of not being able to do it. He's never been on the mountain, 
said the schoolmaster, but he's pining for the high pass and the storm wind and the struggle. You must let him go, boy, he said to Carl. No good will come from keeping either man or beast from the duty that's calling them. The St. Bernard dogs were kept in burn until they were nearly grown, because the intense cold of the pass was too severe for them when young. Carl had known from the first that as soon as Barry was old enough, he must go to the good fathers at the pass. But when one is only twelve, old enough is a long way off. And when Barry was sent for, Carl was heartbroken. "'Will you surely write me every year and tell me if Barry is well?' he said, with eyes brimful of tears, to the young monk who had come for the dog. "'But Carl,' said the boy's father, "'you must not forget that the good monks have much to do and many lives to save.' "'But Barry has a life, too,' the boy pleaded. "'I promise you,' the young monk said gravely. "'And when I am grown up, will you let me come to the hospice and help Barry to save people in the storm?' If you still wish it when the time comes, I do not doubt that there will be a place for you, said the monk, looking tenderly into the boy's earnest face. I'll surely come, Barry, whispered Carl with his arms around the dog's neck. Barry licked his cheek, then followed the monk, stranger as he was. Barry knows he is going to his work, said the schoolmaster. Suddenly, the dog stood still, then turned back, put his paws on the boy's shoulder, licked his cheek once more, and set off for the fierce struggle with the cold and the snow and the tempests of the upper mountains. But when the monk and his dogs began the climb, no one would have thought that they were going to a place of cold and storm. There was no shade on the path, and the sun was blazing hotly. Flowers were everywhere. The rocks were carpeted with heather, and in their clefts and among the boulders the yellow violets were growing. Pansies made wonderful splashes of purple gorgeousness against the brilliant green of the grass. In the shadows of the woods, a few tardy blossoms of the ladies' slipper stood with dignity and grace. Alpine roses, with their fresh green leaves, came out bravely into the sunshine. Up, up they went. Here and there were cataracts slipping over the precipices. Wisps of white clouds gathered around the peaks. The sunshine was no longer golden and burning, but chilly and pale. The deep ravines grew deeper and darker. The wind rose and began to roar through the fir trees and the pines. Now and then the dogs pricked up their ears at the sound of a distant avalanche. They looked startled and expectant. What were they coming to? Tired as they were, they sometimes dashed ahead of the monk, plunging into the snow that was still deep in the gullies and floundering about in it, then running back to their leader and gazing inquiringly into his face, as if to question what it all meant. They were eager and restless, but not troubled. It was in the blood, as the schoolmaster had said, and although they obeyed when the monk called, Come, children, and rest a bit, they gazed wistfully at the path that stretched before them. They came to a deep and narrow valley known as the Valley of Death because so many had been lost in its winter snows. The path wound from side to side, crossing the roaring torrent of a river and recrossing it again and again. Deep chasms yawned between the rocks, precipices stretched up to the sky. The patches of snow grew larger and deeper, and the gullies overflowed with it. The excited dogs gathered around the young monk, and he talked to them gently and quietly. "'It is all right, my children,' he said. "'It is only a little farther before we come to home and supper. Listen, do you hear that?' The dogs pricked up their ears, for up the height, not so very far away, they heard the friendly barking of dogs of their own breed." A turn in the pathway widened the view, and in the twilight the dogs could see a great building with little windows and massive walls of gray stone. This was the hospice, where, of all who asked for hospitality, not one was refused. The tired dogs were fed, and with a kindly word and a pat from the monks, they were sent to bed to rest for the new life that lay before them. For seven centuries, monks had kept this hospice open for all who came, whether wealthy people traveling for pleasure or workmen coming from Italy into Switzerland to find work, or peasants who had taken this shortest and cheapest way of going from one country to another. These put money into the little box in the chapel if they were able and chose, but no one was ever asked for a penny. Many thousands came every year. The convent bell rang at all hours of night and day. Even he who arrived at midnight always found a hot supper and a bed waiting for him, and in the morning there was breakfast and a God bless you as he started to continue his journey. When the ten months of winter began, then came the terrible snowstorms, covering with treacherous bridges and chasms between the rocks, changing the places of the drifts, rooting up trees, 
hiding the familiar streams and every trace of the pathway. Travelers became exhausted. They stopped to rest. The fatal mountain sleepiness overpowered them, and unless help came swiftly, that was the end. It was in such times as these that the monks went forth in anxious search. No one went without a dog, and the dog was always in the lead. He pushed on where he thought best, and the monks never questioned, but followed like little children whatever path he might choose. More than once the dogs refused to go by the usual path, and in each instance some good reason was found afterwards for their refusal. They knew much by instinct, but they were carefully trained, and this training went on with most dogs for two years or more before they could be sent out by themselves. They set out in pairs. A blanket was bound to the back of each, and a flask of wine tied around his neck. Their smell was so keen that they could find a man even under a deep covering of snow. Then they pawed until they reached him. They licked his hands and face and lay down beside him to make him warm. Sometimes they could arouse him so that by partly dragging him and partly by urging him onward, they could persuade him to push on to the hospice. If not, they howled and barked until someone came to their aid. On the night of Barry's arrival, the house was full of guests, and in the morning everyone hurried out after breakfast to see the famous dogs. They were having a regular good time, howling and barking and rolling in the snow, and playing tricks on one another. These are our children, our braves, our lay brothers, said the father with a smile. See what gentlemen they are when they are introduced. Jupiter, he called, and a big dog came forward and shook hands with one of the guests. Mars was the next name called. Mars was the baby, Jupiter's grandson, and when Jupiter had marched away to shake hands, the little rascal of a Mars had jumped into his grandfather's warm place. It was very comfortable, but he obeyed and came forward looking as mischievous as the rogue that he was. Oliver, and Oliver came forward and shook hands in friendly fashion. Barry had been watching with his head cocked to one side and his eyes shining. He knew how to do that, and he did wish the father would call his name. Barry, the father called at last, with no idea that he would understand what was wanted, but Barry walked up to him with the utmost dignity and offered his paw. Good boy, cried the father, and patted the dog's head. This was one of the tricks that the children in Bern had taught him, and he was delighted to show what he could do. The days were full, but the kind young monk did not fail to write to Carl, and before many months had passed, he wrote, Barry found his first traveler in the snow last night, and persuaded him to arouse himself and push on to the hospice. This is the first time that a dog with so short a training has done such a thing. Barry knew how it felt to be lost, said Carl to himself. Another time, the monk wrote, a group of peasants were overwhelmed by an avalanche. The grown people were killed, but Barry found one little girl still alive, though badly bruised. Somehow he made her understand that she must lie on his back and put her arms around his neck, and what a proud little lay brother was he when he brought her safely home. How he ever thought of getting her on his back I do not know. He had not yet been taught that. When Carl read this letter, he smiled. We know, don't we, Barry, he said to himself. More than one of our little girl friends has had a ride on your back, and you learned just how to crouch so they could get on easily. At length there came a letter that said, Barry is our finest dog. He has saved in all the lives of forty persons. He is happy, but sometimes he goes to the edge of the cliff and stands gazing down the long and winding path. I believe that he is thinking of you. Will you not come and visit us? The hand that wrote this trembled, and now there were no more letters, for the young monk had died. There were no long lives on the pass of St. Bernard. He who gave himself up to the work of saving lost travelers knew well that his days would be few. Now that Carl had no more news of the dog, he thought of him even oftener, and before long he and his friend Marco started to go over the pass. Marco had friends on the other side, and Carl had a deep longing to see Barry. It was the edge of the winter, but the storms had not yet been severe, and they hoped to get through without trouble. All went well up to the beginning of the Valley of Death. Here the snow began to fall heavily, the sky was thick and dull, and the wind was rising. It came in savage gusts, striking one precipice, flinging itself back to another, whirling the young men about with furious blows and buffetings. This grows worse all the time, said Carl. Let us rest for five minutes and eat our lunch, and then push on with all our might. A struggle like this needs something better than bread and cheese, said Marco. I have brought a flask of the strongest brandy just for such a time. My grandfather knew the mountains as well as I know our own house, said Carl, and he always said that a mountain climber must keep his head clear. Don't drink it, Marco, he pleaded earnestly. 
Don't you know the old saying, he who drinks brandy at the peak will never again drink wine in the valley? I'll wager that the man who wrote that never was at the peak, retorted Marco lightly. In spite of all that Carl could say, Marco took a long, deep drink from his flask and pushed on forward. But the storm drove on more and more fiercely. I must sleep just a moment, then I can go on, he said drowsily, and sank down beside a great drift. Carl pleaded. He shook the man and pulled him and dragged him as far as he could, but he himself stumbled and fell, and before he could get upon his feet, a sudden whirlwind of snow had covered his friend. He felt about in the storm and darkness, but there was no trace of him to be found. Heavily he plodded on. Late in the night there was a ring at the hospice door, so faint and tremulous that the good father who answered it almost believed that he had dreamed of the sound. The story was soon told. It may not be too late, said the monk. Our best dogs were sent the moment we heard that a man was out. They will find him and he will be brought in. Has Barry gone? asked Carl anxiously. I have come all this way to see Barry. And you will see him, said the monk soothingly as if to a child. But now sleep and you shall be called as soon as he comes. In the early gray of the morning, Marco was brought in, still half-dazed. Barry had found him and had pawed the stifling snow away and had joyfully licked his hands and face until he began to awake. But his brain was stupid and dull, his eyes were dim and misty, wild fancies and terrors had seized upon him, and while Barry was barking joyfully for help, his only thought was that a wild beast had attacked him. He fumbled with unsteady hand, pulled out his knife, and stabbed the loving friend who, with no thought of his own suffering, was with all his strength struggling to drag him to the shelter. The brave dog's blood reddened the snowflakes that swirled angrily around them. Barry's steps staggered more and more. At the gate he dropped and his eyes closed. The monks knelt around him and watched him tenderly. "'Barry! Barry!' cried Carl in a voice that trembled with affection and grief. Barry moved his head slightly. His eyes opened. He looked slowly from one to another, all around the little group, last of all at Carl. For a moment he questioned. Then there came into his eyes the light of a great joy. He made a familiar sound, faint and distant it seemed, but yet clear and distinct. It was Barry's welcome and his farewell. Barry died in 1816 after twelve years of unselfish, faithful service. When the Cemetery for Dogs was opened in Paris, the place of honor was given to a monument in his memory. This shows the little girl on his back whom he rescued after the fall of the avalanche. She is holding fast to him, and Barry's head is turned a little toward her as if he was telling her to trust him and not be afraid, for he would surely carry her safely home. End of section 17. End of the Good Dog Book by Various Authors.